Overnight, the world faced a catastrophic shutdown of all water and electricity, with temperatures plummeting by a staggering 100 degrees. While everyone else braved the extreme cold outside, I found solace at home, playing games by the fireplace. As my neighbors stepped out to complain about the dire situation, it became clear that without proper preparation, people were at risk of freezing to death or starving. Luckily, I had hoarded an abundance of supplies in my house, enough to last for years. When the girl I'd been crushing on for 18 years boldly asked me for food, I shamelessly sent her a picture of steak and wine, which she recognized as top-grade Wagyu and a $100,000 bottle of wine. She expressed her desire for the same, but I chuckled at the idea of her fetching it herself. Unexpectedly, a supernova explosion triggered a global ice age, and my role as a warehouse manager allowed me to secure enough provisions to last through the crisis. However, the girl and a group of neighbors broke into my house, stealing all my food. In a desperate attempt to ration supplies, they resorted to cannibalism, with the girl admitting she tricked me into opening the door. Alright folks, let's set our sights high today, our goal is 600 likes. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. In my despair, I wished for a new chance, and I found myself reborn one month before the global freeze. Determined to rectify past mistakes, I swore never to be a pushover again. My immediate goal was to hoard supplies and build a safe haven before disaster struck. But before I could act, a bright light transported me to a strange space, sparking a bold idea to bring an entire Walmart to ensure a lifetime of sustenance. As I pondered my next move, my hunger led me to the best restaurant in the city, where even a simple meal cost a fortune. To my surprise, the girl I'd admired for years appeared, accompanied by her girlfriend. They marveled at my apparent stroke of luck, unaware of my inner disdain for them. I wanted to kill them there and then for what they did in my past life but suppressing my resentment, I offered to take them shopping, planning to leverage their assistance in my survival efforts. You sure carry a lot, the girl observed as I filled two shopping carts. Who knew I'd be buying two full shopping carts and throwing them to the two free laborers? Free labor shouldn't go to waste. This left her girlfriend looking displeased. You're a big man, aren't you going to do any of the work? The girls complained. Upon hearing this, Fa Yeching hastily chuckled, I've done you a big favor today. You owe us a big meal. Inside, I coldly laughed. Of course, I'll have to treat you too well. When the extreme cold comes, not one of you will be able to run away. Just then, Auntie Lin from the neighborhood committee approached with her grandson, Little Shangy. You can't eat all this by yourself. How about sharing some with Auntie? She suggested. But when her two-year-old grandson started taking things from my shopping cart, I grabbed it back, explaining that I didn't even have enough for myself. The child began to cry, threatening me, but I remained firm. Dare to say that again, believe it or not, I'll slap you to death. Auntie Lynn intervened, scolding me for haggling with the child. Eventually, she offered to buy a box and transfer the money later, but I insisted on immediate payment or go to the market and buy it yourself. Back home, Yu Ching reminded me not to forget to treat them, and after sending them away, I stored all the purchased food in the alternate space. Next, I focused on building an impenetrable steel fortress with heating devices and medical supplies. In the midst of preparing for the impending ice age, I recognized the importance of acquiring firearms for my survival. With 30 days until the catastrophe, I focused on liquidating my assets quickly to gather funds. Money would be my ticket to obtaining whatever I needed. The next morning, I checked the freshness of the food in the alternate space, pleased to find it as pristine as when I bought it. Taking action, I contacted the best local restaurant and reserved 5,000 plates for a three-day banquet. Despite the hefty price tag of at least a million, with a deposit of 200,000 required up front, I didn't hesitate to transfer the amount. Next, I retrieved my property certificate and headed to the bank to mortgage it. In a post-apocalyptic world, money would lose its value, but for now, it was a means to an end. However, even with my savings combined, it wasn't enough to cover all my needs, including weapons and supplies. As I pondered my next move, a man in a suit approached me, perhaps offering a solution to my financial woes. Bro, do you need money? I was delighted, money is coming when I need it. The man in the suit quickly brought me to another man. The man didn't beat around the bush and asked how much I wanted to borrow, but the interest rate would be a bit high. Upon hearing this, I rubbed my hands together. It doesn't matter if the interest is high, the main thing is to raise the money as soon as possible. So, I mortgaged the house that I had just mortgaged in my Audi as well. After the transaction, both parties felt that they had made a good deal. I mortgaged a house worth 5 million and a car worth 300,000 for 4 million. In the end, I have to pay them 6 million back, but I also think they are really nice people just giving away money for me to spend. Then I came to the most famous security company in my previous life. A second generation rich guy spent $2 billion to build a top level safe house. As a result, that rich guy directly became the emperor in the apocalypse. 
At this time, a business manager came over and asked if I needed any help. I quickly walked up and expressed my idea, indicating that I wanted to build a safe house for the apocalypse. Hearing this, the business manager didn't say much and directly presented me with several plans for me to choose from. However, I was not satisfied with the plans above. Then I stated that the house should be reinforced with aviation materials, the balcony glass should use the highest strength bulletproof glass, and add an air filtration system and no blind spot monitoring system. The front door should be made of the same material as the bank's anti-theft door. And I asked the manager to find a way to get some guns. After seeing my requirements, the business manager was surprised. With these renovations and some weapons, this would be a fortress. The final plan required 8 million. After I paid the deposit, I asked them to start work immediately and said that the balance would be paid within three months. Next, I needed to get some weapons for self-defense. I called the owner of a hunting club and got a few sets of crossbows as weapons from him. Just then, the 500 tables of banquet I ordered also arrived in batches by truck. This attracted quite a few people from the neighborhood. This is the delivery truck from a five-star hotel. These several trucks of food would cost at least a million or so. After a while, the food for 5,000 plates filled my entire house. Without wasting any words, I put them all into the otherworldly space. With all these delicious foods plus the ingredients I had ordered before, I basically don't have to worry about food and clothing for the rest of my life. The next day, the security company's workers came to start building the safe house. This scene attracted quite a few neighbors' attention who ridiculed me, asking if I had taken the wrong medication. But I didn't care. When the end comes, you'll know who the real joke is. Then, I found a manager's show from the company, and I bought a part of the warehouse's supplies at twice the market price. Next is to transport these things home little by little. My recent hoarding activities also attracted the attention. Yu Cheng then asked if something was going to happen recently, even saying that she had been thinking about me lately. As for this fake concern from that woman, I didn't want to respond at all. This really pissed Yu Cheng off, this bootlicker, actually dares to ignore me. But she was still curious about my sudden hoarding. However, her best friend just scoffed, saying, if something big is happening, the country will definitely notify us. Just try your best to catch Xiang Yi. Half a month later, my safe house was successfully built. In order to ensure the employer's safety, the manager also installed the surveillance system on each floor. I was very satisfied with this. Next is to wait for my last batch of supplies to arrive. Soon, several trucks of drinking water arrived in succession. At this time, Uncle Yi from the same neighborhood looked curious. Little Xiang, what are you doing with all these barrels of water? Thinking that Uncle Yi was one of the few good people in my past life, I whispered, the weather this year is going to be very unusual. It's best to stock up on some supplies to prevent extreme cold as soon as possible. Upon hearing this, Uncle Yu was half skeptical, but seeing the serious look on my face, he believed it. In the following period, I tried my best to exchange all the money in my hands for various supplies. Three days before the advent of the extreme cold in days, I specifically went back to the warehouse and invited all my colleagues for a cup of tea. After they drank it, everyone fainted. In order to move the entire Walmart warehouse with peace of mind, I had already put sleeping pills in the tea in advance. After shutting down the surveillance equipment, to the warehouse and immediately put all the rows of goods into the otherworldly space. With the help of the otherworldly space, I quickly emptied the entire warehouse. Just then, a box in the corner caught my attention. When I opened it, it was the cold-resistant tech product that was stocked a few days ago. It was said to be able to withstand temperatures of minus 100 degrees. With these supplies, even if facing the coldest ice age, I have nothing to fear. To prevent exposure, I also directly gave myself a dose of sleeping pills and then laid down on my colleague and fell asleep. Two and a half hours later, I was awakened by my colleague. Boss, something crazy has happened. Our warehouse has been emptied. Hearing this, I pretended to be surprised and jumped up. What the hell? Then, looking at the empty warehouse, I pretended to be upset and said, What happened? How are all the supplies in the warehouse gone? At this time, the manager called inquiring about the loss of the warehouse supplies. Knowing that the whole warehouse was emptied all at once, the manager immediately cursed, How is this possible? Are you a mole stealing for yourself? I gave an awkward smile. Manager, what do you take me for? Besides, I'm not that capable. I think we better report to the higher department as soon as possible so as not to delay the investigation time. After hanging up the phone, I quickly comforted my colleagues. Everyone, don't be afraid. We who are upright are not afraid of crooked shadows. Soon, all the colleagues on duty and I were called to the police station for questioning, but nothing could be found out after the questioning. Then the cop told us not to leave Tianai City rashly in order to cooperate with the follow-up investigation. Soon, this incident made the news. 
In the city, no one could believe that hundreds of square meters of supplies disappeared without a trace in less than three hours. Just then, it suddenly started snowing heavily in the sky. I knew this was a prelude to the extreme cold, so I hurried home. Three days later, the shockwave from a supernova explosion swept across the globe, bringing about a devastating disaster to the entire planet. The temperature began to plummet overnight. Looking at the heavy snow outside the window, I remained calm. What was destined to come eventually came. But at this time, the homeowner group became lively. After all, it was the first time they saw such heavy snow in the South. I looked at all this with a calm face. Perhaps for many people, this might be the first time they saw snow, and it could also be the last. In my past life, the heavy snow lasted a full three months, and the temperature would get lower and lower, causing many people who had not stocked up on food in advance to freeze to death in this winter. On the second day of the extreme cold weather, the heavy snow at the entrance of the residential area had piled up to half a person's height. Even if people indoors turned the air conditioning to the maximum, they still shivered from the cold. But I, who have prepared various heating equipment in advance, was sleeping soundly. But just then, I was suddenly awakened by a ring of the phone. It was a call from the Fa Yu Ching. She asked cheerfully, Shangi, did you know about the temperature drop when you stocked up on supplies? You didn't even tell me, and now I'm freezing. Hearing this, I scoffed and directly hung up the phone. This pissed off Fa Yu Ching on the other side. This bootlicker dares to hang up on me. Then she shamelessly texted me asking for food. After reading it, I laughed. She still wants to treat me like a bootlicker, huh? I directly sent her a picture of steak with wine. Fa Yuching recognized at a glance that this was a top-tier Wagyu beef and a bottle of wine worth a hundred thousand. She immediately said that she also wanted to eat steak and drink wine. After hearing this, I laughed. If you want to eat, go buy it yourself at the supermarket. After seeing my message, Fa Yuching was furious, but after thinking about it, she calmed down. After all, she has to hook me, the fish. I was full and bored, so I started watching TV. Just then, the tablet monitoring the building suddenly made a noise. I saw Auntie Lin on the screen, solemnly saying, Everyone, don't panic and scramble for supplies. This extreme weather will last at most two or three days. Our neighborhood committee will help everyone through this. Rushing for supplies will only lead to price increases. If anyone dares to hoard supplies, I will report to the authorities. But just then, a voice sounded behind her. Auntie Lin, how can you determine that this heavy snow will not last long? You are blocking everyone from going out to buy things. Will you be responsible if something happens? Hearing this, the surrounding homeowners also echoed, If we don't hoard supplies now, will you be responsible if we run out of food later? Auntie Lin quickly stated that the neighborhood committee would take responsibility for this matter. Then she pointed at me and cursed, Shangi, don't stir up trouble here. This is an illegal act. But I didn't bother to deal with her and turned around to go back to my super safe house. A week passed quickly, but the heavy snow outside showed no signs of stopping. I was having fun at home as usual when suddenly a message came in on my phone. I saw Auntie Lynn in the group chat calling me out by name to go shovel snow. I didn't even think about it and directly refused her. With such heavy snow falling, we'd be shoveling slower than it's falling. Clearly, Auntie Lynn was just trying to pick a fight. This got her gnashing her teeth in anger. Then Auntie Lynn commanded in the name of the neighborhood committee, Shangi, you must go out and shovel snow. Whoever dares to leave an opposition will certainly be dealt with by the organization after the snow disaster ends. Seeing this, I said coldly, such a show of authority. Then I quickly typed a bunch of text and sent it out, how come I don't see you calling out the rich kids in the neighborhood? Just picking on us honest people, and Elin. Since you're so capable, why don't you go ask So Hao and Chen how to shovel the snow? Xin Jiang Hao is the boss of a construction project, he has hundreds of people under him, and Su Hao is a well-connected rich kid. In my past life, these two guys broke into my house and took all my food. Hearing what I said, other people also started making a commotion in the homeowner group. Shangi is right. If you dare, go ask them, they chimed in. Seeing the messages, Auntie Lin was immediately cursing. Clearly, my words made it hard for her to step down, so she could only grit her teeth and call out the two in the group to shovel snow together. Xin Jiang Hao, seeing the message, immediately started cursing, Are you crazy? I'll kill you if you bother me again. Su Hao also echoed, What a big idiot, taking the homeowner's money and acting high and mighty every day. Now you really think you're the boss? I didn't even bother to deal with those poor ghosts. Seeing this message, Auntie Lin was so angry that she didn't dare to say a word, but directly pointed the finger at me. Shangi, you're really trying to make trouble for me, aren't you? You'll be satisfied if no one goes out to shovel snow, won't you? I picked up my phone, turned on the voice message, and scoffed, Did you come to me to seek a sense of existence after being scolded by someone else? Believe it or not, if you talk any more nonsense, I'll kill you. 
Seeing my serious tone, Auntie Lin immediately backed down. Just then, a loud bang came from my front door. I heard Shin Jiang Hao outside yelling, Shangi, weren't you pretty cocky in the group chat just now? Believe it or not, I'll kill you. At these words, I picked up my crossbow and went to the door. It's not certain yet who's going to kill whom. I shot him directly through the shin with an arrow. Injured, Shin Jiang Hao fell to the ground, wailing incessantly. He never imagined that I, a seemingly honest person, would be so ruthless when I took action. Little did he know that this was only the first step of my revenge. With temperatures now at minus 100 degrees, Xin Jiang Hao's leg, which had been shot through, was surely not going to be saved if not treated in time. He could only die slowly in this freezing weather. Xin Jiang Hao, bearing the severe pain, staggered into the elevator. He could never have imagined, having only met me a few times, that I wanted to kill him directly. This realization made Xin Jiang Hao shudder with fear, so he immediately took out his phone and dialed the emergency number. However, the whole city was already covered in heavy snow, and the hospital's ambulance simply couldn't make it. Left with no choice, Xin Jiang Hao could only go home and treat his wound himself. Fortunately, the weather was freezing cold, and his foot was almost numb from the cold. With grim determination, Xin Jiang Hao pulled the arrow out. Then, he took out his phone again and made a threat in the homeowner group, Shang Yi, wait for me. Watch me kill you. Facing his threat, I naturally wasn't afraid and responded confidently, keep talking, and I'll disable your remaining leg. This scene stunned the onlookers in the group chat. After all, as the area tyrant, Jin Jiang Hao, this was the first time someone dared to confront him directly. Soon, he picked up the phone and summoned his hundreds of followers. In no time, a swarm of followers, each holding their own weapon, rushed over in grandeur. After learning about what had happened, the leading bald guy came to my door with his followers. You offended our bro. Today will be your death anniversary, he declared, slashing directly at the door. But the next second, his machete was flung away. This scared the gangsters out of their wits. How many people had this kid offended? His home was fortified stronger than a turtle shell. Watching the scene from my security camera, I laughed with disdain. Are you guys hungry? Try harder. Seeing the bunch outside the house swearing and fuming, I suddenly had an idea. Immediately, I took a water hose and connected it to the kitchen faucet. Why are you so angry? Let me cool you down, I taunted. The gangsters outside saw the door lock suddenly open and were instantly alert. Upon realizing it wasn't an arrow, they had a good laugh. Who would have thought that the next second the hose would spurt out cold water? Soon, a bunch of them fell to the ground frozen. Only three managed to escape. Seeing this scene, I was quite pleased. In this freezing weather, cold water is more lethal than any weapon. On the other side, the three little guys who escaped were huddled together, shivering. Xin Jiang Hao looked at them and yelled, what happened? How did you guys, a whole group, not manage to bring down a small brat? Hearing this, the three hastily explained, Shangi was too cunning. He turned the front door into a burglar-proof steel door. We chopped for a long time and only scratched some paint off. Then he sprayed us with cold water. Upon hearing this, Xin Jiang Hao's face immediately darkened. No wonder the door felt a bit hard just now. But don't worry, I don't believe this kid can hide in there forever. Send a few men to keep watch at his door day and night. When he dares to show his face, tear him into pieces. Little did he know, the food stored in my house, not to mention for a lifetime, even if it were for ten lifetimes, it wouldn't run out. On the other side, Uncle Yi was leading a few people to clear the snow from the entrance of the residential area, planning to dig a path to the supermarket to replenish food. However, they couldn't shovel as fast as the snow fell. After a while, they gave up and prepared to go back. Watching the scene, I sighed. Human power is simply no match for a disaster of this scale. Although the TV is actively reporting to reassure all citizens that the country is launching a final offensive against the snow disaster, only I know that 90% of all organisms globally will freeze to death in this snow disaster. My crush of 18 years was the first to send me a greeting. Shangi, are you okay? Seeing the message, I couldn't help but laugh. If it wasn't for her eating my most important part in my previous life, I would have still seen her as a pure lotus. So I replied indifferently, I'm fine. Yu Ching shamelessly asked me for something to eat, saying she would return the favor later. Faced with my crush's request, I agreed without hesitation, then sent her a picture of a lobster to whet her appetite, adding with a mocking tone, I'm already full. Seeing this, Yu Ching got angry and decided to kick me out of her pond. At this time, her best friend sent me a message. Why are you so dumb? Yu Ching is really angry right now. Seeing the message, I laughed again. They're really good at acting, one playing good cop, the other bad cop. Ah! Huh. The best friend didn't give up and continued, the snow would not last that long. Share few meals and seduce Yu Ching first. Wouldn't that be a big win? I ignored her disdainfully and simply responded with oh. 
This response infuriated her. How did this bootlicker suddenly become enlightened? Yu Ching could only sigh. Why did my attitude towards her undergo such a drastic 180 degree change? At this point, her best friend suggested, if we lose one bootlicker, so be it. Don't we still have others? Hearing this, Fang Yuching's eyes lit up, and she immediately called other bootlickers. Soon, Chapung hurried over with large and small bags of supplies, claiming that this was all the food he had left. Hearing this, Fang Yuching was touched and immediately sent him a good person card. Chapung, you're a really good person, she praised. Before Chapung could express his loyalty, her best friend promptly closed the door. In no time, three days had passed, but the heavy snow was still falling nonstop. Munching on a chicken leg and looking at the time on my phone, I thought, the real drama is about to begin. The next moment, the entire neighborhood plunged into darkness. Soon, neighbors began stepping out of their homes, asking each other whether they had electricity. Now, with water and electricity cut off and air conditioning no longer functioning, it was genuinely getting cold enough to kill. After finishing my chicken, I picked my teeth and then turned on a generator I had prepared in advance. I was fortunate to have died early in my past life, otherwise, I too would be freezing like the rest of them. At this moment, Auntie Lin from the neighborhood committee was shivering while holding her grandson. She never expected the snow to last so long. A message came into the neighborhood group chat, stating that this was a once in a hundred thousand years global blizzard, and we might be on the brink of a mass extinction event. Several major cities in the country had already been overrun. Everyone must stockpile more supplies. After reading the message, Auntie Lin was shocked. She never imagined the snow disaster would be this serious. At that moment, she hatched a plan. She must trick everyone into giving her their food before they received the news. So, Auntie Lin promptly posted a message in the owner's group, Everyone, don't worry. This disaster is temporary. Workers are currently repairing the water and power outage. The officials have issued an order. Due to these extraordinary circumstances, the neighborhood committee will conduct unified management of all property owners. Anyone who does not cooperate will be arrested and interrogated by the police. Upon seeing the message, Xin Jiang Hao began to curse in dissatisfaction. Although he had a lot of underlings, he dared not confront the police. Meanwhile, Auntie Lin continued in the group chat, due to the severe impact of the blizzard on everyone's lives, the neighborhood committee has decided to collect supplies from each owner and distribute them uniformly. On seeing the message, I couldn't help but laugh. It was the same old trick as in my previous life. Then, Auntie Lin sent me a private message, Little Shangy, you usually work in a warehouse and must have hoarded a lot of food, right? Besides, you bought three truckloads of stuff last time. Everyone is in trouble now, and it's your turn to do your part. After the crisis, we will certainly repay you. On hearing this, I chuckled coldly. You old hat, your hands were also dirty in my death in the previous life. Just you wait. I immediately replied with a voice message, that's great. I just ran out of supplies at home, Auntie Lin. When you collect the supplies, make sure you share some with me. Seeing my message almost made her explode. This kid had hoarded several truckloads of supplies. How could he possibly run out so soon? Realizing that she and her grandson were depending on my supplies, Auntie Lin swallowed her anger and kindly replied, Little Shangi, this is an order from the organization. You must comply. Once the snow disaster is over, I will definitely report your good deeds to the organization. On seeing her message, I laughed again. If I hadn't died early in my previous life, I might have believed her lies. So, I picked my teeth and replied, Auntie, I'm not lying to you. I really don't have anything to eat at home. Why don't you take the lead and send me a few packets of instant noodles first? Upon hearing this, Auntie Lin could no longer restrain herself and furiously retorted, Shangi, refusing to hand over your supplies is the same as opposing the organization. I will definitely report you to the organization for disciplinary action. I'm after you represent the organization. You're not even a civil servant, not to mention a public institution staff. Why don't you ascend to heaven? It's okay for you to show off normally, but now that things are like this, you still think you're so important, Andy Lin exclaimed, her anger palpable as she smashed her old-fashioned phone. This little brat dares to talk to me like that. After all, I'm a leader in the community. After failing to get any advantage from me, Andy Lin turned her attention to other homeowners, thinking, it doesn't matter who I can deceive, as long as I can deceive some. Two days quickly passed under Auntie Lin's coaxing, and quite a few homeowners had actually sent their supplies to her home. Looking at this scene, I sneered in my heart. What a bunch of fools, believing in some great Samaritan in this post-apocalyptic world. Now the whole world has plunged into chaos. Without enough supplies, they could only wait to die. Soon, many homeowners began to tag Auntie Lin in the group chat, demanding, wasn't it said that the supplies would be distributed evenly? We've run out of food at home. Start distributing some to us. But Auntie Lin merely scoffed at the messages. What a bunch of idiots. 
These supplies were obtained through my hard work. How could I possibly give them away so easily? Just then, her phone rang, and seeing that it was Xinjiang Hao, she broke out in a cold sweat. What does he want with me? On the other end of the line, Xinjiang Hao said coldly, Auntie Lin, you have quite a method. You've actually deceived everyone's supplies into your home. Hearing this, Auntie Lin feigned innocence, saying it was the arrangement of the community committee and she was just doing her duty. Xinjiang Hao laughed, that's perfect. Over ten of us here are waiting for you to distribute the supplies. Hearing this, Auntie Lin coughed lightly. These supplies haven't been sorted out yet. Some homeowners haven't handed in their supplies. We can't start distributing them yet, Auntie Lin protested, but the next second, the area tyrant Xinjiang Hao, along with his underlings, burst into her house. Seamus Auntie Lin's face turned pale. How dare you break into a civilian house? Is there no law anymore? She exclaimed. Xinjiang Hao responded with a slap. And you think you've been lawful, deceiving everyone's supplies? Today, I'll act in the name of justice. Meanwhile, I watched the scene on the surveillance, cheerfully eating a sausage. The dogfight was finally about to begin. At that moment, I had a brilliant idea. If watching alone is fun, sharing it with others would be even better. With a love for drama, I immediately posted the surveillance video in the homeowners group chat. Surely, everyone's reaction to this would be quite amusing. On the other side, Xinjiang Hao and his gang had already broken into Auntie Lin's house, instructing his subordinates to take away all the food, not leaving a single thing behind. Hearing this, Auntie Lin hurriedly clung to Xinjiang Hao's leg. You can't take everything. Some of the supplies here are what I hoarded myself. Without these supplies, how would my grandson and I survive? Xinjiang Hao let out a cold laugh. That's none of my business. Get out of here, he said, kicking Auntie Lin away. Her grandson, stunned by this scene, then picked up a small knife to avenge his grandmother. He managed to accurately stab one of the punks, a yellow-haired guy, in the butt. The severe pain made him forget about moving things, and he kicked the boy away in response. Witnessing this, the other thugs burst out laughing. Since when did yellow hair learn to kick? He actually managed to kick this little brat away. Despite the intense pain in his butt, yellow hair played along. How cool am I, right? Someone should have recorded that moment. Auntie Lin fell in front of her grandson, distraught by the chaos unfolding before her. Xinjiang Hao, watching the scene, showed no sympathy, instead, he sneered. This is what you get for deceiving us. Your neighbors were just dispensing justice. On the other side, many homeowners watching this scene also clapped and cheered. Ha ha ha, serves the big liar right. Such thunderous methods are necessary to deal with swindlers like her. Without bro, how would we be helpless against this kind of rogue? Seeing these messages, I laughed. You people really don't understand the crux of the problem. Today, Xinjiang Hao can break into Auntie Lin's house, tomorrow, he could break into yours. But all this has nothing to do with me. My two-meter fixed steel door wouldn't yield even if he came with a tank. Soon, Auntie Lin was pleading for help in the homeowner group. Does anyone have hemostatic drugs, anti-shock medications, and antibiotics? My grandson was injured by Xinjiang Hao. Dr. Zhou needs these medications urgently for surgery. Upon hearing this, my eyes lit up. Dr. Zhou was a savior-like figure in the previous world. Fortunately, we had neighborhood Dr. Zhou to save her grandson's life. At this point, Auntie Lin pleaded continuously in the homeowner group for medicine, promising to show gratitude to anyone willing to provide it. However, this only resulted in mockery for many homeowners, so you plan to count on a group doctor, show a kind-hearted beauty save your grandson. Why should we help you after deceiving us of our supplies? You still have the audacity to ask for help. Seeing this, I sighed. This was karma for Auntie Lin. Furthermore, the snowstorm had been going on for over a week, and the outside was practically paralyzed. Even if the boy was saved, how long could everyone last without food? At this point, the snow outside the community had almost buried up to the first floor. Many people had already heard from the news that this was a global snowstorm that occurs once every hundred thousand years. No one knew what the snow disaster would turn into. Soon, a week passed in a flash, and the whole world was almost buried in the snowstorm. In some cities in the north, the temperature had even dropped to negative 100 degrees Celsius. Many residents who tried to evacuate southwards ended up freezing to death on the road. In the homeowner group, Auntie Lin began to play the morality card again. My dear grandson has been hungry for two days. He's just a child. Are you really going to stand by and watch him die? She stated that she was willing to pay a high price for supplies. Seeing this, the homeowner started to inflate the prices, and the last pack of instant noodles was even sold for $2,000. Seeing this, I laughed. These people are not taking the apocalypse seriously. In a little while, they'll think paper money is too hard even to use as toilet paper. 
as a second-generation rich kid with some business acumen, Su Hao started to hoard supplies at a high price. He was very clear that money in this apocalyptic world would become as useless as waste paper. He had to get rid of it while it was still useful. At this time, a single mother in the group sent out a plea for help, stating that she and her daughter were about to starve to death, hoping that everyone could help her. Seeing this, I laughed. In the past life, this woman and her daughter managed to survive for a long time. This situation is not as simple as she seems. Ten days passed quickly, and as usual, I was enjoying my time at home. At this moment, the phone on the table rang. Seeing the caller ID, I let out a cold laugh. This person finally couldn't stand it anymore. So I opened the video chat and sarcastically said, you all look thinner after not seeing each other for a while. Behind me, the sight of food made the two people drool. Why do you still have so much food in your house, Shangi? Is it because you hoarded it last time? And with this weather of negative 100 degrees, why are you sweating? Upon hearing this, I smiled. Oh, this? I installed a fireplace at home. This thing is very warm. I feel like going for a run outside. Upon hearing this, Yu Ching immediately tried to butter up to me. Brother Shangi, you're so awesome. You're so well prepared. Could you let Yu Ching come over and take a shower inside? I scoffed. Do they still take me for an old lecture? So, without a second thought, I rejected her invitation, even taunting her with, at negative 100 degrees, make sure to keep warm. Yu Ching was instantly infuriated at my words. Shangi, don't go too far. We are freezing and starving. It's fine if you don't help, but don't make sarcastic comments. Hearing this, I laughed. You still think I'm an easy target? If you want food, go find your rich kid. Besides, we're not really related, so why should I help you with that? I stylishly ended the video call. On the other side, Yu Ching was already furious. She never thought that I would be on the path of a bootlicker's counterattack. At this moment, her best friend chimed in with some fair words. Shangi is quite good. It's you who missed the opportunity. Otherwise, we could be enjoying the things at Shangi's house right now. He is much stronger than that so-called rich second generation. If I had known you would fail, I would have gone for it myself. Now everything has been revealed, and we end up with nothing. Yu Ching was already furious. Lin Kaining, you're still speaking in favor of Shangi? I'll kill you. Soon, the two were wrestling on the bed. Meanwhile, the government, seeing that they could no longer hide the news of the snow disaster, issued an announcement on television. In order to meet everyone's electricity needs, power supply would be provided from 1 to 2 o'clock every day, but the voltage would only be enough for low power appliances. Currently, all major power plants are shut down, and power is scarce. Everyone is encouraged to use electricity sparingly to prevent large-scale power outages. Soon, the homeowner group was lively again. Did you see the news? Turns out the rumors online are true. Just as everyone was on edge, suddenly, someone offered to sell instant noodles for 5,000 bucks a pack. Any takers? Seeing this, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Knowing that we're in an apocalypse yet still wanting to exchange life-saving supplies for this worthless paper under the current circumstances. Filling one's stomach is above all else. When everyone is hungry, who would care about this useless paper? On the other side, after wrestling for two minutes, Fa Yu Ching and her friend finally calmed down. Since the soft approach didn't work, we'll go hard with that. Yu Ching picked up her phone and contacted her number one bootlicker, telling a wild story about how Chang Yi wanted to tarnish her purity just because he had food. Cha Peng was instantly furious upon hearing this. This Chang Yi is such a scumbag. If I don't take this guy down, I'll be letting down my bootlegger identity, Cha Peng declared. Seeing Cha Peng was hooked, Fa Ye Ching immediately got close to him. Little Joe, let's find a way to take his house, and then we can live together, okay? Xiao Ping agreed without a second thought, but before that, they needed to prepare some weapons. In a short while, the three of them, each carrying a kitchen knife, arrived at my doorstep. Then Zhou Peng, hiding the knife behind his back, knocked on the door. Brother Shangi, are you in? It's old Joe. As colleagues, could you lend me some food? I'll trade you with fever medication. Unbeknownst to them, I had already seen the whole scene clearly through the surveillance camera. Seeing the weapons in their hands, I was ready to explode with anger. Do you guys really think you can kill me? If the tiger doesn't show its power, you'll mistake it for a sick cat. Then I picked up the hose, attached it to the tap, and decided to give them a chilling shower at negative temperature. At that moment, the piled up waste caught my attention, and an idea sprang to mind. I picked up the hose and approached the door, shouting, Don't worry, I'll make sure everyone gets enough to eat. The three of them, thinking that I was about to open the door, excitedly raised their weapons. But the next second, a pile of feces sprayed through the small window of the door onto them. Fa Yu Ching immediately realized it was a pile of feces and started to vomit on the side, while Cha Peng was furious. Shangi, if you have the guts, come out. I'll kill you. 
At this, I just laughed. Don't say I didn't give you a chance. If you have the guts, come in. Hearing this, Chopin, seething with rage, raised his kitchen knife and struck my front door, only to find that the door was unharmed. Instead, his hand was injured from the impact. Watching the scene, I couldn't help but laugh. My two-meter-thick security door isn't something you can break just by saying so. So. He couldn't fathom their motives. His home was packed with supplies, enough to rival a Walmart warehouse. The thought of them surveilling outside didn't faze him. But a sudden gunshot jolted him awake, revealing the dark side of human nature even in this post-apocalyptic world. Xinjiang Hao and his gang were looting houses amid the water shortage. Most residents ventured out to gather snow for water, leaving their homes vulnerable. Hao seized this opportunity, asserting control over the building and intimidating others in the homeowner's chat. While his tactics were ruthless, they were limited by ammunition and followers. Despite the outcry in the group chat against Hao's tyranny, few were willing to take action, preferring to plan carefully. Amidst the discussions, Zhang Yi chuckled at the irony of the loudest critics being the most hesitant to act. At this point, Uncle Yu, a retired veteran, chimed in, saying we can't keep ignoring the situation, or we'll all be doomed. He offered to lead the charge, gaining support from the homeowners. Some suggested providing weapons, while others discussed tactics to ambush Zhang Yi Hao and his group. However, Uncle Yu noted that Zhang Yi Hao had backup, and he alone wouldn't be enough to confront them. He called for a dozen young men to ensure their safety. As everyone prepared to volunteer, a woman spoke up, accusing Auntie Lin of tricking them out of supplies and questioning Uncle Yu's intentions. This sparked a debate among the homeowners, dividing them into two factions, the radical group, which wanted to unite against Zhang Yi Hao, and the conservative faction, which suspected Uncle Yu of being a spy. After two hours of arguing, the situation mirrored past conflicts, where the conservatives' indecision led to tragic consequences. Meanwhile, Zhang Yi Hao continued to exploit the chaos, backed by his armed group. Everywhere, not even sparing his own followers, anyone who dared to resist would be taken away with a single shot from Xinjiang Hao. But he knew it well in his heart, without this gun in his hand, these subordinates might not necessarily obey him. Then, he ordered his men to collect all the bodies. Watching the scene from the surveillance, Zhang Yi immediately realized that this guy was planning to use these people as backup food. It seems it's time to find an opportunity to confront this guy. The next morning, the leader of the conservative faction, Lu Tintin, sent out a cry for help in the WeChat group. Everyone, come save me. Isn't Uncle Yu a veteran? You all should be able to fight them off. As the impact on the door behind her grew more intense, Lu Tianqian grew more anxious and said, I'm in trouble. None of you will be able to escape. But as soon as her words fell, the door behind her was broken open by someone, and then she was dragged out like a dead dog. Her ordeal didn't evoke sympathy, instead, it drew mockery from the radical faction. Serves you right for being a turtle. Your retribution has come, hasn't it? On the other side, Fa Yu Ching and her girlfriends were also very nervous when they saw the scene. If they didn't come up with a plan soon, their turn would come soon. At this moment, Fa Yu Ching had a plan. She must spread the news that Zhang Yi, that guy, had hoarded a large amount of supplies and then unite everyone to take over his house. So, I was quickly added into a group chat of a mutual aid group. I saw Fong muting at me in the group chat and said, Zhang Yi, it's too dangerous for everyone to live separately now. Your door at home is particularly solid, and we lack a secure base. I hope you can join our team. Now, everyone must unite. If you are alone, you will be dealt with by Xinjiang Hao soon. Seeing the message, I couldn't help but laugh. They want to pull the rug out from under me like the previous life. So Zhang Yi replied casually, I'm fine. I'm used to living alone in this small, run-down house of 150 square meters with heating issues in Intellect City. Seeing this, the group chat exploded with concern. Old Zhang Yi, don't be short-sighted. Everyone needs to unite now, Fa Yu Ching chimed in, echoing the sentiment that saving a life is more important than building a seven-story pagoda. You can save seven people now. That would be like building a 48-story pagoda, she added. However, Zhang Yi's response was to leave the group chat, stunning Fa Yu Cheng and the others. When did this bootlicker evolve into a cool guy? They wondered. Soon, they began discussing how to capture Zhang Yi. Glass's man suggested forcefully breaking down the door, confident they could take Zhang Yi down in one fell swoop. Brown Hair agreed, mentioning his expertise in locks from his previous job. They gathered at Zhang Yi's door, ready to pry it open. They even brought umbrellas to shield themselves from the cold water defense. However, despite Brown Hair's efforts to pick the lock for half a day, they couldn't even budge it. Zhang Yi, watching through surveillance, sneered inwardly, knowing his five-layer reinforced security door was as tough as a bank vault. He activated the high-voltage electric defense feature, shocking brown hair, who fell to the ground emitting black smoke. Fa Yu Ching, witnessing the scene, 
was stunned. The realization that Zhang Yi had just killed someone sank in. Glass's man, enraged, pointed at the door and shouted, Zhang Yi, you damn beast. We came to talk to you, and you just killed someone. Now Lu Tao is dead because of you. Don't you think you owe us an explanation? Zhang Yi just laughed, dismissing their intentions to pry his door open. I said shaking my head Zhang Yi loaded his crossbow, prioritizing survival. Suddenly, an arrow flew from the small window, hitting Glass's man's arm. Zhou Ping helped Glass's man up, surprised by Zhang Yi's ruthlessness. Two more arrows hit Zhou Ping and another neighbor, causing panic among Fang and the others. Returning to their lodgings, the injured men suffered an extreme cold. Without treatment, their wounds would worsen, especially since the arrows were rusty. Glass's man regretted his actions deeply. Then, Zhou Ping's cousin confronted Fa Yuqing, blaming her for the attack. Zhou Ping defended her, but the cousin accused Fa Yuqing of knowing about the crossbows. Feeling disappointed, Wang Min realized she had misjudged Fa Yuqing. They decided to seek help from Dr. Zhou in the community. When Dr. Zhou Ker arrived to check the wounds, she noticed similarities to a previous case she had treated for Xinjiang Hao. If it's an arrow wound, then Zhou said the wounds were too deep. Without professional equipment, the success rate of surgery was less than 20%. Furthermore, the iron arrow was rusty all over. Without antibiotics or similar drugs for treatment, they could only wait for death. Upon hearing this, one man immediately shed tears. She and Zhou Ping had grown up together, and their relationship was deep. She then turned to her niece, Dr. Zhou, pleading, you must find a way to save my cousin. Dr. Zhou turned her head and said, if we rashly pull out the arrows without medication, the consequences will only be worse. I hope you understand. At this moment, Fa Yuqing stepped forward, saying, I remember a month ago someone delivered a batch of drugs to Zhang Yi's house. There must be plenty of antibiotics and similar drugs. Why don't we ask him for some? Hearing this, the glass-eyed man looked excited. Really? Then you go find Zhang Yi. He caused my injury, he should take responsibility. However, Wang Min on the side expressed, we were almost killed by him just now. How could he possibly give us medicine to save our lives? Hearing this, Fa Yuqing said. We just wanted to take over his house. We didn't harm him. Besides, we're the ones who got hurt. We're the righteous ones here. Suddenly, Wang Min pointed at Fa Yuqing and said loudly, then you'll be in charge of getting the medicine. Zhang Yi once pursued you, you're the most suitable person to handle him. Zhou Ping also chimed in, Yuqing call him. I can only protect you when my arrow wound is healed. Hearing this, Fa Yuqing had no choice but to agree. However, thinking of my attitude, she had no confidence. Soon, she dialed my number and said, Lu Tao and Zhou Ping are dying. Can you help? Upon hearing this, Zhang Yi laughed. So what if they die? Everyone has to die sooner or later. Besides, do you really think you can survive this snow disaster? The city is blocked by heavy snow, and this building has become an isolated island. Once the existing supplies are used up, if you don't starve to death, you will be killed by Xinjiang Hao. Upon hearing this, Fa Yuqing trembled. Zhang Yi, I know I was wrong. It's all my fault. I let down your true feelings. But I've come to my senses now. Can you forgive me? Zhou Peng and the others were shot by you. If they don't get medicine, they will die from infection. At this point, Wang Men snatched Fa Yuqing's phone. Zhang Yi, don't be so heartless. Keep some goodwill. You never know when you might need us in the future. Upon hearing this, Zhang Yi laughed. Guess why I shot them with rusty arrows. I never intended to meet you again, and how do I know you won't suddenly turn against me? Upon hearing this, Wang Men hurriedly argued, How could we? We are good citizens. Zhang Yi cut her off. Good citizens wouldn't try to take over someone else's house. But well, helping you isn't impossible. Given that I have been pining after Fa Yuqing for 18 years, I might consider letting her come over alone. Upon hearing this, Fa Yuqing excitedly grabbed the phone. Zhang Yi, brother, I'm willing. From now on, Fa Yuqing is yours. Do whatever you want with her. Her best friend, Lin Kaining, also excitedly moved closer. Take me with you. Take me with you. But Fa Yuquangi slapped away Lin Kaining's hand. My brother Zhang Yi only wants me. You should just stay here and behave yourself. As soon as she finished speaking, one man slapped her across the face. You shameless woman. How could you betray me like this? Didn't you say you despised Zhang Yi the most and wanted to be with me? Fa Yuqing immediately started arguing, questioning if it's wrong to pursue a better life. Zhou Ping intervened, arguing that love means wanting the other person to be happy. Despite receiving some supplies, Zhang Yi seems to have much more, leaving Fa Yuqing defeated in the battle for her affection. Lin Kaining and Wang Min criticized Fa Yuqing for being selfish and not considering others' well-being. Meanwhile, Dr. Zhou, 
witnessing their argument, reminded them that their wounds were only temporarily treated and they needed to be prepared. Glassman proposed a plan to expose Zhang Yi's hoarding to the building's residents to benefit from it indirectly. Fa Yuching panicked, fearing she couldn't enjoy a comfortable life with Zhang Yi if they exposed him. In an attempt to win over Fa Yuching, intervened, promising to eventually win her heart. He confidently looked at Fa Yuching. Don't be afraid, I'm here, he said. This angered Wang so much that she almost wanted to slap this bootlicker to death. However, she decided to focus on the pressing matter first. She quickly posted some photos of delicious food in the homeowners group. Everyone is almost reduced to eating tree bark, but Zhang Yi is having sumptuous meals every day. Do you think that's fair? Seeing the message, Xinjiang Hao drooled all over the floor. This kid is hiding so many good things in his house. That's perfect. I can get my revenge for old grudges, he thought. Upon hearing this, the homeowners group exploded. Some people were trying to morally bind him, asking him to distribute his supplies to everyone. Some people, just for a meal, asked him to become a father to their child. There were even those who were willing to hand over billions in assets just to live in his house. Seeing the message, he just laughed. Why am I close with you? Why should I share my supplies with you? Thinking of these people breaking into his house in the past, he felt a fire in his belly. Now the tables have turned, he thought. Let's see how I'll play with you this time, he mused. Seeing his reply, Bootlicker King and others looked dumbfounded. Is Zhang Yi not afraid that we will unite against him? Others, seeing his cold-heartedness, began to blame him in the group chat. If you hadn't secretly hoarded supplies, we wouldn't be living like this. You must atone for your sins and donate the supplies to everyone. Besides, what's the point of living alone? Young people should have the spirit of contribution. Watching them bicker back and forth, Zhang Yi couldn't be bothered to engage any longer. Glancing at the falling snow outside the window, he muttered, staying at home every day is quite boring. It seems I should find some time to go out and stroll around. Luckily, he remembered he still had a few snowmobiles hidden in his pocket dimension. Once I deal with this group, it might be time to see what the outside world is like. Just then, his phone received a notification, a plea for help from Dr. Zhou. Mr. Zhang Yi, our home's medicine and supplies have been completely exhausted. Seeing the message, Zhang Yi instantly recalled Dr. Zhou from his previous life. Her death was a result of giving her last food to Salim and her daughter. However, he didn't immediately agree to her plea. Despite a good impression of her from the last life, the prettier the woman, the more dangerous, he thought. I don't want to die at the hands of a woman after barely getting another life. He wouldn't provide help without being completely sure of her trustworthiness. So, he responded, I can provide supplies, but you need to exchange something for them. Upon seeing the message, Dr. Joe immediately agreed to become his private medical assistant. If I still wouldn't agree, she could only sacrifice something else, Zhang Yi thought. But he did not agree to her terms. Instead, he said, I can provide you with medicine and food, but you have to do me a favor. Those neighbors are about to collapse soon, and they will definitely take action. I need you to be my spy to acquire their action plans. So, the decision is up to you now. You can either go along with the crowd and stay neutral, or you can choose to side with me and betray them. When Joe Care saw the message, she fell silent. If she chose me, she'd have to face all the homeowners in the building with me. But what she didn't know was that I had fortified my house like a fortress. Even if they came with a tank, they couldn't break in. I did this just to test her. At that moment, Glass's man sent me a final ultimatum, Zhang Yi, I'll ask you one more time. Will you hand over the supplies or not? When I saw the message, a cold smile appeared on my face. This guy had crossed the line. I responded confidently, even if I were to feed my food to the pigs, I wouldn't share a bit with you. This angered Glass's man, and he gritted his teeth. Very well, Zhang Yi. You still dare to talk tough even when death is imminent. You brought this upon yourself. Don't say we didn't give you a chance. Soon, a chat group was set up to denounce me. Xinjiang House solemnly declared, Don't worry, everyone. For this operation to eliminate Zhang Yi, I only need half of the supplies. After getting the supplies, I swear I won't harm anyone. Glass's man also echoed the sentiment, saying, Let's put our past grudges aside for now. Our primary goal is to take down Zhang Yi at once. On the other side, after some consideration, Zhou Care finally agreed to my terms. She knew deep down that as a woman alone, she couldn't hold out for long without clinging to a strong figure in this apocalyptic situation. Zhang Yi received a warning from Dr. Zhou that Uncle Glasses and his gang planned a full attack at 2.30 tonight. Instead of panicking, Zhang Yi was curious about what trouble the group would stir up. When Zhou sent another message urging him to come up with a plan, Zhang Yi just laughed it off. Looking at the guns beside him, he replied, all fear comes from not having enough firepower. He assured Zhou not to worry and warned her not to join their action, stating, I'm only warning once. With that, he picked up a gun, 
ready to handle the situation. At 2.30 in the morning, a group of armed people approached Zhang Yi's house, determined to kill him. They surrounded the corridor at the entrance, shouting threats. Watching from the surveillance cameras, Zhang Yi couldn't help but laugh. He didn't bother being polite and activated the high-voltage device. As some of the attackers tried to break down the door, they were electrocuted, turning into charred figures emitting black smoke. Seeing this, the others were frightened and wanted to escape, but Xin Zhang Hao and his gang blocked their way. Xin Zhang Hao aimed his gun at someone's head, warning them that anyone who dared to enter the battle should be prepared to die. He doubted the high-voltage electricity could last a year, confident in their ability to break through. A man with a strategic mindset stepped forward to encourage them, saying, Don't be afraid, everyone. We must avenge our fallen comrades. As long as we work together to break this iron door, what awaits us inside are a cozy fireplace and endless food. Encouraged by the man's words, the residents, who originally wanted to leave, were instantly filled with fighting spirit. They picked up wooden stakes and continuously smashed my door, eager for a bite of food. Everyone exerted all their strength, and listening to the rhythmic thudding coming from outside, I also became interested. So, I instantly retrieved a large speaker from another space and said, seeing you all hard at work, let me play a tune for you. Hearing the battle song, the neighbors seemed to be injected with a stimulant, hitting the door even harder. However, after half an hour of relentless beating, a few of them were panting and fell to the ground. What kind of door is this? We've been hitting it for so long, but only a tiny scratch was left. It seems we won't be able to break it open without years of effort, one of them said. At this moment, the man who works at a bank stepped forward and immediately identified it as a bank vault grade door. He said, such a door can't be breached even by a tank, let alone wood. Hearing this, the others looked shocked. Then is there no way to open the steel door? One of them asked. Unless we can find the world's top locksmith, there's no chance to open it without the key, the man replied. While he was explaining, I had already come to the door with my crossbow. So professional, I murmured, and then shot an arrow. Seeing the man get shot, the other residents in the hallway panicked. Shani actually has weapons? Glasses man and Xinjiang how didn't even tell us, one of them said. Some of the slower neighbors were quickly turned into thieves by my arrows. Looking at the neighbors scattered around on the floor, I felt no guilt. If they want my life, there's no need for me to be polite. Just then, the man with glasses had an idea. Everyone, don't panic. I have a plan. Zhang Yi's steel door might be thick, but the wall is still made of cement bricks. I don't believe we can't break it down. Hearing this, the neighbors seem to understand. We have so many people, we can definitely break his wall in less than half an hour. A few neighbors immediately mustered up their strength and started smashing the wall with vigor, while the man with glasses kept encouraging them. Sure enough, in a short while, cracks started appearing in the wall. Seeing this, a big man smashed the wall with even more force, but the next second, a metallic clang echoed and the impact numbed the man's arm. The man with glasses rushed forward and exclaimed, Damn it! The wall is made of steel plates too. Hearing this, several big men looked shocked. Who uses steel plates for wall construction? But they still didn't give up. They randomly hit different parts of the wall, hoping to find a weakness. Watching the scene, Zhang Yi couldn't help but laugh. I'm sorry to inform you that the outer walls of my house are reinforced with half a meter thick, high-quality steel. Not to mention your hammers, even if a cannonball came, I wouldn't be afraid. Soon, the neighbors realized that Zhang Yi must have known about the apocalypse in advance, which is why he built such a sturdy fortress. The man with glasses grew angrier the more he thought about it. He knew about the snow disaster all along, this selfish and narrow-minded person only caring about himself, ignoring the lives of everyone else. Some people couldn't bear this despair and started to cry on the spot. At that moment, Xin Zhang Hao emerged from the crowd, questioning why everyone was crying. He doubted if Zhang Yi's house was as impenetrable as they thought. Energized by his words, the neighbors decided to split up and attack the house. They hammered away vigorously, but soon realized Zhang Yi's house was built like a fortress. Watching from the surveillance, Zhang Yi chuckled at their efforts. After hammering for a while, the neighbors fell into despair again. Zhang Yi had indeed built his house like a reinforced tortoise shell. Without power tools, breaking through would be nearly impossible. As hunger gnawed at them, one neighbor's stomach grumbled loudly, craving meat. Suddenly, an idea struck him. He glanced at his neighbor, and they both drooled at the thought of meat. Meanwhile, Glass's man despaired at the idea of waiting for death in this apocalypse. Remembering Zhang Yi's balcony renovations, Glass's man suggested breaking in through the floor to ceiling windows. Upon hearing this, everyone's hopes were reignited. They refused to believe that Zhang Yi would seal his windows shut. They gathered together and began moving toward Zhang Yi's balcony, using planks to reach him. Outside his window, they yelled threats and demands for Zhang Yi to open the door. 
Unfazed, Zhang Yi calmly sipped his coffee and enjoyed his meal. As they continued to knock on the windows, Zhang Yi remained composed. He decided to teach them a lesson. He casually walked to the kitchen and crafted a homemade special cocktail. With a smirk, he placed it strategically in a small window in the room. In an instant, flames erupted on the balcony as the cocktail exploded. One of the neighbors, caught in the flames, wailed in agony before leaping off the balcony to escape the fire. Witnessing the chaos, the other neighbors pressed against the glass, begging for mercy. But Zhang Yi was unforgiving, reminding them of their past actions. Left with no choice, they retreated, hoping for help from those behind them. However, their escape was blocked by Glass Man and his group, who refused to let them bring the fire inside. In a desperate attempt to escape, one of the men swung a wooden hammer, only to lose his balance and fall from the building. Soon, those with no way out were charred in the fire. Facing this, Glass Man and his group showed no mercy. Instead, they gathered around the fire to warm themselves. The neighbors, no longer arrogant, dropped their weapons and approached Zhang Yi's floor to ceiling windows. Sorry, we were wrong. We just want a bite to eat. Please save us. We'll do whatever you want from now on, they pleaded. Listening to the police from outside the window, Zhang Yi sighed. Don't be like this. It makes me feel bad. When I'm upset, I have a strange quirk, I want to eat, he confessed, then started eating noodles from his bowl. The sight made the people outside drool. If only we could have some soup, they lamented. I know that in this apocalypse, human hearts are unpredictable, but now I have a better strategy, Zhang Yi declared. I'm not a cold-hearted person who wouldn't save people. I'll give you a chance. Bring me Xinjiang Hao, and I'll feed you these noodles for a week, enough for each meal. Hearing this, they all looked excitedly at Xinjiang Hao in the next building. To them, he looked like a delicious roast chicken. Taking him down would mean they wouldn't have to worry about food and drink for a week. Seeing their ill intent gazes, Xinjiang Hao felt a chill down his spine. There are always villains trying to harm me, he thought. Before he could think further, they charged towards him. However, under the threat of Xinjiang Hao's gun, they dared not act rashly. At this moment, Xinjiang Hao received a bounty notice sent in by the homeowner group. One offered food to whoever could kill Xinjiang Hao. When Xinjiang Hao saw the message, he understood why people were hostile towards him. The next day, neighbors set up an ambush for him. Though Xinjiang Hao had a pistol, his bullets were limited. Plus, my safe house was impenetrable. Previous attempts to attack me resulted in many casualties. It was clear they had to take advantage of his vulnerable state. Xinjiang Hao scolded his subordinates to go find snow to eat, knowing he was a target. Suddenly, two neighbors attacked with kitchen knives. Despite his quick response, he was wounded on his back. His men dragged the attacker's bodies home, but more trouble came when another attacker wounded him. After Xinjiang Hao asked a subordinate to assist him back to his room, he made a call to invite Dr. Zhou to treat his wound. Shortly after, Dr. Zhou arrived at Xinjiang's house carrying a medicine box. Dr. Zhou made it clear that he wouldn't offer free help, but Xinjiang smiled and offered to share some food in exchange for treatment. However, seeing the food, Dr. Zhou felt nauseated and refused to eat it, preferring death. Xinjiang, realizing the importance of having a doctor, tried to reassure her and even reached out to touch her cheek, promising to save her for last. Dr. Zhou, feeling uncomfortable, quickly left but was stopped by Xinjiang's subordinates. They insisted she stay until Xinjiang's wound healed. Meanwhile, Xinjiang and his men discussed plans to deal with a threat posed by someone who had issued a bounty on Xinjiang. They decided to move next door and keep watch, waiting for the opportune moment to confront the threat. Dr. Zhou, overhearing their conversation, quickly excused herself to the bathroom. In reality, she was relaying their conversation to Zhang Yi. Zhang Yi instructed her to stay and keep watching. Shortly after, there was a knock on the door of the neighboring house, and Xinjiang Hao and his men confidently entered. The couple living there dared not protest. Thankfully, they had hidden the remaining food on their person. With many empty rooms available, any could serve as suitable living quarters. Suddenly, two of Xinjiang Hao's men struck the couple from behind, causing them to collapse in a pool of blood. Xinjiang Hao, wearing a cruel smile, justified his actions by claiming it was for their own good. He argued that in the cold weather, they would freeze to death outside, and they needed to store some food. Meanwhile, in Wang Min's house, the three men with glasses lay on the sofa, crying out in pain. Since their failed attempt to forcibly take medicine from Zhang Yi's house, their wounds had worsened without proper treatment. A foul stench filled the hall as their wounds began to fester. Seeing this, Glass Man was shocked. Having just graduated and looking for a job, he didn't want to die so soon. Zhou Ping and the others had similar wounds. If it were just a scratch, it would be fine, but alas, they were wounded by my rusty arrows. Without antibiotics, their wounds would only worsen. At this moment, Zhou Ping ran to Wang. 
can you please plead with Zhang Yi for us again? Otherwise, we're all going to die, he begged. But Wang waved his hand. I'm out of ideas. Zhang Yi is not easily persuaded. On the other side, after the bounty was put on Zing Zhang Hao, he began to feel restless. He even feared being ambushed by his subordinates in the middle of the night. So, he used food as a bribe to recruit residents to join his camp. Seeing this from the surveillance, I couldn't help but laugh. Even if you have many people in your camp, Zing Zhang Hao, what do you think they will do when there's no food left? Then, I picked up the phone to call Dr. Zhou, asking her about the situation on her side. I could only hear her nervously answering. Xinjiang Hao's group has gone crazy. The existing food has been eaten up, and they are preparing to start robbing houses. Many neighbors have already become their victims. She pleaded, can you save me? I haven't eaten anything for two days. I can't hold on much longer if this continues. Upon hearing this, I paused for a moment. Dr. Zhou is the main surgeon at the nearby grade 3A hospital. In the post-apocalyptic world, doctors are hard to find. We can't let her die so easily. So, I replied, don't worry. Once I finish this last task, I assure you will not want for anything. Just then, my front door was knocked. It was Zhou Ping at the door, hysterical. Zhang Yi, you coward. Come out. Fa Yu Ching is starving to death, and you're still hiding in here. Are you a man? Hearing this, I couldn't help but laugh. At this point, I'm willing to call you the last bootlicker in the apocalypse, I said flatly. You're still thinking about Fa Yu Ching at a time like this? You should think more about yourself. Given your current situation, the tetanus bacteria has spread all over your body. Even if I gave you antibiotics, it would be useless. I remember you've been a bootlicker for so many years. I don't think you've ever even held Fa Yu Ching's hand, have you? Instead of waiting here to die, you might as well do what you want to do. Hearing this, Zhou Ping suddenly realized. He struggled to get up, staggering back up the stairs. After returning home, he rushed into Fa Yu Ching's room, kneeling down before her with a thud. Seeing Zhou Ping, an ecstatic Fa Yu Ching was instantly scared into screaming. Zhou Ping, what are you doing? Zhou Ping, his eyes bloodshot, stared at her intently. Fa Yu Ching, will you marry me? Fa Yu Ching frowned, disgust filling her eyes. She instinctively pinched her nose and shoved Zhou Ping to one side bitterly, saying, Get out of here, you're about to die you stink. I have to go find Zhang Yi. Who do you think you are? You're not even a spare tire in my book. Zhou Ping broke down. He had given so much for Fa Yu Ching, even his own life was at stake, but Fa Yu Ching never had a heartbeat for him from beginning to end. In desperation, Zhou Ping grabbed Fa Yu Ching's neck tightly, shrieking hysterically, you love me. I'm on the brink of death, let's face it together, Fa Yu Ching fearfully pushed Zhou Ping away. Your smell is awful. Isn't it because of you that I'm in this situation? Zhou Ping retorted, her face turning purple from Fa Yu Ching's grip. Who's to blame if you're useless? Meanwhile, after a night of deep thought, Dr. Zhou finally agreed to my proposition. She knew it was a test, and although dangerous, she had to do it to survive under Xinjiang Hao's control. With this in mind, Zhou slowly walked towards the kitchen. She told Xinjiang Hao that she wanted to help in the kitchen. Hearing this, he thought she had come to her senses and nodded in approval. That's for the best. I knew you couldn't resist. You still have some use for me. Dr. Joe turned back, returning to her usual aloof demeanor. I don't want to die. I want to live, she said slowly. Xinjiang Hao finally relaxed, waving his hand nonchalantly and allowing Dr. Joe into the kitchen to help. Once inside, Dr. Joe picked up an axe and started chopping wood for the fire. Energy is scarce these days, and cooking can only be done by burning furniture. Although she had agreed to my terms, she couldn't help but feel hesitant about this kind of meat. After a while, a younger brother asked Joe to watch the fire and not let it go out. Then, he turned and left to prepare the ingredients. Seeing this, Joe knew her chance had come. She pulled out a small bottle from her pocket and poured all the liquid inside into the pot. Fighting the nausea in her stomach, she carefully stirred the pot. At mealtime, she served everyone a large bowl. Looking at the steaming meat, I smiled. I never expected Dr. Joe to join us. To gain their trust, she served herself a bowl of soup and quietly returned to her room. Little did they know, Dr. Zhou had drugged the soup. Back in her room, she waited silently for the drug to take effect. She had added most of a bottle of sleeping pills to the pot. These pills work quickly, just one can put someone into a deep sleep in 30 minutes. Now, all she had to do was wait and hope Xinjiang Hao wouldn't notice she had tampered with the soup. In no time, Xinjiang Hao and the others fell asleep on the sofa. Seeing this, Dr. Zhou knew the drug had taken effect. She took a deep breath and immediately messaged me, Zhang Yi. I've given them a large dose of sleeping pills. They've all passed out. What are you planning to do next? I replied flatly, 
dragged them to the balcony. Seeing that Xin Zhang Hao and his group were all here, I let out a cold sneer. You guys finally fell into my hands, huh? Dr. Zhou saw me smirking on the other side and nervously asked, do you plan to kill them all? Hearing this, I smiled and directly tossed a hemp rope over. You guessed wrong. The one to take action is you, not me. Now, find the gun on Xin Zhang Hao and throw it to me. Then tie them all to this railing. Upon hearing this, Dr. Zhou hesitated. If she truly intended to harm, I wasn't sure if she could follow through. Before she could dwell on it further, I aimed the handgun directly at her. You've got one chance. Miss it, and there won't be another, I warned. Seeing that I was serious, Dr. Zhou had no option but to comply with my instructions and tie up Xin Zhang Hao and his group. Upon searching Xin Zhang Hao, Dr. Zhou found the flashy handgun. I then pointed it directly at Zhou's head, removed the magazine, and tossed it aside. Dr. Zhou hesitated, questioning if she could trust me not to turn on her. I chuckled, do you have any better options now? In this harsh weather, you won't survive long without my assistance. Reluctantly, Dr. Zhou followed my orders, removing the magazine and handing over the handgun. After inspecting it to ensure it was the same one Xin Zhang Hao had, I returned to the room. There, I grabbed a water pipe and sprayed it directly at Xin Zhang Hao's group, shocking Dr. Zhou with the ruthless method of freezing them. Soundly sleeping, Xin Zhang Hao was abruptly awakened by the freezing cold water, his hands and feet bound. Realizing he had been drugged, he looked at me, accusing me of being despicable. I couldn't help but laugh at his audacity. Opening the valve again, I directed a stream of water at them. No one could withstand such extreme cold for long, and soon Xin Zhang Hao and his group were frozen solid. Just then, Dr. Zhou received my call, congratulating her for passing the test. Collapsing to the ground in relief, she had proven her worth under my guidance. Keeping my promise, I allowed her to stay in my house. When she cautiously arrived at my door, I held a handgun, ready to defend myself. After letting her in, I locked the door behind her. Overwhelmed with relief, she collapsed on the floor, feeling a sense of warmth she hadn't felt in a long time. Dr. Zhou was surprised at how well I was living. Just as she started to relax in this cozy paradise, I surprised her by putting a gun to her back. Don't get too comfortable yet, I said. Just because you're on my side now doesn't mean you're off the hook. You still need to prove you're not a threat. She understood what I meant and quickly removed her coat to show she wasn't hiding anything dangerous. Satisfied, I handed her a towel. You've been working hard. Take a hot shower, I told her. She grumbled inwardly, thinking how unfair it was that my life seemed better than before the apocalypse. As she showered, I sorted through the medical kit she brought, stashing away anything that could be dangerous. Even though we were being honest with each other, it never hurt to be cautious. Two hours later, Dr. Joe emerged from the bathroom in pajamas, her hair still wet. There was a hint of beauty in her disheveled appearance. I gestured for her to sit next to me on the sofa. I grabbed the hairdryer and started drying her hair. I didn't let you stay here because you're pretty, but because you're useful to me. But remember, this is my place. Letting you stay here is a big favor, so don't try anything sneaky. There are cameras everywhere. If I catch you plotting against me, I won't hesitate to get rid of you, I warned her. Then, I pointed to the room next door. You'll stay there from now on without my permission. You're not allowed to wander around. Dr. Joe responded softly, clearly understanding the consequences of crossing me. Dr. Joe, you're smart. I hope you'll keep your word. Of course, I'll treat you fairly, I assured her. Then, I walked behind Dr. Joe, about to reveal my biggest secret to her. I needed to ensure her loyalty to me. Everyone knows the snow disaster was caused by gamma rays from a supernova explosion. But these rays can also mutate humans, I explained. With a wave of my hand, I conjured a loaf of bread out of thin air. This is the superpower I gained from another dimension. I can store any supplies in it. Seeing this, Dr. Joe suddenly understood why I live so comfortably. No wonder I have so many supplies, she realized. Dr. Joe, you're smart. If you stick with me, you'll enjoy all my supplies, including food and hot baths. If I die, the supplies in the different space will disappear with me, so you can only survive if I survive. Right now, I don't fully trust you. You need to exchange labor for rewards, so from now on, you'll be responsible for all the housework. Just as Dr. Joe was about to agree, I interrupted her. Besides this, what else can you offer me? Upon hearing this, Dr. Joe's cheeks suddenly turned red. Being a smart person, she naturally knew what I was talking about. The next day, I looked at the still sleeping joke with mixed feelings. Having a woman around in the apocalypse is quite nice. If I were alone, I fear I might have a mental breakdown one day. Then I knocked on the door signaling Joe to get up for breakfast. Dr. Joe woke up from her sleep, this was the best sleep she'd had since the apocalypse began.
She then dressed and came into the living room. Afterwards, I smiled. Were you waiting for me? Hurry up and eat. Hearing this, Dr. Joe didn't hesitate, she picked up the hamburger on the table and started eating it hungrily. Seeing my half-smiling expression, Dr. Joe realized her eating manners were not good, so she sat up straight like a well-behaved child. After Dr. Joe was full, I tossed her a thermal coat. This coat is a high-tech product from before the apocalypse, it can withstand temperatures down to minus 100 degrees. Then I gestured for Joe to come out with me. Dr. Joe was puzzled. What are we going to do? At this, I gave a cold laugh. Obviously, we're going out to smash those icicles to pieces. If they're frozen into icicles, they're still disgusting to look at. Although these people were indirectly killed by her, she still hesitated to smash them. Before she could think too much, I made a gesture of invitation. Dr. Joe, it's your turn to take the stage, I said. Seeing this, Joe couldn't say anything else. She immediately climbed over the balcony and went to the other side along the board. Then, she raised the baseball bat in her hand and smashed it down on the people frozen into icicles. Watching this, I took out my phone and started recording. Are you recording? Dr. Joe asked puzzled. I want to show those dishonest guys who's in charge of this building now, I replied. At this, Dr. Joe didn't hesitate and continued to swing the baseball bat in her hand. At this moment, she didn't care about her angelic image. As long as she could survive, that's all that mattered. However, what she didn't expect was right after I posted the video in the owner's group, not only did the neighbors not blame her, they applauded her. Some even wept for joy at the sight. After all, Chin Chang Hao had been domineering here for a long time, and there were no few owners who had died at his hands. Now, seeing Xinjiang get his comeuppance, they were naturally overjoyed. So they started flattering me in the group. Fa Yu Ching was the first to call me, which surprised me. I didn't expect her to still be around. Pitifully, she said on the phone, Zhang Yi, Xinjiang Hao is dead. Can I come to your house for food and warmth? I don't want you to be with that woman. You belong only to me. I just laughed at her request. So you're not dead after all, I remarked. Fa Yu Ching seemed to understand. I get it now, Zhang Yi. He thought I was dead, and that's why he's with that woman, Dr. Zhou. I'm coming to live the good life with you now. But her best friend and Wang were not happy about this. Their miserable lives were all because of Fa Yu Ching so they naturally wouldn't allow her to have a good life. Soon, the sound of the three women fighting with each other came from the other end of the phone. Seeing this, Jo Care hurried over. She felt a sense of crisis at this moment, afraid that I would run away. This scene suddenly gave me a wicked idea. Fa Yu Ching, in the last life, you made me turn into despair. This time, it's your turn to experience despair. On the other hand, I asked Dr. Jo if she thought I was being too harsh. She leaned in and said she trusted my reasons. Hearing that, I couldn't help but lower my guard. After all, who could resist such an understanding and sensible woman? Before long, Dr. Joe had prepared a table full of delicious lunch. I had just taken a bite of an apple when a message popped up in the homeowners group chat. It was from the same troublemaker who used to be so arrogant. She was back at it again, boasting about her connections in the government and threatening everyone to hand over their food or face consequences after the snowstorm. It caught me off guard. I remembered Annie Lin, who was the first victim looted by Xinjiang Hao. The fact that she was still alive was quite a surprise. Dr. Zhou mentioned quietly that she had left some supplies when treating Lin Xiaohu, assuming the snowstorm would pass quickly. Little did she know it would last for two and a half months. I found it puzzling. Even with the supplies Dr. Zhou left, Annie Lin couldn't have survived for so long, especially with a two and a half year old grandson. Then, someone mentioned that Lin Xiaohu had died about ten days ago due to lack of medication. Suddenly, it all made sense. It seemed that Annie Lin had resorted to desperate measures. Dr. Zhou, having been under Xinjiang Hao house control for two days, was no stranger to such grim realities, including the possibility of cannibalism. Just as I was going about my day, my phone suddenly rang. Seeing that it was Uncle Yu calling, I picked up the phone and asked what was going on. Uncle Yu seemed a bit awkward, which caught my attention. He's one of the few good people left after the apocalypse, and also a martial artist, so I naturally wouldn't refuse his call. Uncle Yu hesitantly mentioned that Xiao Li Mei's daughter, Tang Bao, was running a fever and needed some fever-reducing medicine. Uncle Yu, who has been single all his life, was probably tempted by the young and attractive Xiao Li Mei after being single for 40 years. How could he resist such temptation? So, he became the willing victim of this scheming mother. Hearing this, my expression faltered. This situation wasn't simple. Among all the homeowners, only Uncle Yu had managed to make the most correct choice among many but I didn't dwell on it too much. After all, it's someone else's family matter, and this could be an opportunity to win over Uncle Yu for future use. 
So, I smiled and said that I still have a few boxes of fever-reducing medicine and asked Uncle Yu to come pick it up later. Upon hearing this, Uncle Yu was overjoyed and profusely thanked me, even swearing that if I ever need his help in the future, he will do his best to assist me. At that moment, Dr. Joe leaned over and asked if I had a good relationship with Uncle Yu. I answered indifferently, stating that people interact mainly for mutual benefit. Uncle Yu is a kind and honest person, and having him owe me a favor might be useful later on. Moreover, I don't want to see a retired soldier like him lose the last glimmer of his humanity in these apocalyptic times. Soon, there was a knock on my door from Uncle Yu and little Zhang Yi. Hey, it's Uncle Yu, I thought as I glanced at the door's monitor. Unexpectedly, Xiao Li Mei was also there, looking anxious. Our Tang Bao has a high fever, Zhang Yi, please help us, she pleaded urgently. Without hesitation, I tossed a box of fever-reducing medicine through the small door window. Give it to the child quickly. Don't waste any time, I instructed. Uncle Yu gratefully picked up the medicine, expressing his thanks. Zhang Yi, thank you so much. You've helped me out twice already in this apocalypse, he said sincerely. Just then, Xiao Li Mei stepped forward, her voice filled with desperation. Zhang Yi, do you have a heater? Could Tang Bao stay at your place for a while? We'll leave once she gets better. However, I saw through her request immediately. You're probably wanting to take a mile when given an inch, I thought to myself. Calmly, I addressed the group outside. Sorry, miss, but these are special times. I can't easily let outsiders in. Plus, we're almost out of coal. We're even resorting to wearing eight down jackets each to keep warm. Uncle Yu quickly intervened to smooth things over. Zhang Yi has already done us a big favor. Let's not make things difficult for him, he said diplomatically. Xiao Li Mei started to emotionally manipulate me, saying, Zhang Yi, please think about it for Uncle Yu's sake and for the child. She's so young. Let us stay at your place for a short time. Hearing this, my expression darkened. I knew Xiao Li Mei was a master manipulator, surviving in the previous apocalyptic world by exploiting people's sympathies. But her trick wouldn't work on me. I calmly replied, if this were before the apocalypse, I'd have no problem letting you and your entire village stay. But now, it's the end times. All the tenants in the building want to take over my place. I hope you understand. Xiao Li Mei wasn't giving up. You let Dr. Zhou stay, didn't you? If she can stay, why can't we? She argued. I chuckled at her comparison. Dr. Zhou is my girlfriend. If she doesn't stay at my place, should she stay at yours? Dr. Zhou looked surprised, knowing I was just joking. But having a dependable man to rely on in these times is what every woman desires. Uncle Yu chimed in, yeah, little Zhang has already helped us a lot. Let's not make things more difficult for him. Xiao Li Mei looked dejected, saying, I'm doing all of this for the sake of the child. What will happen to me if something happens to her? Seeing her distress, Uncle Yu felt helpless. He could only leave with her, continually apologizing to me. After they left, I sighed, realizing this woman's meddling might strain my relationship with Uncle Yu. In my opinion, Uncle Yu is the ideal worker. Not only is he honest, but he's also quite skilled. Now, with Xiao Li Mei whispering in his ear, my plans might be delayed. On the other hand, as soon as Uncle Yu got home, he began questioning Xiao Li Mei. Medicine is scarce right now. It's good enough that he gave us some. Why are you so greedy? Xiao Li Mei, holding the child, looked distressed. I'm doing this for our child and our future. I don't plan to freeload off him forever. Hearing this, Uncle Yu sighed. I understand what you mean, but we should be grateful. If it weren't for little Zhang warning me about the snow disaster, I wouldn't be alive today. Upon hearing this, Xiao Li Mei began to ponder. If Zhang Yi knew about the snow disaster in advance, he must have hoarded a lot of supplies. She leaned on Uncle Yu's shoulder. Inside, I understand the principle, but while you see him as a benefactor, he sees you as a potential threat. Didn't you see? He even threw the medicine out to us, afraid that we would enter and take over his home. If he's genuinely a good person, how could he ruthlessly kill dozens of neighbors? In my view, he's just offering minor favors to use you as his henchman later. Before Xiao Li Mei could finish, Uncle Yu loudly interrupted her. Enough. I know you can still distinguish between right and wrong. Please don't speak like this anymore. His angry outburst startled Xiao Li Mei, who then apologized repeatedly. She knew that Uncle Yu was now angry and would have to find another opportunity to stir the pot. Uncle Yu then left, his face stern. Though he is honest and straightforward, he's not foolish. He knows exactly what Xiao Li Mei is thinking. Looking at Tang curled up in sleep, I grimaced. In this apocalyptic world, survival means being ruthless. It's been 75 days of relentless cold, 
with snow piling up as high as an eight-story building in our residential area. Leaving is nearly impossible. The few of us left can only scavenge for food nearby. Then, unwelcome guests arrived. They dug through the snow and unearthed a tunnel leading to my apartment complex. Some emerged holding shovels and hammers, heading straight for my apartment on the 24th floor. As one tenant tried to escape, they knocked him down without hesitation. Anything alive they find becomes their food. But their main goal is to take over my home. They've discovered I've hoarded a large amount of food. In this desperate time, where food and warmth are scarce, this knowledge is a ticking time bomb. Once they take me down, they can prolong their own survival. Soon enough, this group confidently arrived at my doorstep. A guy skilled in demolition stepped up with a bunch of C4 explosives. After lighting the fuse, he dashed down the corridor. Moments later, there was a huge explosion that jolted me awake. With no time to waste, I grabbed my handgun and checked the surveillance cameras. I saw a bunch of unfamiliar faces sneaking around at the end of the hallway, discussing something with the tools they were holding. I quickly realized they were construction workers from the neighboring building. There were about 20 or more of them, and their bold approach indicated that news of my stash had leaked outside. The group seemed puzzled by the failed explosion. One of them called Old Donkey scratched his head, admitting the explosives might have gotten damp, reducing their power. Another suggested they simply break in, boasting about their skills in tearing down buildings. Watching all this unfold on my monitor, I was furious. If the tiger doesn't show its might, they'll think I'm just a harmless cat. I quickly grabbed the white phosphorus I'd stashed away from another dimension. With haste, I whipped up some simple white phosphorus grenades and a few incendiary ones. Tossing them out of a nearby window, I watched as the white phosphorus grenades exploded, instantly heating up to a scorching 1000 degrees Celsius. Two unlucky souls near the door couldn't dodge in time and were melted by the intense heat. The fire spread like wildfire through the corridor. As one of them, Old Donkey, was about to yell to his buddies, a bullet silenced him, piercing through his skull. I grabbed my handgun and fired several shots at the intruders outside. The sight left the team leader, second uncle, frozen in shock. They thought breaching my home would be a piece of cake, but they hadn't counted on my place being a fortress armed with deadly weapons. The last intruder approaching my front door met a similar fate, dropping to the ground lifeless. Second uncle didn't waste a second longer, hastily ushering the remaining crew to retreat back to their neighboring community. They feared sharing the same fate as their fallen comrades, reduced to ashes if they were just a hair too slow. I stared at the handgun, now empty of bullets, lost in thought. In this post-apocalyptic world, there are bound to be stronger interest groups than these workers. Dealing with tough characters like them will require even more powerful weapons. Plus, these guys clearly came prepared. I need to find an opportunity to take them out completely. Returning to the room, I reassured the already terrified Dr. Joe. Don't worry, I've chased those people away. Hearing this, Dr. Joe looked at me with tearful eyes. This was her first encounter with a firefight in this new world. If those people had broken in, she could only imagine the terrible fate awaiting her. But knowing I had driven them away brought her considerable relief. For now, I'm her only support. She asked me what had happened, and I explained briefly. Dr. Joe looked stunned. These people are much more dangerous than Xinjiang Hao. He only had a handgun, but these workers do physical labor every day, making them naturally stronger. And they even know about demolitions. We need to deal with this problem soon, or we won't be able to sleep peacefully in the future. Finishing my thoughts, I glanced at my phone. It's time to find some expendable people to help me out. At the same time, the homeowners group chat was buzzing with activity. I quickly explained the situation to everyone in the group. As soon as they saw my message, they started showering me with praise. Zangi, you're our hero. However, I had to be honest with them, I told them that my weapons were nearly depleted and that everyone would need to fend for themselves. Just then, Uncle Yu called me to check on my situation. He mentioned that he knows the leader of those workers, a man named Huang Tianfan. Under his leadership, dozens of homeowners had already been harmed in the past few days. Hearing this, an idea instantly popped into my mind. Uncle Yu, can you provide me with more details about them? That way, I can discuss plans with everyone to deal with them. Uncle Yu explained that this group comes from the building next door and are part of a gang called the Heavenly United Gang. The gang consists of more than 20 members, with Huang Tianfang as the ruthless leader. His misdeeds are no less than those of Xinjiang Hao. After learning this, I decided to collaborate with the homeowners on the 25th floor to counteract these workers. They've suffered a significant loss at my hands this time, and they'll definitely look for another opportunity to strike back. Unless we eliminate them, nobody will be at peace. The homeowners in my building are the type who only respond to force and wouldn't easily agree to unite against external threats. What I need to do now is wait for the right moment. 
Turning to Dr. Joe beside me, I expressed my concerns. These neighbors might show respect to me on the surface, but they'd love to tear me down behind my back. So, I'll leave it to you and Uncle you to gather information. The sooner we understand the forces in the area, the better for our next steps. Two and a half days flew by quickly. Dr. Joe, dressed in work attire, listed the latest intelligence on a blackboard. The biggest threat right now is the heavenly united gang, composed of labor workers who are naturally stronger than ordinary people. Fortunately, they don't have access to firearms or other deadly weapons. Next up is the wolf gang from Building 21, led by thugs Wang Chong and Shaolu. Their members are mostly young people in their 20s. Hearing this, I pondered. It seems the main threats come from these two groups. Homeowners in other buildings have already diminished in numbers through infighting, so they shouldn't pose a threat to me. I instructed Dr. Joe to continue gathering information, emphasizing the importance of confirming whether they possess firearms or other weapons. On the other side, Huang Tianfang led the Heavenly United Gang back again. However, this time they didn't choose to attack my home directly but decided to deal with the surrounding neighbors first. They said that if I don't come out, they'll eliminate all the other homeowners in Building 25. As expected, his words quickly ignited a strong reaction from all the homeowners in the building. Zhang Yi, you're the one who caused all this trouble. Why should we have to bear it? I couldn't help but laugh at the message. These people never change, do they? I replied with a smile, you guys can't resist them, so why should I go out and get myself killed? You think you're the only ones with thick skin. What does this have to do with me? This instantly infuriated a few of my neighbors. Zhang Yi, did a dog eat your conscience? Your house is safe as a turtle shell. Have you thought about us? Seeing this, I was immediately enraged. These idiots really don't know the meaning of the word death. What do your lives have to do with me when you all ganged up on me? Where was your talk of conscience then? You don't really think I won't take action against you, do you? Upon reading my message, several neighbors were left speechless because they knew I would really do it. They initially thought they would survive after Xinjiang Hao's death, but now a more ruthless Heavenly United Gang has arrived. If things continue this way, they'll be fertilizer long before the snowstorm ends. Looking at my neighbors who are on the verge of despair, I dialed Uncle Yu with a smile. Uncle Yu, it's your turn to perform. After a long silence, Uncle Yu suddenly spoke in the group chat, don't be afraid, everyone. The Heavenly United Gang is at most 20 plus people. As long as we work together, we can fend them off. Seeing this message, the homeowner suddenly saw a glimmer of hope. Uncle, you were right. We'll all support you wholeheartedly. However, Uncle then revealed that you haven't eaten for several days. Uncle said that if we want to win this fight, we'd have to rely on me. Not only can my house afford three meals a day, but we also have weapons, making me the most suitable leader for the group. Seeing the message, I couldn't help but smile. I didn't expect Uncle, a seemingly honest man, to be quite skilled at manipulating people. Soon, Uncle, you sent me a private message asking what we should do next. Seeing that the timing was about right, I told Uncle, you, to keep supporting me in the chat. I must seize this opportunity to make everyone listen to me. Only then can our building be safe in the future. Then, I coldly stated in the homeowners group chat, I'm willing to talk more with you all, only because of uncle, you. I can help, but under one condition, you all have to listen to me, no sneaky moves behind my back. Hearing this, many homeowners quickly responded, as long as you're not sending us to our deaths, we'll do whatever you say, Zangi. Of course, I didn't believe these people would be so cooperative. I immediately replied, I won't send you to your deaths, but I will need you to take up arms against the Heavenly United Gang. Can you do that? The chat went silent. What's the difference between this and sending us to die? Seeing that no one was responding. I chuckled, amused by the suggestion that I should face danger alone. Dr. Joe, standing beside me, seemed equally bewildered by our neighbor's cowardice. In the group chat, I remarked, if that's the case, there's no need for further discussion. You can wait for the Heavenly United Gang to pick you off one by one. My front door is made of steel, so I'm not worried. Uncle Yu quickly chimed in, urging unity, if we continue like this, we're all doomed. Instead of waiting to be slaughtered, why not fight together for survival? His words struck a chord, and the homeowners realized the gravity of our situation. Uncle Yu is right, they agreed. We might as well give it our all. With everyone on board, I laid down the law, from now on, everyone must follow my instructions. If I catch anyone slacking off, don't blame me for being tough. My words sparked a flurry of activity in the group chat, with homeowners calling out those who had been inactive. We were at a critical juncture, and playing dead any longer would only seal our fate. Understanding the need for both kindness and firmness, I reassured the group, since you've chosen to follow me, I won't let you down. Just listen to my orders, and we'll get through this together. 
I'll head out to find supplies to fortify the building. We need at least some basic combat gear, and luckily, I've already got some snowmobiles prepared. In this snowy apocalypse, I'm the only one who can move around freely in the city. But when the homeowners read my message, they look confused. Won't you freeze to death out there in this extreme cold? They ask. I assure them that I know what I'm doing. As a leader, I have to take action for everyone's sake. I've been managing warehouses for two years, so I know where to find nearby malls and supermarkets. Plus, my own supplies are running low, and we need more to survive. Hearing this, many homeowners are moved to tears, saying I'm the right leader for the job. But only I know the true nature of these people. In the apocalypse, human nature is unpredictable. The neighbors start treating me like a god, saying they'll follow my orders without question. But I don't care about their flattery. If it weren't for fighting against the Heavenly United Gang, I wouldn't care whether they live or die. I can't forget the pain of being torn apart in my previous life. Dr. Joe looks worried. The snowstorm has lasted so long, and the outside world is almost paralyzed. No one knows what dangers lurk out there. I put on my level 3 armor and smile at Dr. Joe. I've been wanting to go out and see for a while now. This is a good opportunity. Don't worry, there are enough supplies at home to sustain you. I still don't fully trust Dr. Joe. She volunteered to go with me, but I playfully pinched her cheek and told her she should stay home and wait for her man. With that, I left, assuring her that I trust her completely now. Dr. Joe was touched, but within seconds, I secretly moved all the remaining food and coal into an alternate space. Then, I went downstairs and arrived on the fourth floor. By now, the snow had piled up as high as the third and fourth floors. I only needed to open the window to step directly outside, but as soon as I did, the snow engulfed me up to my knees. Luckily, before the apocalypse, I had stashed some snowmobiles in an alternate space, otherwise, it would have been impossible to move in snow piled meters high. Looking around and seeing no one spying, I took a snowmobile from my alternate space. Unaware that a shadowy figure in the building above was watching my every move, I rode my beloved motorcycle and headed out of the neighborhood. I had been cooped up at home for so long that I was starting to get cabin fever. Finally, I had a chance to breathe some fresh air. After satisfying my urge to speed, I drove the snowmobile to the Heavenly Sea City Police Station. The primary purpose of this trip was to find more powerful weapons. The biggest fear in this post-apocalyptic world is not having enough firepower. As I entered the dark station, it seemed deserted, but I stumbled upon frozen cops who were ill-prepared for the extreme cold. After paying my respects, I found a set of keys under a cloth, keys to all the rooms, including the armory. Excited, I made my way to the armory and found a variety of weapons, including a powerful sniper rifle. With my improved shooting skills, I felt confident in defending my safe house against any threat, even from the Heavenly United Gangs. After securing the weapons, I turned my attention to finding supplies for my neighbors. While my safe house could withstand artillery, it was vulnerable if the load-bearing walls were destroyed. Utilizing my neighbors as a front line of defense seemed like the best strategy. Since the nearby shopping centers were likely depleted, I headed to a large suburban mall buried under snow, relying on memory to navigate. I cleared the snow on the ground with my hand, then broke the skylight and slid down a rope. Seeing all the fancy stuff in the mall, I couldn't help but feel nostalgic. Before the apocalypse, it would take two months' worth of salary just to buy one item. Now, all these luxury goods are just worthless junk. After stashing some useful supplies in my alternate space, I headed to the supermarket on the underground floor. Due to the extreme cold, the fruits were all frozen and spoiled, and some of the meat had turned zombie-like. I managed to find some still edible food and packed it into my bags. I wouldn't normally bother with these items, but they'll do for dealing with the neighbors. Returning to the neighborhood with two large bags of supplies, I caught the attention of a few members of the Heavenly United Gang in the building next door. Huang Tan Fong's eyes lit up at the sight of my snowmobile, with such a vehicle, he could easily go outside to find supplies in the future. The sound of the snowmobile also attracted a crowd of neighbors, though greed was written all over their faces. Uncle, you surprised me, said Little Zhang, seeing me carrying two large bags of supplies. You actually found so much in one go. I sighed. With the snowstorm going on for so long, the local supermarkets have been emptied. Otherwise, I would have brought back even more. Despite the supplies being spoiled by the cold, it was enough to make all the neighbors drool, their eyes filled with anticipation. I quickly grabbed my handgun and warned, I went through a lot to get these. I hope you appreciate it. Hearing this, Uncle caught on and shouted, Zhang Yi has brought us hope for survival. Shouldn't we thank him? With the crowd chanting long live Zhang Yi, I knew it was time to make a statement. I had Dr. Joe pour out all the supplies I had found, then looked at everyone and said firmly, since you've all chosen to follow me, I won't let you down. 
but this is the most dangerous moment, and I, Zhang Yi, won't tolerate idlers. If you eat these supplies, you must pick up arms against the Heavenly United Gang. Just then, members of the Heavenly United Gang arrived at our building, armed and shouting, hand over the food or don't blame us for being rude. Seeing this, I knew the opportunity to test our neighbors had arrived. I pointed at the Heavenly United Gang members outside and said coldly, anyone who can take down one of them will be rewarded with five people's worth of food. Hearing this, the neighbors hesitated for a moment, but seeing only ten members of the Heavenly United Gang outside and considering they were a group of several dozen, they felt emboldened. So, the neighbors, as if injected with courage, armed themselves with pots and pans and charged. Seeing this, the Heavenly United Gang members were stunned. These usually cowardly people were suddenly brave today. Soon, both groups were fiercely fighting in the snow for the sake of food. Everyone was seeing red, and even though they got injured multiple times, they felt no pain. This was exactly what I wanted to see. I'm no saint, but if these neighbors are willing to fight for their lives, I certainly won't hesitate to provide them with food. At that moment, Uncle Yu shouted, Everyone, let's go. They are outnumbered and won't hold on for long. With Uncle Yu, a retired soldier, joining the fray, the battle quickly turned one-sided. Seeing they were no match, the remaining Heavenly United gang members fled towards their building without looking back. Witnessing this, all the neighbors picked up their weapons and cheered. It was their first victory, fought for their own survival. However, despite our win, many people were severely injured, and without professional equipment and medication, they likely won't survive for long. Moments later, I gathered all the neighbors in the building's lobby. You all did very well, I praised them. As you've seen, this is the power of unity. As long as we work together, even the apocalypse may not be insurmountable. I then turned to the two young individuals who performed the best in the battle. You both did extremely well. Keep up this momentum moving forward. I handed them two portions of food, and seeing this, they were so moved that they burst into tears, finally able to eat a full meal in this apocalyptic world. The rest of the neighbors were filled with regret, wishing they had given it their all. This was exactly the kind of attitude I wanted to see, so that everyone would fight against external enemies without holding back. I waved my hand, calling each person forward to receive their daily food ration. As the remaining neighbors approached, some who received less food looked regretful, wishing they had contributed more earlier. When it was Su Hao's turn, a wealthy second-generation individual, I tossed him a small piece of candy. Seeing that others had at least a biscuit while he only had candy, he immediately protested, claiming it wasn't fair. I responded coldly, reminding him that while others were fighting on the front lines, he was merely shouting slogans from the back. Giving him candy was already generous, considering his lack of contribution. This seemed to reassure the neighbors who received less food, knowing they weren't at the bottom. However, Su Hao continued to argue, claiming there were too many people fighting for him to find a way in. I simply laughed, stating that I only care about results, not excuses. His protests only fueled his anger, accusing me of unfairness and targeting him. Without hesitation, I signaled for two neighbors to restrain him. I questioned his audacity to talk about fairness with me, especially when a woman in her forties from next door managed to find a way in and throw a few punches. After silencing Su Hao, I pointed a gun at him, asking the group what should be done with someone so undisciplined and disobedient. In response, the two neighbors holding Su Hao began to beat him. I turned to my neighbors and said, if anyone thinks I'm being too much, feel free to find your own food. I, Zhang Yi, won't bother you. Seeing no objections, I clapped my hands and said, very good. I hope everyone will follow the arrangements from now on. But Su Hao, used to being arrogant, wasn't convinced. Zhang Yi, don't push people too far, he said. Before he could finish, I stepped on his hand. Su Hao, we're in a post-apocalyptic world now. You can't go back to your cushy life. I won't support a waste like you who only knows how to eat. I warned everyone to take it seriously and asked Dr. Zhou to collect the remaining food for distribution later. But then, Fa Yu Ching's voice broke through the crowd. Brother Zhang Yi, I haven't received any food yet, she said, pushing her way forward with her best friend. She claimed I treated her the best and hadn't forgotten about her. I couldn't help but laugh. Of course, I haven't forgotten about you, because there was never any food allocated for you in the first place. Hearing this, Fa Yu Ching burst into tears, but I pushed her away gently, saying it was just casual talk. I told her I already had a girlfriend, Dr. Joe, and asked her to stop bothering me. Dr. Joe came over and acted affectionately with me, putting an end to the situation. Seeing Fa Yu Ching cry even harder, I couldn't help but laugh. You used to think your looks could attract anyone, but now, in this post-apocalyptic world, how many packs of instant noodles do you think your face is worth? Su Ao, lying on the ground, chimed in, 
calling her out as a schemer from before the apocalypse. The neighbors around us started gossiping, shocked to realize the seemingly innocent white lotus was actually quite manipulative. Trying to regain control of the situation, Fa Yi Ching attempted to silence everyone, but her efforts fell on deaf ears. Left with no other option, she yelled and ran away. I decided to reward Suha, who had shown sensibility, with another candy. After that, I got to work arranging the defense of the building. Excluding the children who couldn't fight, we still had 47 people in building 25. I divided them into six small groups, each consisting of seven to eight people, to take turns guarding against attacks from other buildings on eight-hour shifts. We established a signal in case of emergencies, everyone would hit the stair railing or other metal objects to alert everyone else. The same incentives for killing enemies remained in place, whoever kills an outsider gets enough food for five people. Of course, those who slack off during their shifts will only get leftover food. After saying this, I patted Uncle Yu on the shoulder. As a military veteran, he's the best person to handle it all. Two days flew by, and the Heavenly United Gang didn't seem eager to attack. Dr. Joe looked worried, sensing trouble in the peace. Meanwhile, I was on my tablet, learning about different ways to use firearms. The heavy snow had trapped the city, covering the lower buildings. Even if the snow stopped, it'd take two and a half months to melt. In this post-apocalyptic world, human hearts are scarier than natural disasters. I then took out the firearms I'd obtained from the armory through the pocket dimension. With enough firepower, I'm not afraid of any number of enemies. The sniper rifle even had an 8 power scope for observing the community. I took it to the balcony to practice my rusty shooting skills when two figures appeared in my scope. A cold smile spread across my lips. Finally, the Heavenly United Gang couldn't resist, heading towards the community garage. I quickly realized they were probably after my snowmobile. Unfortunately for them, their efforts were bound to fail. During the day, I pretended to leave the snowmobile in the garage, but I had already stashed it in the pocket dimension. Just then, Uncle Yu called to inform me that the defense personnel had been properly arranged. He advised me not to take to heart what Xiao Li Mei had said during the day, noting she's a bit talkative. I chuckled at that, I wouldn't hold a grudge against a woman for such things. But then I teased Uncle Yu, asking if he was sure about raising a child for someone else. I really didn't like Xiao Li Mei, but I didn't want to ruin my relationship with Uncle Yu either. He just laughed heartily, saying finding a woman in these times was already a good thing, one couldn't ask for too much. I playfully suggested that with his health and strength, he could have plenty of women interested in him, even suggesting Sally May could have a child for him. Uncle Yu looked awkward at my words, knowing men usually cared about their own bloodline. But that was something to think about in the future, after all, it's the end of the world, and we can hardly find enough to eat, let alone have time for children. As for other people's family matters, it wasn't my place to comment, especially when I had my own problems to deal with. Meanwhile, a group from the Heavenly United Gang stealthily entered the first floor lobby under the cover of darkness. This time, Wan Tanfang's nephew, Huang Wei, led the group, bringing eight people with him. As they reached the stairs, a brick came flying towards him. Luckily, he reacted fast and dodged it. But then, a series of knocks echoed through the stairwell, enemy attack. Enemy attack. Those jerks from the Heavenly United Gang were back. Hearing this, Wang Wei was furious. Brothers, charge with me. Let's take down these cowards, he exclaimed, leading the charge towards the stairwell. Little did he know, my reward policy had the neighbors on duty pumped up like they'd been injected with adrenaline. In no time, they had already taken down several members of the Heavenly United Gang. Seeing how fierce they were, Huang Wei quickly ordered the rest of his people to retreat. Watching the gang members scatter, the neighbors decided not to pursue them. The snowstorm outside made it too risky, and they didn't want to be ambushed. The knocking sounds in the stairwell woke me up from my sleep. These guys sure know how to pick their moments. Suddenly, a thought popped into my head, I finally have a chance to practice my shooting skills. They say a gun is fast within a hundred steps. I grabbed my trusty sniper rifle from my pocket. Not today, fellas, I muttered to myself as I set up the rifle and aimed at one of the fleeing gang members. Thanks to the 8x scope, I could even see the hairs in the guy's nostrils. As I pulled the trigger with my index finger, a loud gunshot broke the silence of the night, and the bullet struck the escaping thug dead on. I couldn't help but feel a rush of satisfaction. Could I really be a natural-born marksman? The remaining members of the Heavenly United Gang looked horrified as they saw their companion fall to the ground in a pool of blood. Panic set in, and they sprinted back towards their own compound as if their lives depended on it. Watching them flee, I couldn't help but grin. I quickly set up the sniper rifle again, but then something strange happened. It felt like time slowed down as I looked through the scope. Without hesitation, I took another shot, hitting another goon in the head as he fled. 
it dawned on me that my awakened abilities might extend beyond the pocket dimension. Could I also have the talent of a marksman? To test this theory, I fired five consecutive shots, each one hitting its target with deadly accuracy. A smile crept onto my face. With this marksman's talent, all I'd need in the future is to find a good sniping spot to deal with intruders. My exceptional marksmanship also surprised everyone in the building, putting an end to any petty ideas the neighbors might have had. The next morning, Dr. Joe prepared me a bowl of noodles. With a nervous expression, she asked if I had fired the gun last night. I smiled in response. The reckless Heavenly United gang had attempted another sneak attack, so I had to take action. Hearing this, Dr. Joe looked at me with admiration. She had initially sought my protection for survival, but now she seemed captivated by my charm. Outwardly, I remained calm, but inside, I felt thrilled. How had I gone from being a nobody in my past life to being seen as a godlike figure by beautiful women? It was a complete turnaround. Meanwhile, the members of the Heavenly United Gang stood silently as they looked at the bodies in the snow. Their repeated attempts to raid us had failed, resulting in the loss of their own men, including Huang Tianfang's nephew. Initially, they had relied on brute force to intimidate others, but now they realized the power I wielded. They had nothing to counter it. Moreover, facing food scarcity, they knew they would soon starve if they couldn't obtain any provisions. In response to their situation, Wang Tianfan made a tough decision. He ordered his men to retrieve the bodies of Huang Wei and the others, hoping to prolong their survival by any means necessary. Meanwhile, I continued my usual duty of patrolling the building and checking on the neighbors. After the events of last night, their attitude towards me had transformed into genuine awe. They understood that under my leadership, our chances of survival were greatly improved. In this post-apocalyptic world, I recently rode my beloved snowmobile and left the community. Uncle had provided me with the location of a nearby army camp after I asked him to take good care of the people in the base. Heading towards the army camp's location, this scene was witnessed by Wolfgang from Building 21. They were puzzled about where I had hidden the snowmobile because they had previously searched the entire underground garage but found nothing. If they had a snowmobile, they could freely go on shopping sprees in various malls, gather more supplies, expand their territory, and recruit more people, becoming local warlords in this apocalyptic world. On the side, Shaolu nodded in agreement. In troubled times, heroes emerge. Now is the perfect time for us brothers to take the throne. Thinking of this, Wang Chun's eyes were bloodshot. We must get our hands on that snowmobile. Meanwhile, I rode my snowmobile, galloping through the snow. Before going to the army camp, I decided to first scavenge materials around the city. Heavy snow had been falling for three months now, and some small shops were already buried. To get supplies, I could only look for a few independent large supermarkets in the city. Then, I remembered the Walmart South warehouse where I used to work. Though the largest warehouse had been emptied by me before the apocalypse, there were still several smaller ones nearby which were sure to have useful supplies. I drove to Walmart South warehouse, where products from various groups in Heavenly Sea City were stocked. If I could bring all these supplies back, they'd be enough for thousands of people. But when I broke the skylight, I found most of the supplies were already gone before the snow disaster. Still, I climbed down to check for anything left. Luckily, I found several heavy-duty trucks and some luxury sports cars, though they seemed useless for now. Who knows, they might come in handy later for showing off. After scavenging some useful supplies from other warehouses, I headed to the gas station. I definitely needed fuel for the snowmobile, my main mode of transportation. To my surprise, the gas station was buried under snow, with only a signpost visible. This was a problem. If only I had an excavator. Wait, didn't I put a few excavators into my alternate space earlier? I immediately retrieved one. Since the snow hadn't frozen solid yet, digging out the gas station would be easy. Fortunately, I had experience driving forklifts in the warehouse, so operating the excavator wasn't an issue. I started digging towards the gas station without hesitation. After digging for two hours, I heard a clear metallic clang from the shovel, and the gas station's large roof platform gradually began to appear. Next, I went inside the gas station to find the fuel storage. Usually, fuel storage for gas stations is underground. I found the basement door and pried it open with a crowbar. Before entering, I quickly removed any static electricity from my body to prevent accidents. Soon, several large fuel tanks appeared before me. With these fuel reserves, I could travel through the snow again in the future. I then dismantled the hose on top of the fuel tanks and used plastic wrap to seal the openings to prevent gasoline leakage. Just as I was about to put the entire fuel tank into my alternate space, I suddenly realized something very important. Under these layers of snow, almost everyone was practically immobile, but not me. In addition to freely traversing the snowy landscape, 
I also had several excavators with me. That meant all the resources buried under the heavy snow were essentially at my disposal. After storing the gas station's fuel into my alternate space, it was already 8 o'clock in the evening. So, I decided to rest here for the night and visit the army camp that uncle had mentioned during the day. Meanwhile back in the residential area a Xiao Li Mei's child had a high fever. When the temperature reached 40 degrees Celsius, Xiao Li Mei felt helpless because her medicine box was empty of emergency medications. Then, Uncle Yu arrived with a box of children's fever medicine that Zhang Yi had provided before. There was a little left, so we used it for the child. He patted the shoulder of the neighbor and reassured her, saying, Don't worry. When Zhang Yi comes back this time, I'm sure life will get better for everyone. With Uncle Yu's fever medicine, the child's high fever finally subsided. However, Dr. Zhou reminded the mother to keep a close eye on her baby's condition, especially since infants are highly susceptible to illness in extreme cold weather. After giving her advice, Dr. Zhou and Uncle Yu began their routine patrol. They had barely taken a few steps when they heard a woman scream from behind them. Auntie Lin from the neighborhood committee was seen lunging at the child in the mother's arms with a small knife, shouting, My grandson is dead. Your children shouldn't be allowed to live either. Out of maternal instinct, the mother immediately turned to block the knife. Seeing this, Dr. Joe quickly caught the baby, who had slipped from the mother's arms. The mother, entrusting her child to Dr. Joe, collapsed in a pool of blood. At that moment, Annie Lin pointed at Dr. Joe and shouted, blaming her and everyone else for the death of her child. It was clear she was completely distraught. Dr. Joe realized there was no reasoning with her, so she swiftly made her way toward the stairwell, clutching the child tightly. But Annie Lin grabbed her ankle, brandishing a knife, accusing Dr. Joe of deserving death for not saving her child. Just as Annie Lin was about to strike, Uncle intervened, kicking her to the ground. He got nicked by the knife, but seeing Dr. Joe unharmed, he felt relieved. Auntie Lin continued her tirade, blaming others and even biting people nearby. Uncle became furious, defending Zhang Yi for his actions. Dr. Joe stepped forward, explaining that Zhang Yi did try to help by sending medicine, but it was too late. Your precious grandson had already been turned into a pot of rice porridge by you upon hearing these words Annie Lin fell into another frenzy shouting it's impossible it was unbelievable. Two neighbors stepped up to mock Annie Lin. It's like we finally understand the true meaning of loving someone too much, even to the point of harming them. She always boasted about adoring her grandson, but this was the ugly truth of her love. Despite her countless wrongdoings, they dared to show such cruelty. One of them even flicked on a lighter, offering a bit of warmth to Annie Lin before her demise. Meanwhile, as I stepped out of the tent, it was time to make my way to the army camp. Following the directions of the retired soldier uncle, I hopped onto my snowmobile and zoomed off to the nearby military base. With the experience from digging out the gas station last time, I smoothly got to work. Before long, I had uncovered the entrance to the camp's dormitories. What puzzled me was the eerie emptiness of the camp. Considering the sudden snow disaster and the remote location, plus the lack of transportation, it didn't make sense for the military to evacuate so quickly. A chilling thought crossed my mind, did they know about the disaster beforehand and evacuate in advance? If that were true, whoever had those supplies and weapons after the disaster could establish dominance in this new world order. It painted a grim picture of various factions fighting for control in a post-apocalyptic battleground. I figure I better gear up for what's coming in this new era. With that in mind, I keep working the excavator, digging away with gusto. Suddenly, there's this huge noise as I create a massive hole in the wall of the weapons arsenal. But when I peek inside, I'm stunned. There's a dazzling array of military supplies in there. I expected to find just a few odds and ends, but it turns out to be a jackpot. Sure, there are no tanks or heavy armored vehicles, but I figure the military must have taken those out on a mission. No biggie, I've got plenty for now. If I need more firepower later, I can always scavenge at another camp. After stashing all the supplies in my pocket dimension, I hop on my snowmobile and head home. But when I get back, the neighbors notice I'm empty-handed and start accusing me. Zhang Yi, you've been gone for two days and couldn't find any food? Did you keep it all for yourself? They say. I can't help but laugh at their audacity. Seriously? Just two days and you're already acting like this? Don't forget who saved you ungrateful folks in the first place. From now on, we're each on our own. You can find your own food. One of the neighbors steps forward to try and smooth things over, but I'm not buying it. It's tough finding food in the snow. I suggest heading back to rest for now. Inside building 25, resentment filled the air when everyone learned I hadn't brought back any food. They felt they'd already done enough defending the building for me, and my lack of gratitude didn't sit well with them. A person in a red hat stepped forward, seemingly sincere, 
suggesting I bring others with me next time to search for food, emphasizing the strength in numbers. But I sensed something off about him, especially with the small knife hidden behind his back. Two other neighbors stepped forward to support him, offering their help. But I knew their intentions weren't pure. Without hesitation, I pulled out a gun from my pocket and shot the guy in the red hat in the head. I wasn't fooled by their fake kindness. I've been too lenient with them, and they've forgotten how to survive without me. They would have been food for chinching how long ago if it weren't for me. The gang heard this, and a few neighbors quickly tried to explain themselves. Zhang Yi, don't go too far. We just wanted to talk, they said, but before they could finish, I fired off several more shots in an instant. The two leading the conversation were taken care of, and seeing this, the rest scattered in all directions, fleeing for their lives. The gunshots quickly caught the attention of Uncle Yu and two others, and Dr. Zhou rushed over, her face filled with concern, asking if I was hurt. I reassured her, squeezing her hand, those guys couldn't hurt me. Uncle Yu, upon learning the reason, was furious. These fools deserve to pay. A few free meals and they forget who they depend on, he said angrily. I just smiled. I've always been kind, I couldn't be bothered to chase after those who fled. Hearing this, Xiao Li Mei felt a shiver down her spine, knowing I did it as a warning to others. Then, I started planning for the future. Relying solely on these expendables wouldn't keep the building secure forever. Back at the safe house, I asked Dr. Zhou if anything had happened during the two days I was away. She reported that Annie Lin had gone mad after her grandson's death and had killed a neighbor who lived upstairs. However, she was taken care of by two other neighbors. Additionally, someone from Building 9 named Chen Lingyu wanted to discuss something with me. However, the details of the cooperation would need to be handled by me personally. I wasn't impressed. I had supplies and weapons, so what could this woman offer to make me want to cooperate with her? I decided to ask Dr. Zhou about her identity. From her, I learned that Xin Lingu used to own a cosmetics company in Heavenly Sea City before the apocalypse. Now, with her strong methods, she's completely taken control of Building 9. I was surprised to hear this. Xin Lingu must have some real skills to manage an entire building. Dr. Zhou noticed my interest and suggested I at least find out what Xin Lingu wants to cooperate on. She was curious about how a woman managed to get an entire building to fall in line. Just then, I received two friend requests on my phone. Along with Chen Ling, there was also one from my company's previous financial director, Li Jin. I wondered what this guy wanted. As soon as I accepted the friend requests, Chen Ling messaged me right away, asking if we could chat. I got straight to the point, telling her to say what she had to say. She replied that typing was inconvenient for her and wanted to have a voice chat instead. I promptly refused. Seeing this, she didn't take it lightly. Initially, she wanted to use her pre-apocalypse persuasion techniques to win me over, but I didn't give her the chance. Plus, since we live in the same complex, she knows what I'm capable of and had to resort to texting. She wrote, Mr. Zhang, I've heard about your reputation. I know you have a snowmobile and can scavenge for supplies. So, I propose we work together to gather resources. I couldn't help but grin. If we team up, what's in it for me? I asked. She replied that her building had many survivors and could provide manpower to help expand territories. But the catch was, I had to provide food for them first. Before I could respond, she added, Mr. Zhang, you're a target for everyone. Building 25 has already been attacked, and the masses are weighing their options. But if you provide us with food, you'll be safe from our Building 9, I chuckled. Are you threatening me? I asked. She smirked and said, cooperating with us would be beneficial for both of us. I couldn't help but find her boldness amusing. Let me think about it for a few days, I said with a smile. I gaze out the window, lost in thought. Would the whole community turn against me? I'm not afraid to face them one by one, but if they unite, like Chin Ling suggested, they could easily tear down the entire building. Even though we lack the electricity and machinery outside for such destruction, things could get messy if experts and explosives are brought in. Just as I'm pondering my next move, a new message pops up on my phone. It's from my former colleague, Li Jin, who goes on and on about cooperating to build a harmonious post-apocalyptic utopia. He mentions the good vibes in Building 18 but points out the lack of food resources. I smile at the smooth talk, intellectuals really know how to butter you up. Curious about the situation in Building 18, I ask Dr. Zhou for her input. She confirms Li Jin's capabilities, praising his ability to unite the residents and distribute resources fairly, which helped most of them survive after the apocalypse. I chuckled, realizing that their unity was just a facade, based solely on the fact that they still had food. Once that ran out, who knew what would happen? Glancing at the friend requests from building owners on my phone, all seeking cooperation, I knew I had two choices, go to war or cooperate. Turning to Dr. Joe, 
I asked if there was a way to have the best of both worlds. She suggested leaving the community and starting fresh elsewhere, leaving me speechless. It seemed like an impossible task, unless we became hermits in some remote place with no people. The next morning, I had Dr. Joe dismantle the bulletproof vest to fashion makeshift bulletproof pants. After a night of contemplation, I knew what to do next. I tagged everyone in the community group chat, informing them of the crisis facing Building 25. Nearby buildings were jealous that I could find food and were threatening to attack unless I handed over the food and snowmobile. The chat exploded with outrage, how could they expect us to give up our only means of survival? I reassured everyone that we had to defend our food supply at all costs. Despite feeling relieved, I couldn't shake the worry that they might turn on me later. Just then, I received a message on my phone from Chin Ling, adding me to a discussion group for community building owners. It seems like they're gearing up to confront me. Wang Chong from Building 21 jumped in sarcastically, saying, Zhang Yi, I've heard you've been living the good life lately, always having food to eat. You're comfortable, but you're not thinking about us, you're poor neighbors. Huang Tan Fong from Building 26 also made a direct threat, warning that if I abandon the negotiations now, they couldn't guarantee what would happen. Only Lycan from Building 18 acted as a mediator. Then Li Jin laid out the conditions for negotiation. First, I must provide supplies to ensure basic survival. Second, my snowmobile must become communal, allowing everyone to take turns using it. Finally, I must share all known resource locations with everyone. If I didn't accept, I'd become the enemy of the entire community. Seeing this, I chuckled. These guys could just rob me, but they're pretending it's negotiation. Looks like I need a strategic opportunity to deal with all of them at once. But they're thousands in number, so it would be quite difficult to act. Just then, an idea occurred to me. Handling thousands of people might be tough, but dealing with a few building owners should be much more manageable. So, I pretended to discuss negotiation locations with them and began to arm myself. They have no accurate assessment of my firepower. Once they arrive at the agreed location, a single grenade from me will either kill or severely injure them. Then, the thousands of residents will be like a dragon without a head, easily defeated. Meanwhile, in the hallway, Uncle Yu was distributing food to neighbors to replenish their strength. Because the negotiation time was approaching, everyone needed to be well-fed to defend building 25 neighbors. People who hadn't eaten in days were deeply moved to tears when they saw me. My presence caused quite a stir among everyone. I reassured them that if the negotiation went well, we could finally return to normal life without any more bloodshed. Everyone needed to be at their best today, defending their positions. Hearing this, tears welled up in everyone's eyes, and they pledged their loyalty to me even in the next life. Leading everyone to the agreed negotiation spot, I mingled among the crowd, ready to strike when the time was right. As parties from different buildings gathered in the community square, I was surprised by the opposing side's overwhelming numbers. It seemed like they were trying to pressure us. Immediately, I called Uncle Yu and asked him to meet them with a team while I stayed back to provide firepower. Setting up a sniper rifle, I took on the role of a sniper. As Uncle Yu and the others were surrounded by people from various sides, I could see the tension rising. Uncle Yu realized that they weren't here to negotiate but to eliminate us. A nervous neighbor voiced concern about the outnumbered situation, but Uncle Yu assured him that their main goal was to pressure me into negotiating. We don't have anything they want. The building owner smirked at the front of the crowd, thinking the negotiation was in the bag. Chin Ling seemed pleased too. Zhang Yi might be intimidating alone, but with thousands of us, what's there to fear? On our way to the negotiation, these building owners had already agreed not to give me a chance to isolate any of them. At this point, Wang Chong chuckled, saying, See? We can scare Zhang Yi just with our sheer numbers. He's probably gone back to change his diapers by now. Chin Ling grew impatient, saying, Enough with the nonsense. Let's get Zhang Yi out here to negotiate. Once he accepts the predetermined conditions, it's over. Hearing this, Wang Tian Fong stepped forward and shouted, Where's Zhang Yi? Get him out here to negotiate now. If he makes us wait any longer, he's going to regret it. Uncle Yu looked at the group and said, Our boss is waiting for you upstairs. Weren't all the building owners supposed to come for the negotiation? Li Jian adjusted his glasses. We've discussed it. The five of us building owners will represent everyone. Hearing this, Uncle Yu didn't say much more. Fine, but only the five of you building owners are allowed in, and you must also consent to a search. Chin Ling and Wang Chan burst into laughter. What does Zhang Yi think he is, making conditions at this time? Do you believe we can wipe all of you out right now? Seeing them act so arrogantly, how could I tolerate it? I immediately called Uncle Yu and told him to have everyone retreat 20 meters. Although he didn't know what I was planning Uncle Yu complied as I directed, allowing everyone to move back. Seeing this, Wang Chong threatened us, 
warning against any tricks. Despite being separated by more than 20 meters, Wang Chong and his group felt confident in their overwhelming numbers. However, the unexpected occurred when I blew a whistle from behind Uncle Yu. I tossed a hand grenade toward Wang Chong and his crew, causing chaos as it exploded in their midst. When the smoke cleared, a large hole remained, along with several bodies. As Uncle Yu approached with a phone emitting my voice, I taunted Wang Chong's group, revealing that I had more grenades at my disposal. This revelation left everyone frozen in shock, unable to comprehend where I obtained such weaponry. Wang Chong attempted to negotiate through the phone, but I mocked their insincerity in bringing over a thousand people for negotiations. With less than five minutes remaining, Zhang Yi issued an ultimatum, meet us or face the consequences. Panicked, everyone realized they wouldn't stand a chance in a fight and hastily fled the scene. From the 13th floor, I watched the dispersing crowd below, satisfied with the outcome. Well, I've only got 20 boxes of grenades left, so I better save them for later. I waited leisurely for Wang Chong, Huang Tianfang, and the others to arrive. A few minutes later, several people ran up, panting heavily. I looked at the people in front of me somewhat disappointed. I had initially wanted to gather all the building owners together for a comprehensive sweep, but now I had only five representatives. I'd have to implement my second plan. After everyone was seated, Li Qin brought up the previously discussed proposal, asking me to provide materials for their labor force while they provided the labor. Otherwise, all the workers would unite to attack my apartment building. Uninterested in further discussion, I simply pulled out a handgun and slapped it on the table with a loud bang. All five faces changed color, and they subconsciously thought of running away. Wang Chong stuttered, Zhang Yi, what do you mean by this? Even if you kill us, the whole community will not let you go. I smiled faintly. Why are you guys so nervous? I just felt that this handgun was in the way, so I took it out to let it air. Everyone relax, let's sit down and continue the talk. First of all, your demand is something I can't agree to. Taking responsibility for the supplies of the entire community is an impossible task for anyone. Most importantly, if you've been able to control the residents of a building in these hard times, you're clearly smart people. As far as I know, you're not so charitable as to go hungry yourselves while caring about your neighbors, are you? With that, I slapped the table. Here are my terms for cooperation. If you don't accept them, then we go to war. He raised an eyebrow and continued, I can provide food, but here's the catch, only enough for 10 people per building. Who gets this food and how it's divided is up to you and should be settled within your own building. Zhang Yi made a helpless gesture. Supplying food for around 300 people daily is already the maximum I can manage. As soon as he finished speaking, Qin Ling looked furious. Unacceptable. Are you treating us like beggars? Ten portions of supplies are too few. I have 76 survivors alone, and among my company employees, there are over 20. How are we supposed to divide that? Seeing this, I slammed my gun on the table. It seems there's no room for negotiation. Then let the war begin. Upon hearing this, Wang Tan Fong quickly stepped forward. Don't listen to this woman's nonsense. She doesn't represent all of us. However, providing for only 10 people per building really isn't enough to go around. Wang Kin on the side also agreed. This amount of supplies is not enough. To explain to other building owners, can we add a little more? But I just loaded my gun. Do you really think I'm a saint? Providing food for 300 people daily, and you still complain? Seeing this, Li Chan quickly approached and said, Zhang Yi, don't be impulsive. Let's think about it. I casually propped my foot up on the table, ready to discuss the real deal. All right, let's talk about what we need to do for sustainable development. Just scavenging for supplies won't cut it forever. Who knows how long this snowfall will last. I tossed a bag of seeds onto the table. These are seeds I found outside. I reckon we should start planting crops. That's the only way we'll have a steady food supply. Chin Ling and the gang looked at me like I'd lost my marbles. Are you crazy, Zhang Yi? It's minus 80 degrees out there, and the snow's meters thick. How can anything grow in that? I just grinned. Can't you dig through the frost? There's plenty of land outside. We gotta start farming if we want to develop sustainably. Who knows how long this snow's gonna stick around. Even if I gave you a thousand snowmobiles, our outside supplies would eventually dry up. So why not start now and learn from our ancestors, eh? Get our hands dirty to put food on the table. At the mention of tangible progress in farming, Wang Chong and Huang Tianfang perked up. Brother Zhang, can you get us cigarettes too? They were both heavy smokers, and they hadn't had a puff since the snow disaster hit. I pulled out a fresh pack from my pocket, offering it to them. Their faces lit up with pure joy as they eagerly took a smoke. They were willing to agree to anything as long as they got their daily fix. Seeing their excitement, Legion wanted to steer the conversation back to the main issue, 
but I cut him off. No worries, I can hook you both up with a pack every day. I happily came to an agreement with Wang Chong and Huang Tianfan. Seeing them easily swayed, Li Yin and his crew couldn't hide their frustration. They were about to mess everything up. Li Yin tried to negotiate for more, but Wang Chong shut him down before he could even start. There's nothing to negotiate. Sean's offer is already generous. Let's go along with it, Wang Tianfang added. This left Li Yin speechless. Sometimes, it's not the formidable opponents you should worry about, but the stubborn teammates. Just then, the building owner, Zhang Yunyan, spoke up, reminding us that the decision wasn't solely ours. We needed to consult the other building owners who weren't present. Wang Chong and Huang Tianfan once again proved their incompetence, questioning the decision we had already made. Ignoring their bickering, I glanced out the window and spotted a group gathering at the entrance of Building 25, where I was. I immediately drew my pistol and shouted, demanding to know why they were there. Did Wang Chong arrange for them to ambush us during the negotiation? Wang Chong quickly raised his hands in surrender, insisting that all the building owners were present. Who would dare to ambush us with everyone here? Started organizing an attack on their own. Seeing this, I pointed my gun at them threateningly, commanding them to sit down and stay still. Just then, Uncle Yu arrived with a group of men in the negotiation room. Following my instructions, they temporarily restrained the five of them. I then went to the balcony with my heavy gun, thinking what fools they were for not valuing their lives. Without another word, I took aim at the man leading the charge. Being a sniper, I took two out with a single shot, instantly blasting the heads of two lackeys. Seeing this, the group panicked and became disarrayed. Zhang Yi has a sniper rifle. Everyone, take cover, they shouted in fear. I couldn't help but smile at their fear, it only made me more excited. Then, I fired several more shots, taking out a few more lackeys. The five in the negotiation room dared not even breathe. After wiping the smoking barrel of my gun, I turned to them and asked, Do any of you have any objections now? Hearing this, Wang Chung and Wan Tinfong were the first to raise their hands, signaling they had no objections. Xinling, Yu, and Zhang Yi Union followed suit, agreeing to my terms. Seeing this, Li Jian couldn't say much and reluctantly raised his hand in agreement. I smiled and said, Good. If everyone had been this reasonable from the start, it would have been better, right? Why force me to act? Peace is more profitable. With that, I patted Jin on the shoulder. Go back and do as I told you, no tricks. With the negotiations concluded amicably, Li Jian and the others left Building 25. As my neighbors expressed concern for my well-being, I greeted them with a smile and reassured them that everything was sorted out. Their praise followed, but I couldn't help but think they deserved a wake-up call to recognize my capabilities. I then went on to explain the negotiation details, which left them uneasy at the thought of providing so much food. With a calm demeanor, I reminded them of the daunting odds we faced if we didn't comply. Despite their worries, I assured them that as long as I, Zhang Yi, was alive, no one would go hungry. Moved by my words, they tearfully pledged their loyalty. However, Uncle Yu seemed puzzled, questioning the practicality of playing the hero in a post-apocalyptic world. I assured him it was only a temporary arrangement. Later, I confided in Uncle Yu about my original plan, to lure their leaders and eliminate them, weakening their forces. However, their decision to send only five representatives forced us to adjust our strategy and play the long game. Now, as I promised to provide food for 300 of their people daily, it's inevitable that this will lead to unequal food distribution among them. Once internal conflicts arise, they'll turn on each other. At that point, we can simply sit back and reap the benefits. Hearing this, Uncle had a moment of realization. It's always you, Zhang Yi, thinking steps ahead. If it were me, I would have probably gone head to head with them already. I gazed out of the window at the fallen bodies inside. Right now, I'm just using the ample resources in my hands to wear down these adversaries. We don't know what the outside world is like now, but there will certainly be other, more threatening groups. If we want to truly establish ourselves in this post-apocalyptic world, we need ample firepower and a strong fortress. Hearing this, Uncle seemed deep in thought. You're right, Zhang Yi. It's only the beginning of the end. Who knows what challenges lie ahead. Uncle Yu, standing beside me, chuckled and said, Are you asking them to plant corn in this cold weather, Zhang Yi? Are you messing with them? I just smiled and replied, I'm just draining their energy. Most people nowadays are starving and can hardly get enough food. Even if they wanted to resist in the future, they wouldn't have the strength to do so. I looked at Uncle Yu seriously and said, No one else should know about our conversation today. We'll stick to the plan. We not only need to watch out for outsiders but also be cautious of insiders betraying us in this building. Uncle Yu nodded in agreement and assured me, Don't worry, Zhang Yi. 
I'll follow your lead. My family and I depend on you. After our discussion, I returned to my safe house. Dr. Joe was doing yoga in the bedroom, and her face lit up when she saw me. Is everything okay? How did the negotiations go? She asked. Without saying a word, I reassured her, nothing serious. Just had to use a few tactics, and they conceded. It might be a bit unsafe outside for a while, so just stay home. Give it some time, and these annoying folks will be gone for good. Hearing this, Dr. Joe took on a concerned expression and reminded me to be careful too. The next morning, a large group of homeowners gathered in front of Unit 25, desperate for a meal. They put all their energy into farming while my two teammates supervised their work. Just as I walked out from the building's entrance, Wan Chong and Wan Tin Fong looked excited. Hey, Zhang Yi, are you going out to scavenge? Why not take us along? We're just hanging around here anyway, they said eagerly. I flashed them a smile. My snowmobile can't fit that many people. It's better to use the space for more supplies. You two just stay put, and I'll be back soon, I replied. Then, I turned to the workers and added, make sure you're putting in the effort. I'll be checking on your progress when I get back. If it's not up to scratch, there won't be any food. With that, I set off. But as I left, I overheard Wan Chong and Huang Tinfong whispering to each other. They were scheming to get their hands on my vehicle. My first stop wasn't to search for food, but rather to swing by the Tianhai City Pet Hospital. I rifled through the pharmacy and, within minutes, found a whole box of rat poison. Normally used to put down sick pets, this poison, when diluted, is colorless and tasteless. It was perfect for giving those shameless folks a little vitamin boost. If I wasn't worried about them causing chaos, I wouldn't even bother providing food for three, let alone 300. Everyone should fend for themselves in this post-apocalyptic world. Why should I play the saint? This was the perfect opportunity to send them off. I still need to keep up appearances for the sake of the community, so I went out to scavenge for supplies in the city. When I returned with bags full of provisions, my neighbors were shocked. Zhang Yi, where did you find all these supplies? They asked. I just grinned and replied, with the snow piling up outside, it's getting tougher to find what we need. I guess I got lucky this time, but who knows about next time. Then, I used my phone to let the other unit owners know they could come and collect their share of today's food. Surprisingly, they were all more cautious now, sending only one representative each. It was clear they were afraid I might do something drastic. After that, I distributed the food, starting with the first unit's representative. Once everything was handed out, I smiled and said, we're all part of the same community here. Let's not be strangers. From now on, let's work together towards a better future. Of course, I said this to lower their guard, and as expected, everyone became emotional. Zhang Yi is right. As long as we work together, we can get through this, I stated, clapping my hands to interrupt their cheers. Now that the food has been distributed, everyone can go back, eat well, and prepare to farm diligently tomorrow, I announced. Upon hearing this, the neighbors left joyfully. However, I watched their retreating figures and chuckled coldly. In a little while, these troublemakers will be gone for good, I thought to myself. I then returned to my safe house, instructed that to prepare dinner, and headed to the bathroom for a relaxing hot shower. After getting rid of these problematic individuals, I'll need to find a safer place to start anew. Each representative, after collecting their food, immediately returned to their respective buildings. Seeing his underling return with food, Wan Chong instantly became ecstatic. Ignoring the questions from his subordinate, he eagerly searched through the food. Soon, Wang Chun found a brand new, unopened pack of cigarettes. Yo, Zhang Yi truly keeps his word, Wang Chun exclaimed, causing the younger gang members behind him to become restless. Brother Chan, give us one too. We can't take it anymore, we're suffocating, they pleaded. Seeing the situation, Wan Chong reluctantly handed out a cigarette to each of his underlings, tears welling up in his eyes as he watched them joyously smoke. Wan Chong felt compelled to distribute the cigarettes, fearing it would jeopardize his leadership position if he didn't. He then gathered the food and called for all the brothers to come and distribute it. A group of underlings was already eating in the living room, which eased Wen Chong's worries, he thought Zhang Yi hadn't poisoned the food. Living off others while doing nothing seemed like a decent life to them, all they had to do was let the deceived homeowners keep working. Meanwhile, the homeowners, believing in the promised food distribution, worked enthusiastically. However, after a day's work, they received nothing. Arguments erupted in every building in the community, they said we'd get food if we worked. Why do we have nothing after a whole day's labor? The unit owners retorted, you slack off all day and then expect food? Where does that happen? The constant quarreling throughout the community woke me from my sleep, but this scene was exactly what I wanted to witness. Once they settled their internal disputes, it would be time for me to take action. After breakfast, I left early. 
First, I found Uncle Yu and warned him about the impending riots due to uneven food distribution. I urged them to be careful. Then, I rode my snowmobile to search for supplies, aiming to intensify their internal conflicts. Unfortunately, I brought back even less food than before. With a smile, I said, supplies are getting harder to find outside. Please make do with what we have today. I'll try to find more tomorrow. As I predicted, riots broke out in the entire community that night. Desperate for a meal, some homeowners turned against their longtime neighbors, resorting to violence. Shockingly, some even pushed others off high-rise buildings to alleviate the pressure of food distribution. The neighbors who didn't get food had completely lost their minds. The community had become more chaotic than ever, with the cries of fighting and killing echoing everywhere. Yet, I was at home, leisurely listening to classical music, wondering how many would die that night. The next morning, I walked out of the building with Uncle Yu and a few others. Though mentally prepared, the scene still took my breath away. Hundreds of bodies were strewn haphazardly around the community, and the surrounding buildings were stained with blackened, congealed blood. It was clear how intense the riot had been the night before. The expressions of agony on their faces suggested many were forced to jump from tall buildings, only to freeze to death in the cold night. Uncle Yu approached me and asked, do we still need to work today? I smiled, why wouldn't we? I pointed to a corpse nearby. Did you really think of me as a saint? I'm not obliged to support you all. If you want food, you have to work for it. I gestured at the bodies on the ground. Of course, if you end up like this, you won't have to work anymore. Hearing this, the group looked shocked. Compared to those who had died, they felt incredibly lucky. At least they didn't have to fight others for a bite to eat. Thinking this, they immediately turned around, indicating their readiness to work. Uncle Yu, looking at the bodies scattered around, asked, do we need to call out people from other buildings to work? I just smiled. They probably don't have the time for that now. This riot is just the beginning. Unless the building owners can perfectly solve the food distribution issue, one side will eventually perish. All we have to do now is wait for their internal depletion. Later, I messaged the building owners negotiation group, stating that if I didn't see people from all the buildings working the next day, I couldn't guarantee food and cigarettes. Indeed, after making that stern declaration, the community was bustling again early in the morning. A large number of people began to cultivate and farm. However, compared to previous days, the number of workers had decreased by a third. Seeing this, Uncle Yu looked puzzled. They know they might not get any food. Why are they working so hard? I glanced at two men who were moving bodies and smiled. Aren't they addressing the food issue right now? Besides, people are always driven by their interests. Working gives them hope for survival, while rebelling is uncertain. I was about to leave to search for supplies when Lingling Ling stopped me. Zhang Yi, wait. I want to discuss a potential collaboration. Lingling Ling knew that if things continued in this manner, the community would eventually collapse. She approached me with a proposal for continued cooperation, understanding that unless the food distribution issue was resolved, the casualties would only increase. She believed she could use scientific management methods to help me govern the community and even expand our territory, establishing a new kingdom in this post-apocalyptic world. However, I just laughed. This current situation is exactly what I wanted to see. And now you expect me to play the generous king and provide for these 2,000 people for nothing? I grabbed Ling Ling's shoulder. Before the apocalypse, you use this rhetoric to deceive many people into collaborating with you. By now, the grass on their graves must be really tall. Do you really think I'm dumb enough to be your next victim? I pushed Lingling Ling away. I'm not interested in any of your plans. Find someone else to play your emperor. Seeing that I wasn't falling for her proposal, Lingling Ling pleaded, Zhang Yi, please reconsider. I promise I'll be a good advisor. On the other hand, Li Chen was diligently leading his team to clear and cultivate the land. To my surprise, none of Legion's team had suffered any casualties so far. This guy surely had some skills. Seeing me, Legion exclaimed, Zhang Yi, what brings you here? I replied with a smile, I'm curious about how you manage your building. The other units have started fighting among themselves over food distribution. Legion didn't hide much and shared that he had informed everyone about the negotiation results from the start. No matter what happened later, the food would be distributed equally. I strongly disagreed with this approach. You think you're so clever, but if you continue this way, everyone will starve. With your capabilities, you could have chosen and protected the most useful people and abandoned the rest. You're always trying to be the saint, even in this post-apocalyptic world where you can't save everyone. It's your own fault, I didn't wait for his response and just left, feeling weighed down by the heavy burden. I knew the apocalypse tested human nature, but I struggled with my own moral dilemma. Wang Chong and Huang Tian Farm approached me. Bro, aren't you going out to find food today? Wang Chong asked eagerly. I smiled. Be patient. 
I'm about to head out, and we'll make sure to get some good cigarettes and liquor for you guys. The two brothers were visibly excited. We always knew you were loyal, Zhang Yi. You're our savior in this world. Our lives are in your hands now. I chuckled. Come on, from now on, we're all brothers in this post-apocalyptic world. I'll do my best to provide for everyone. As usual, I distributed food to the representatives of each building. But then, several building owners who had been hiding approached me. Brother Zhang Yi, you can't play favorites. Next time, could you also bring us some cigarettes? We won't trouble you. Just one pack a day will do, they said shamelessly. Faced with these shameless owners, I reluctantly agreed, promising to provide for them starting tomorrow. With my affirmative answer, the group left contentedly. However, two neighbors who witnessed the scene expressed their discontent. These guys are going too far. You already generously provide them with food, Zhang Yi, and now they want cigarettes too? If they're asking for cigarettes today, tomorrow they'll be demanding liquor, one of them remarked. I just smiled. They're right. I shouldn't play favorites. The two stood there stunned. They never expected someone as ruthless as me to be so amenable. But then, jealousy consumed them. They toiled 18 hours a day just to barely get by, so why did these building owners deserve cigarettes afterwards? I went back home, sinking into my couch, pondering my next moves. After the recent chaos that left over half of the community either dead or injured, I knew things couldn't continue like this. It was time to confront these people. The next day, I raided a supermarket for supplies, planning to give them a lavish last meal before sending them off. I laced all the food with rat poison, knowing even a small bite would be deadly. But despite my preparations, I felt uneasy. Despite providing food every day, it was never enough. Only the building owners asked for extras like cigarettes. Could they be plotting something too? But as I thought about my safe house and weapons, I felt a bit more confident. No scheme could beat overwhelming firepower. I returned to the community with heaps of supplies, only to find Uncle Yu and his group waiting. I notified the building representatives to collect their food, smirking internally at their unsuspecting fate. As I handed out the poisoned food, more than half of the building owners surprisingly showed up in person, enticed by cigarettes and liquor. But just as I was about to distribute the food, Wang Chong shouted and pulled out a gun, aiming it at me. Damn it, I'd let my guard down. But in the nick of time, Uncle Yu shielded me, taking three bullets. I rushed to grab Uncle Yu, who had fallen, and yelled at Wang Chong and the others, demanding to know what they thought they were doing. Just then, a spy hidden in Building 25 finally revealed himself, swinging a shovel at me. Reacting swiftly, I pulled out a submachine gun from my pocket and warned him that if he wanted to die, I'd be happy to oblige. I opened fire, hitting several in the front row, causing panic among the crowd behind. They shouted that I had a submachine gun, but I didn't hesitate, using my sharp shooting skills to take out almost everyone in the room. After emptying my submachine gun, I pulled out two handguns from my pocket, declaring that it was too late for them to run, they were all going to die. Despite pleas for another chance from Wang Chong and Huang Tianfang, I coldly silenced them with bullets. No emotion showed on my face as I methodically approached the last one standing, Chin Leng, who was utterly terrified. She begged for her life, claiming she had a family to take care of, but I knew there could be no mercy. Like an avalanche, once it starts, no snowflake is innocent. I couldn't leave any threats behind. Surveying the aftermath, I felt nothing. After my rebirth, I had grown accustomed to the cycle of life and death. If not for the arsenal I had prepared in an alternate space, I might have been the one lying on the ground. As I prepared to leave, a faint voice reached my ears, it was Uncle Yu. I hurried to his side in disbelief. How was he still alive after taking three bullets? I wondered. Quickly, I retrieved an adrenaline shot from my alternate space and injected it into his chest. I spotted two neighbors sneakily watching, so I yelled, what are you staring at? Help me. Startled by the commotion, they quickly responded, coming, coming. Following my instructions, they brought Uncle Yu to my home on a stretcher. Meanwhile, Sia Lime, known for her cunning ways, rushed over with a distressed look. Seeing Uncle Yu unconscious, she burst into tears, lamenting how he had played the hero and left them behind. Sheila, veins bulging with anger, snapped at her to stop mourning, insisting that Uncle Yu was not dead and she would do everything to save him. I assured them that Dr. Zhou, the chief doctor at the city hospital, would know what to do. Despite Sialim's tears, she continued to express her despair, mentioning her daughter's future and hoping I could take care of her. Confused by her premature arrangements, I questioned her, catching her off guard. She hastily explained that while she hoped for the best, it was wise to be prepared for the worst, though deep down, she saw Uncle Yu as her ticket to a comfortable life. When Uncle Yu was brought to my home, I suggested that Sialim and the others leave so Dr. Joe could perform surgery. 
However, Sia Lime, feigning concern, insisted she needed to stay by his side. Reluctantly, I agreed, knowing that despite the circumstances, Uncle Yu had saved my life and I couldn't drive away the woman he cared for. As warmth filled the house, Sia Lime shed tears of emotion, grateful for the comfort and fresh food. Anyone walking in would feel like staying forever. Soon enough, Selim made herself at home, heading straight to the kitchen for a cup of hot water. Dr. Joe and I exchanged speechless glances. She really thinks this is her place. Flush with excitement, Celine asked, Do you have any milk powder? I want to prepare a warm bottle for the baby. Infuriated by her audacity, I snapped, Don't you have your own milk? Are you seriously treating this place as your own, using Uncle Yu as a shield? Celine May retorted, The baby needs to eat. Old Yu adores the baby. Coldly, I responded, Cut the nonsense. Either help out or leave. Without another word, I headed to the generator room, storing everything inside my spatial dimension. Then, I retrieved a white foldable bed from the same dimension, converting the area into a makeshift operating room. Celine watched in astonishment. Damn, Zhang Yi, are you performing magic or what? Ignoring her, I turned to Dr. Zhou. Tell me whatever medicines and medical equipment you need. I'll provide whatever I can. We must save Uncle Yu, no matter what. Dr. Zhou, being the chief doctor at the city hospital, certainly knew her stuff. But first, she had to assess Uncle Yu's injuries. As she removed his shirt, her brow furrowed in concern. The bullet's location suggested potential internal organ damage. Given the current medical conditions, it seemed impossible to save Uncle Yu. Upon hearing the grim prognosis, Celine may put on a theatrical display of tears. If old Yu goes, how will my daughter and I survive? I pointed at her angrily. Stop with the theatrics. If your crying affects Uncle Yu's surgery, then you might as well go to hell and join him in mourning. Understand? At my words, Celine May wiped her tears. Then I should probably leave. My presence here is only adding to the chaos. Yet internally, she thought, it's much more comfortable outside with hot water and food. Why would I want to stay in here? However, I quickly blocked her path. Just a moment ago, you said you wouldn't leave Uncle Yu's side. And now you think you're a hindrance? Listen closely. You'll stay right here and assist where needed. Even if you're just watching, it'll be an encouragement for Uncle Yu. If you dare step out of this room, you'll face the consequences, I warned sternly before turning away and striding towards the first floor hall. There, a group of neighbors attempted to justify their non-involvement in the attempted murder, but I had no patience for their excuses. Some had betrayed us, leading to Uncle Yu's critical injuries. They would pay for their treachery, but our immediate priority was launching a counterattack. Those not participating would be deemed traitors and face consequences akin to the dead bodies outside. As I delivered this warning, expressions of unease spread across the neighbors' faces. The sheer number of residents in the complex was intimidating, making their small group seem insignificant in comparison. I pointed to the combat supplies and instructed them to guard the exits and monitor the surroundings. Anyone attempting to flee should be dealt with swiftly. I would personally handle those inside the building, ensuring they learn the consequences of crossing me. Our group arrived at the base of building number 21. Meanwhile, Wolfgang and his crew on the upper floors had noticed my leadership and were already trembling in fear. In this post-apocalyptic world, where most only possessed melee weapons, I could effortlessly wield a submachine gun. Despite this, there were still those bold enough to defy me, this building was their territory, after all. The dimly lit hallways made firearms less effective, so I instructed my men to watch all the exits to prevent anyone from escaping. Approaching building number 21 alone, I first reached the ground floor hall. After ensuring it was empty, I retrieved a large pile of wood and clothing from my alternate space, placing them in various corners of the hall. Pouring gasoline over everything, I connected all the materials with trails of gasoline. With a flick of my lighter, I remarked, given how cold it is outside, let's warm things up a bit for these fellows, before tossing the lighter onto the gasoline. Flames quickly spread throughout the ground floor, and I calmly exited the scene. Wolfgang's crew, waiting for me to ascend, soon realized something was amiss as the fire grew more intense. Cursing my name, they realized it was Zangi and his gang who had set the place on fire. They rushed to open the windows to avoid suffocation from the smoke, but they found them frozen shut by the extreme cold. Without tools, they couldn't break through. By then, I had calmly walked out of the ground floor hall. Pointing to the smoke-engulfed building behind me, I declared, the rest is up to you all. Be thorough and don't let a single one escape. Emotionlessly, I stared at the towering inferno. Under the force of hunger and desperation, these people would eventually turn their weapons towards me. They only had their incompetent leader to blame for provoking someone they shouldn't have. As the flames intensified, 
many couldn't endure the scorching heat and chose to leap from the balconies, crashing heavily into the snow below. Even if they weren't burned alive, the fall likely crippled them. With one leading the charge, more and more residents started jumping. Some from lower floors survived their falls, but little did they realize they had jumped from the frying pan into the fire. A woman from the crowd, who typically wouldn't even kill a chicken, wasted no time plunging her knife into the body of an old neighbor she used to spend her days with. Amidst the shock reactions, Leon only smiled and said, we all have to do what it takes to survive. I can't be left behind. As more people jumped from building 21, Leon hastily moved forward, eager to ensure no one else would claim her credit. Watching the raging fire, not a shred of pity crossed my heart. Wang Chan's building 21 was doomed. Every day, I provided them with food and cigarettes, and they plotted to kill me from the shadows. They shouldn't blame me for my merciless retaliation. In other buildings, many residents witnessed this horrifying spectacle. Their hearts raced with anxiety, fearing I might use the same method against them. Despite Wang Chan's prolonged plotting, his fate was riddled with bullet holes. However, many clung to the hope that they'd be spared since they hadn't participated in the assassination. They believed I had no reason to wipe them out. Having dealt with Building 21, I led my people towards Building 26, headed by Wan Tianfan. Seeing our approach, the residents of Building 26 frantically tried to distance themselves from the situation. This is all Wan Tianfang's doing, they exclaimed. We've got nothing to do with this, Zhang Yi, so please don't wrongly accuse the innocent. When I heard their pleas, I couldn't help but laugh. You claim this has nothing to do with you? I, for one, don't believe that. And you dare call yourselves good people? To have survived this long, each one of you must have taken a few lives. Without further ado, I repeated the process and gave Building 26 its own barbecue treatment. Soon, residents from other buildings grew restless, fearing I might go on a rampage and burn every structure in sight. However, to their surprise, I pulled out a megaphone from my pocket and addressed everyone. Listen up, everyone. There's no need to worry. While I, Zhang Yi, may not be a saint, I won't kill without reason. Anyone who treats me with friendliness will be spared. A wave of relief washed over the faces of many residents as they finally saw hope of survival. Yet, some remained skeptical. This had nothing to do with us in the first place. I don't believe he could possibly burn down the entire complex, they murmured. Ignoring their doubts, I instructed everyone to rest. But these neighbors refused to leave after enduring the cold for so many months, they weren't going to pass up a chance to warm themselves by the fire. Then, I approached the bodies of the two spies. It puzzled me, they had once been utterly loyal. What made them betray me? Rummaging through their belongings, I found their phones. Upon reviewing their chat history, realization dawned on me. So that's how it is. After dealing with the buildings involved in the assassination, I immediately returned to my safe house. The steady rhythm on the heart rate monitor indicated that Uncle Yu was out of danger. I smiled at Joe. It's no wonder you're the city's lead surgeon. Not everyone could have saved Uncle Yu like you did. As Dr. Joe and I chatted, Klima approached, holding her child. Zhang Yi, could you get something for me and my baby to eat? We've been hungry all day. It dawned on me that the surgery had taken over 10 hours. We should treat our great Dr. Joe here, I said, pulling out a pack of instant noodles from my pocket. Your uncle owes you a meal, so I won't let you go hungry. Then, I headed out for a meal with Dr. Joe, but Sialine persisted. Zhang Yi, do you have anything else to eat? I saw some eggs and chicken legs in the kitchen earlier. I was nearly boiling with frustration. This tricky girl always wanted more. If it weren't for Uncle Yu, I would have thrown her out without a second thought. It's the end of the world, I said bluntly, holding up the pack of noodles like it was pure gold. Eat it or leave it. After our meal, Dr. Joe and I returned to the bedroom. She noticed the tension in the air. Our house has another hassle, I tried to reassure her while massaging her tired muscles. Don't worry, she won't stay long. Then, I inquired about Uncle Yu's condition. Dr. Joe responded with a mysterious tone. By all logic, Uncle Yu shouldn't have survived with so much blood loss. But just as his heart rate was fading, something strange happened, his wounds began to visibly heal. I was stunned. Could it be that Uncle Yu has awakened some special ability? My own spatial ability had manifested because of the supernova explosion, but what puzzled me was why I was the only one in our community to awaken an ability. A sudden realization hit me. Uncle Yu's near-death state mirrored mine from before. Could that be the condition to awaken such abilities? If so, that's quite stringent. Luckily for Uncle Yu, he ran into me, otherwise, he'd need an ability to resurrect on the spot, or else death would be the only outcome. Thinking of this, I patted Dr. Joe's shoulder. From now on, administer a dose of sedative to Uncle Yu daily. Dr. Joe was taken aback. 
Did Uncle Yu awaken some sort of ability like you did? I nodded. It's unclear what Uncle Yu has awakened to, but if he turns into the Hulk and tears our home apart, it would be a major loss. After instructing Dr. Joe to administer the sedatives to Uncle Yu, I got up and headed to the living room. Meanwhile, Sialim was in the living room, scouting for something to eat. I sternly told her to stop looking. I've put everything away. You'll stay with Uncle Yu and be responsible for his daily needs. Seeing my serious demeanor, Sialim begrudgingly entered the room. What I had to do next was clear out any traitors in the building. I soon found myself fully armed in front of a door. Without hesitation, I shot through the lock and with a powerful kick burst open the door. A disheveled woman wielding a kitchen knife charged at me. I quickly raised a riot shield to block her attack, then slapped the knife out of her hand. It's been a long time. The fact you're still alive suggests you've turned your best friend into clay pot rice, haven't you? Fang Yeqing's bloodshot eyes cried out hysterically. It's impossible. Why can't so many people kill just one of you? I chuckled in response. Did you really think colluding with Wan Chong and a few others would be enough to get rid of me? You're so naive. With that, I raised the wooden stick in my hand. Had it not been for this woman's meddling in my past life, I could have lived at least two more years. Thinking this, I viciously struck Fang Yeqing's left leg with the stick. Next, I dragged her to the window, intending to throw her out. Seeing this, Fang Yeqing was finally gripped with fear. Zhang Yi, please spare me. I realize my mistakes and promise never to repeat them. Thinking of the pain of being cannibalized in my past life, I didn't hesitate and let go, allowing Fang Yeqing to plummet from the 25th floor. Accompanied by a loud thud, Fang Yeqing smashed into the snowy ground, creating a deep crater. Watching the scene, I felt no pity. This was my revenge for my past life. The next morning, I went to the sick room to check on uncle. Unexpectedly, after the transformation, uncle's healing speed was dozens of times faster than a regular person's. In just a day, his gunshot wound had mostly healed. I instructed Dr. Joe to always monitor his condition to prevent any unexpected occurrences. Without hesitation, Dr. Joe immediately administered a sedative injection to uncle. Just then, climate approached, hoping I could go to her place to help retrieve her charger and diapers. I smiled, indicating that I had urgent matters to attend to, but I would assist her once I was done. After leaving the room, my expression immediately darkened. This scheming woman is still up to her old tricks. Our two families are only separated by a few floors, yet she still wants my help. Clearly, she fears that once she leaves, she won't be able to return. I need to find a way to deal with this cunning woman. Keeping her around will be a liability sooner or later. I headed to the residential area to continue my search for threats. Clearing these dangers was crucial for our safety in this post-apocalyptic world. Suddenly, Su Hao, a nervous wealthy second-generation kid, approached me with supposed vital information. I raised an eyebrow, having pretty much cleared out the entire compound already. But Su Hao insisted, whispering about the richest man's son, Wan Siming, supposedly building a multi-billion dollar safe house for the apocalypse. Intrigued, I asked for the location. Su Hao motioned for me to follow him discreetly, implying it wasn't safe to talk openly. At his residence, Su Hao hesitantly shared that the safe house was in Young Villa, rumored to be stocked with enough supplies for lifetimes. Confused, I asked his motive for telling me this. Su Hao claimed loyalty, wanting to be my subordinate and follow my lead. Skeptical, I chuckled at the idea of easily taking over such a valuable safe house. Su Hao then dropped a bombshell, Wang Simon was on to me and planned to ambush me with Caesar's snowmobile and supplies. Furious at the betrayal, I confronted Su Hao, who begged for forgiveness, claiming he now genuinely wanted to join me in capturing the safe house. With a gun in hand, I demanded proof of his sincerity. Su Hao pleaded for mercy, swearing his words were true. Despite his pleas, I remained cautious. As he trembled with fear, I holstered my gun, considering his offer but insisting he give me a solid reason to trust him. After witnessing your abilities, I realized that my only chance of survival in this post-apocalyptic world is by following you. Even if I allied myself with Juan Simon, I'd just be a disposable pawn in his eyes. Before the apocalypse, I was Juan Simon's lackey, trying to gain his favor. I even sacrificed my own woman for his amusement. But Juan Simon never treated me like a human being, which filled me with deep resentment. Seeing Su Hao's rage, I suggested that collaboration might be possible, but only with a solid plan. Su Hao proposed that we pretend to ally with Juan Simon until we're inside his compound, then eliminate him. Chuckling, I replied, are you an idiot? You want to take on someone without knowing their security details? Su Hao countered that he knew Wan Simon's security details, but there was a catch, I had to promise him a position as my subordinate, or he'd remain silent. Smirking, I pressed the muzzle of my gun against his forehead. 
Seeing this, Su Hao yelled, I know you'll silence anyone who's no longer useful, but information about that safe house is my only lifeline now. Even if it kills me, I won't reveal it. Impressed, I remarked, you're pretty clever. I'll accept your terms, but you must abide by my rules. Su Hao nodded rapidly, swearing his loyalty to me and promising to always follow my orders. I then laid out my conditions. First, he had to provide a detailed account of the safe house, and second, he had to deal with a particular nuisance for me, Song. After securing Su Hao's loyalty, I didn't immediately give him my request. Instead, I mentioned that as my subordinate, I had something valuable to bestow upon him. Then, I returned to my safe house. Soon after, I arrived at Su Hao's residence holding a briefcase. Slowly, I began, since you've chosen to be my subordinate, there are certain truths I won't hide from you. I am, in fact, a professional assassin. Understanding dawned on Su Hao. No wonder, Brother Zhang Yi, your shooting skills are impeccable. Su Hao's confidence in the future grew. He believed that as long as he remained by my side, he would surely survive in this post-apocalyptic world. At that moment, I pulled out a syringe from the briefcase. This is a slow-acting poison I specifically use for those who are stubborn or have ill intentions. Without an antidote, death is inevitable within a month. Upon hearing this, Su Hao shouted in panic. I reassured Zhang Yi with a smile, promising him that I had no bad intentions. Don't worry, I said, as soon as we take down Wan Simon's safe house, I'll give you the antidote right away. Su Ao collapsed upon hearing this. He knew that if they didn't succeed, he'd die. Without hesitation, I injected the substance into his neck, binding him to me. I told him not to worry, assuring him that the poison wouldn't activate until the right time. Watching him walk away trembling, I smirked, knowing I had successfully intimidated him. With his fear of tap water, the chances of betrayal were slim. Meanwhile, in a hospital room, Uncle had just regained consciousness. Sea Lime whispered in his ear, but I had been watching the scene through surveillance. I opened the door, pretending to be surprised at Uncle's awakening. Uncle, you're finally awake, I exclaimed. He gratefully thanked me, saying his life now belonged to me. Chuckling, I told him it was thanks to him this time. Sea Lime joined in, expressing gratitude. I assured them that we were now one family and would take care of them. Seattle May's face lit up with joy, knowing they could stay without worries. She handed me the baby she was holding and left to get their belongings. As soon as she was gone, I sent a message to Su Ao, prepare for action. While playing with the baby, I couldn't help but think about how tough it must be for such a little one. But it's for the best, I thought. Otherwise, someone might end up turning you into a stew one day. Meanwhile, Salim's smile returned as she reached her door. But as she opened it, Su Hao suddenly lunged at her. Before she could even react, he swiftly stabbed her in desperation. Salim begged for mercy, promising to give him whatever he wanted. But Su Hao didn't stop his attack until she was motionless. Afterward, he texted me, saying, Brother Zhang Yi, it's done. When can I get some food? Seeing the message, I couldn't help but smile. Finally, this problem was resolved. Otherwise, she might have caused discord between Uncle Yu and me. Turning to Uncle Yu, I said, your family can stay here in peace. Whenever you wish to move out, you're free to do so. He looked troubled upon hearing my words. Brother Zhang Yi, this might not be appropriate, he said, plus, resources are limited. Saving my life is more than enough. I patted his shoulder reassuringly. We've already been through life and death together. Just stay here and recover. However, before I could finish, the baby in my arms began to cry uncontrollably. Despite my best efforts, I couldn't calm the little one down. In desperation, I handed the baby to Dr. Zhou, who appeared completely lost. Suddenly, a thought struck me. Could it be time for a diaper change? I quickly took out a pack of diapers from my storage space and tossed it to Dr. Joe. Then, I returned to Uncle Yu's room to inquire about his condition, asking if he felt anything amiss. Uncle Yu shook his head, indicating that apart from feeling weak, he didn't notice any other abnormalities. Suddenly, as if recalling something, he said, Zhang Yi, you should check outside. My wife has been gone for quite a while. I'm worried something might have happened to her. I instructed Joe to look after Uncle Yu, and I went to my room to arm myself. Taking this opportunity, I planned to deal with some pending matters. I then sent a message to all the homeowners, summoning them to room 1301 on the 13th floor. The meeting was meant to distribute resources and decide on the future management of the community. We had taken control of the entire area, and now our word was law, except for Sue. When the neighbors rushed to room 1301 after receiving the message, I couldn't help but smirk. Want to be the community's manager? Talk to the king of hell about that. Without hesitation, I threw two grenades into the room. 
the unsuspecting neighbors, mid-conversation, were shocked by the sight of the grenades. What the hell is this? They exclaimed. But before they could react, a massive explosion tore through the room. I had already positioned a blast shield outside to protect myself. Walking into the room, looking contemplative, I thought to myself, using grenades really makes things easier. A surviving neighbor, filled with rage, shouted, Zhang Yi. We helped you so much. Why are you doing this? I responded with a cold smirk. You might be mistaken. Without me, you would have starved to death long ago. Without another word, I made sure he joined the others in the afterlife. Having exacted my revenge, I felt an immense sense of satisfaction. Except for Su Hao, all the neighbors who had wronged me in my previous life had been dealt with. From now on, no one in this community would ever pose a threat to me. All I needed now was to get to Wong Simon's billion dollar safe house, and then I could live the rest of my days in peace and luxury. With a mournful expression, I approached Uncle Yu. Sister Sia, she's gone. I slammed my fist against the wall. I thought there were only a few traitors in this building, but it turns out they were all traitors. But don't worry, Uncle Yu, I've taken care of them all in revenge for Sister Sia. Upon hearing this, tears streamed down Uncle Yu's face. Those ungrateful bastards deserved it, he said angrily, throwing a fierce punch at his bed, creating a deep dent. This display of strength sent shivers down my spine. I tried to calm Uncle Yu. It's my fault for being too trusting. If only I had noticed their true intentions earlier. Uncle Yu clenched his fists, completely believing my words. After all, he too had witnessed the ingratitude of these neighbors over time. It's all my fault for not managing things properly, I sighed. But Uncle Yu, don't be too devastated. I promise to find you a young and beautiful wife. Upon hearing my words, Uncle Yu gave an awkward smile. I'd prefer someone mature. Just then, Joe walked in with a crying baby. This little one can't stop crying. What should we do? I glanced at Joe, pondering if the baby might be hungry for milk. Dr. Joe lightly punched my chest, questioning my suggestion. What are you talking about? How would I have milk to feed the baby? Taking the baby from her, I realized we might need to find a stepmother for this little one. He disagreed with my idea, after all, neither of us had experience with kids, and it would be terrible if something went wrong. A moment later, I headed downstairs to the community with the baby, alarming the nearby residents. They whispered among themselves, wondering if I, Zhang Yi, was coming to cause trouble. I pointed my gun to the sky and shouted, bring out Legion. Shortly after, Legion emerged from building 18 and asked me what I wanted. I smiled at him, impressed by his guts. Aren't you afraid I'll shoot you on the spot? To my surprise, despite the post-apocalyptic environment where food and clothes were scarce, building 18 under Li Jin's management had the highest number of survivors. I couldn't help but respect that. I handed the baby over to Li. Are there mothers in your building, right? I'm entrusting you with the baby's care. As I said this, I placed some baby formula and diapers in front of Lee. Without much ado, Lee assured me he would do his best to raise the baby. He then handed the baby over to a mother in building 18 to take care of. I approached Lee Jin, inquiring about the exact number of survivors in their building and what they would do if I stopped providing them with food. But Lee Chen was full of hope for the future, no matter what. As long as people are alive, there's always hope. Upon hearing this, I pointed to the buildings I had cleared out. The supplies there should last you for a while. However, Li shook his head, indicating that they would not resort to that unless absolutely necessary. In his view, once they start down that path, their ultimate fate would be doom, a conclusion neither he nor anyone in his building wanted to see. Hearing this, I sighed deeply. With everything as it is now, nobody knows if death or tomorrow will come first. Yet this man manages to hold on to his core values. I couldn't help but admire him greatly. Li Jin took a deep breath. If only we were as capable as you. Maybe then I could truly lead everyone out of this apocalypse. So, Zhang Yi, can you lend a hand a bit more? You've been able to provide a lot of food for the whole community before. With so many people gone now, your help could really make a difference for those of us still here. I interrupted him. Everyone is struggling right now. I'm not a saint. I might help you now, but can I keep doing it forever? and who's to say I won't face betrayal from those I've helped in this apocalypse. Just surviving is a blessing. I don't have grand ambitions of being a savior. I then tossed a few packs of seeds in front of Legion. Consider these a parting gift. If you want to thrive, you have to work for it. In this apocalyptic world, we're all in the dark, but I see a glimmer of humanity in you. You can lead everyone to cultivate these seeds and farm, or you can eat them now. It's your choice. With that, I turned around and walked away. The residents who picked up the seeds looked puzzled. Can we really grow crops in this frigid weather? 
At that moment, a professor from the Agricultural College urged everyone to quickly secure the seeds. These are our future hope. Seeing this, Li Jin also hastily collected the seeds. He asked the professor, Professor, can we really grow crops in such cold conditions? With a determined look, the professor responded, Humanity has achieved countless impossibilities. Why can't we make it work this time? Hearing this, the other residents didn't hesitate any further, and with renewed hope, they gathered the seeds scattered on the ground. Back in my safe house, I stretched out. Finally, the community matters have come to a close. Next, I need to acquire Juan Simon's multi-billion safe house. I then asked Joe to prepare dinner. I've been busy all day, and I'm quite hungry. Without hesitation, Joe began cooking. As I watched her graceful figure, I approached her with a playful suggestion. How about we have a child? Who knows how long this apocalypse will last? Having kids is a way to ensure a legacy. Two hours later, I received a message from Su Hao. He had negotiated with Juan Simon and asked when we would initiate our plan. I smiled in response. No need to rush. Come to my place, and we'll discuss it. Soon after, Su Hao arrived at my safe house, clearly enjoying the warmth of my shelter. I motioned for him to sit down so we could discuss our plans. Su Hao was about to kneel on the floor to report the details of his conversation with Juan Simon when I made a silence gesture. No need to make it complicated. Just show me the chat history between you two. Upon hearing this, Su Hao broke into a cold sweat. Seeing that Su Hao was hesitant to bring out his phone, my smile vanished instantly. So reluctant. Are you hiding something from me? Su Hao clutched his phone tightly, stuttering, I. I haven't hidden anything from you. Growing impatient, I replied, is it so hard to have a proper conversation? Do I really have to get physical with you? Quickly handing over his phone, Sue pleaded with me, saying, I did badmouth you to Wan Simming, but it was all a ploy to deceive him. I hope you won't take it personally, brother. I swiftly took the phone and scrolled through their chat history, discovering that Sue had been in contact with Wan Simming for two months. Sue initially wanted Wan Simming to eliminate me and then help him seize my safe house and supplies. Surprisingly, Wang Simon had similar intentions. With a cold laugh, I displayed the chat log to Sue. How do you plan to explain this? You played both sides quite masterfully. Caught in the act, Sue quickly raised his right hand, swearing, Brother, you've manipulated me too, right? We're two peas in a pod. Why would I betray you? I remained silent, rubbing my chin and thinking. Wang Simon only knew about my snowmobile and base, unaware of my arsenal. Perhaps I could exploit this intelligence gap to set a trap. Throwing the phone onto the table, I looked at Sue and said, tell me everything about that shelter, especially the weaponry and defenses. I want every detail. Relieved, Sue began, rumor has it that the shelter was built using materials from a spaceship. It's practically impenetrable unless attacked with missiles. Inside, there aren't any weapons, but there's gas used for hypnosis. The entrances are rigged with high-temperature flamethrowers. After hearing Sue's description, I formulated a plan in my mind. If he's after my vehicle and supplies, then if he doesn't get those things, even if he captures me, he probably won't kill me. At most, he'll torture me. When the time comes, I'll hide the snowmobile in advance, granting myself an extra layer of protection. Although my life may not be significant to him, I suspect he won't kill me before obtaining my snowmobile and supplies. Is there any other offensive mechanism inside that shelter apart from the two you mentioned? I asked. Grinning, Sue replied, that's all. We can pretend to be hypnotized by the gas, pass the traps, and then take him out once we're there. You can pretend to be captured, and I'll seize the chance to stab him, sending him straight to hell. The corners of my mouth lifted slightly. Sue probably didn't know I had a gas mask. That's alright, it's always smart to be cautious. I lay on the sofa, thinking about how to deal with both the flames and gas. Without the upper hand, I couldn't help but feel a bit uneasy. After much pondering, an idea popped into my mind, my space ability. Time is frozen within this otherworldly space. If I could use it in battle, wouldn't it be a powerful advantage? I had always overlooked this ability. It seems I need to explore it further. Su Hao sat on the ground eagerly awaiting my response. Finally, I said, all right, go back for now. I'll contact you in a couple of days. Su Hao clung to my leg, brother Zhang Yi, I've been poisoned. I'm afraid I can't wait that long, I reassured him, the poison takes seven days to take effect. I'll contact you in two or three days at most. Go home and wait patiently. No sooner had I spoken than I ushered him out the door. Brother Zhang Yi, you must remember, otherwise I'll be gone in seven days, Su Hao said before leaving. I looked at my special ability in my hand. Apart from storing supplies and precise shooting, I wondered what other surprising capabilities it might have. 
However, my primary concern was how to utilize this power to neutralize the flame and gas. Once that was sorted, I could easily control Juan Simon. I left the living room and entered an empty house, starting a fire to test my ability. Stretching out my right hand towards the flame, I activated my storage ability. The flames on the ground slowly converged towards me. Seeing that it worked, I extended both palms, aiming to accelerate the absorption process. In no time, the flames were entirely absorbed into the alternate space. I looked at my hands, delighted. I can't believe it actually worked, I said with a grin. I stretched my palms forward, intending to try and release distorted fire. With a whooshing sound, the flames I had absorbed were instantly expelled forward. My eyes widened in surprise, and I burst into joyful laughter. So, apart from storage, this alternate space can be used like this. It's like a divine defensive technique. I was as elated as a child who had discovered a new toy. Once I mastered this ability, any future attacks would be rendered useless against me. This power was perfect for someone like me who prioritizes survival above all else. So, I had this idea. What if I absorbed a living person into my alternate space? I mean, I tried it with a live fish before, but that was just for storing food. Now, I'm thinking about its combat potential. I needed to test it out with a real person. People around were scared, but they reluctantly offered up a sacrifice. The poor guy had no idea if he'd make it out alive. I handed him a stick and told him to attack me with it. He looked completely lost and scared, but he swung at me anyway. In a flash, I activated my alternate space. Before he knew it, he and the stick were sucked in. He froze in place, like he'd turned into an ice sculpture. I checked his pulse and, yep, he was out cold. With a wave of my hand, I ejected him from the space. Poor guy stumbled out, looking terrified. I asked him how it felt, and he said it was like entering a blank world. He felt like he'd been in there for ages, even though it was just a moment. I realized then that time moves differently in the alternate space. The longer you're in there, the worse it gets for your mind. Living things can't handle it for too long without serious consequences. They could end up dead or seriously messed up. Since I couldn't actively absorb living beings into my alternate space, I wondered what would happen if I tried to disassemble some tissues instead. I immediately grabbed my sacrifice neighbor's hand and swiftly sliced off two of his fingers. He screamed in agony, sounding like a pit being slaughtered, but I didn't care about his well-being. I was more intrigued by the discovery that while living beings couldn't stay in the alternate space for long, severed fingers could. What could be the principle behind this? I tossed some gauze to the man. Hurry up and bandage yourself. Once you're done, we'll continue the experiment. This time, you'll throw something at me. After several more experiments using the man as a test subject, I had a better grasp of the functionalities of my alternate space. Until now, I had merely used it as a storage facility, which was a waste. My power could open a channel between this world and the alternate space to deflect incoming attacks and then redirect them back at my enemies. The man was now voraciously enjoying the food I had rewarded him with as he gorged himself. Excitedly, he thanked me. This is the first full meal I've had since the apocalypse. I smiled at him and said, Eat slowly, brother. The man's spirits lifted at this. Brother Zhang Yi, if you need anything, just say the word. As long as you feed me, he added before I could finish his sentence. I made a quick move, and the man collapsed on the ground with a thud, blood pooling around him. I smiled and said, I don't need anything else from you. You should be on your way now. The man on the ground closed his eyes with a smile. He was finally free no longer having to endure hunger and suffering in this post-apocalyptic world. Without looking back, I walked away. Time was running out for my appointment with Su Hao, and in the next few days, I needed to find some people for combat simulations. Three days later, Su Hao was kneeling in front of me, begging me to join the attack on Wan Siming Sanctuary. Ever since Xiang Yi had forcibly injected him with poison, he felt his body deteriorating day by day. If we didn't act soon, he feared he would die before we could see Swan Simon's stronghold. I looked at Suhao coldly, finding the situation amusing. I hadn't expected that a lie I casually made up would have such a devastating effect on him. The power of psychological suggestion had certainly tormented him. Shrugging, I said, I can inject you with an antidote to temporarily relieve your symptoms. If there's no cure in five days, you will die regardless. I can't wait any longer, Suhao urgently said, rolling up his sleeves. If I don't get the shot, I feel like I'll die tomorrow. Administered the injection, he continued his psychological manipulation. We can only succeed, failure will not bode well for either of us. Filled with newfound confidence, Suao said, Brother Zhang Yi, rest assured, I'm willing to go through fire and water for you. Suao took out his phone. I'll call Juan Simon right now to arrange a meeting time. Everything will go according to your plan, 
brother Zhang Yi. Zhang Yi started packing his bags. Dr. Zhou, standing nearby, watched in a daze. The issues in their community had mostly been resolved, and she couldn't understand why they needed to go out again, especially with so much luggage. It seemed like they were going on a long trip. Zhang Yi had left enough food for her and Uncle Yu to last half a month but didn't share details of his plan. Shocked, Dr. Zhou didn't dare to ask more questions. Just as Zhang Yi was about to leave, Dr. Zhou grew anxious. Was he planning to abandon her? She hugged him tightly, refusing to let go. Chuckling, Zhang Yi pinched her chin. Looks like the silly girl is overthinking things. If it weren't for more pressing matters, I would have stayed and spent more time with Dr. Zhou. Suppressing his emotions, he kissed her and told her to behave while he was away. Their lives would undergo significant changes once he accomplished his current mission. With that, he walked out the door. Suao had been waiting for some time. Zhang Yi hopped onto his snowmobile and pulled out a rope. Suao was puzzled. Brother Zhang Yi, you still don't trust me? My loyalty to you is as clear as daylight. Zhang Yi smiled. Don't misunderstand. I'm tying you up for Wan Siming to see. If he sees us getting along too well, he'd never believe that you've tricked me into this. Suao could only helplessly stretch out his hands as Zhang Yi tied him up. They rode away on the snowmobile, the northern wind painfully whipping Suao's face. He wanted to ask Zhang Yi for a helmet, but Zhang Yi chuckled. No helmet for you. Just endure it for a bit. Besides, the more miserable you look, the more believable it will be. Sniffling heavily, Suao followed Zhang Yi. Tiank Mountain Villa loomed ahead. Zhang looked at the luxurious villas inside, facing the river and backed by the mountains. These buildings are a cut above other high-end villas. The terrain makes this place a natural snow haven. The snow accumulation here is much less than other places. When the apocalypse came, I thought the wealth gap would shrink. How naive I was. Money really is great, Suao hardly chimed in from behind. Brother Zhang Yi, money is like waste paper now. Our current lives can't compare to yours. Zhang Yi smiled. Nice flattery. Come on, lead the way. The two then headed towards the villa complex. Suao was a bit puzzled as he followed, wondering why they didn't ride the snowmobile all the way in. As we stand in front of Wang Simon's residence, I raise my weapon, pointing it at Su Hao's head, urging him to open the door quickly. Su Hao rushes to the security camera, yelling for Wang Simon to let us in. Inside, Wang Simon sips on his 1982 Lafitte and watches the security monitor, puzzled by our unexpected visit. He scans the area but doesn't spot the snowmobile we mentioned, suspecting a trick. As I grow impatient, I threaten Su Hao with the gun, warning him not to dare trick me. Believe it or not, I'll shoot you right now, I declare angrily. Sweat pours down Su Hao's face as he pleads with me, begging me not to shoot. He assures me he wouldn't dare deceive me even if he had the guts. Then, he addresses the camera, speaking to Wang Simon. Su Hao emphasizes how hard we've worked and how crucial it is not to fail now. He stresses that missing this opportunity would mean losing the chance for another store. Convinced of their sincerity, Wong Simon decides on a ruthless contingency plan. If they betray us, he'll activate a mechanism to obliterate them, leaving nothing behind but ashes. With a press of a button, the main door of the villa swings open, revealing the spacious interior. Su Hao and I enter, marveling at the opulence around us. Su Hao remarks on the lavishness of rich people, noting how they have countless ways to entertain themselves. He points out a passage ahead, suggesting we explore further to find another door leading to the shelter. I follow closely behind, letting Su Hao take the lead. Unbeknownst to us, Wong Simon watches through the surveillance cameras, waiting for the opportune moment to spring his trap. As I step into the range of his trap, he wastes no time activating it. Suddenly, exhaust ports above the corridor open, releasing a suffocating gas. Su Hao reacts quickly, covering his nose and mouth, but I remain calm. I've already devised a countermeasure. Not stopping there, Wong Simon activates a sleeping gas mechanism, engulfing us in a cloud of smoke. But I stay composed, knowing I have a plan to deal with this too. The two of us are going all out in our act to trick Wong Simon. I shout at Su Hao, you mongrel, open the door for me now. Su Hao retorts, stop struggling Zhang Yi, you're a fool. Even if you kill me, you won't survive. Then, two gunshots ring out in the smoke. Excitedly, Wong Simon watches the two figures in the smoke, thinking, these two idiots who came to my door, do they actually think they can beat me? Let's see how I take care of them. Seizing the opportunity, I draw the smoke into my own alternate space. The voices of the two gradually fade in the smoke, and the passage door slowly opens. Calmly, I put away my gas mask, thinking that as soon as Wong Simon walks in, I'll immediately shoot him. Footsteps approach, and I can hardly contain my excitement. But to my dismay, it's not Wong Simon who walks in, it's Ling. 
Suhao, you idiot, why are there other people in the shelter? Ignoring that for now, I continue to play dead until Ling Gang comes closer and lifts both of us onto his shoulders, heading toward the passage door. Only then do I realize that this person is Ling Gang from the entertainment industry, who is said to have a good relationship with Wong Simon. Ling Gang dumps the two of us in front of Wong Simon, who looks at the unconscious pair. Ling Gang ties our arms behind our backs, saying, this guy is as stupid as a pig, he's no effort at all, and he even dared to target your shelter. Wong Simon responds nonchalantly, well, isn't this to be expected? If I can't even handle some popper, then my billion dollar shelter is a waste. The two start discussing how to snag my snowmobile since they haven't left the shelter in ages. Wong Simon's getting antsy cooped up like this. As they chat, I activate a hidden space and let out some hypnotic gas. They're so hyped up they start swaying. Wong Simon gives Ling Gang a puzzled look saying, if you're pumped to go out, why are you wobbling? Ling Gang, in a daze, replies, brother Wong, I'm not wobbling. Why do I see six of you then? They both collapse, and I silently untie the ropes, thinking it was a piece of cake. I pick up Wong Simon's fancy gold handgun, chuckling at the flashy toys rich folks have. But they're all for show. With Wong Simon and the others handled, I start snooping around the rooms. Let's see what goodies the wealthy hoard. Each room blows my mind. Luxury beyond imagination. I stumble upon a room full of lush greenery. A whole ecosystem in here. I smirk, claiming this place is mine. Room after room, labeled for games, pets, and entertainment, I explore. Then, I stumble into a water bedroom with seductive women lounging around. Sadly, they're all lifeless. Heading to the basement, room designated for pets, I'm shocked to find playboy bunnies and cat women covered in strange fluids and needles. One of them pleads for more, but I don't need this. I kick her away and put an end to them all. Moving on to the control room, hoping it's the shelter's core, I realize I'm no computer expert. Discovering sports facilities, I see potential for testing my skills in the future. Continuing my patrol, I encounter a room where the system denies access due to failed identity verification. Can't pass through this area. I'll need Master Wong's help after all, I think, before splashing water on the two men to wake them up. Sweetheart, Jiang Yi says mockingly. At this point, Wong Simon looks at me in disbelief. How did you do this, Jiang Yi? I smile slightly. The rich rely on technology. We poor folks rely on mutations. How else would we survive in the AP apocalypse? I point my weapon at Wong Simon. All right, my lord. Now is not the time for chit-chat. Let's get down to business. I lean down. For example, how about letting me live comfortably in this villa? That's the only way you'll save your life. Wong Simon visibly tenses. I'll give you whatever you want. Just let me go, he pleads. Calm down, I reassure him. Don't worry. I don't have a habit of killing. I just want to find a stable place to live. Your place is so big, one more person won't make a difference. Wong Simon looks at me skeptically. You just want to move in? You don't want to kill me and take over? I chuckle, thinking that killing you would be pointless. Besides, I'm not a murderer, and this snow disaster won't last forever. Once things return to normal, I'd like to be on good terms with you. Upon hearing this, Wong Simon perks up thinking, so this bumpkin wants to be friends with me? In their eyes, society will eventually return to normal, and with a little help from me, these country bumpkins can rise to the top. They sure know how to plan, but I'm no pushover either. If you want to be friends, hurry up and untie me. My hands are numb, I tell him, smiling. But there's a condition, he has to hand over control of the shelter systems to me. Wong Simon hesitates, but eventually agrees. I grandly sweep my hand over the control panel, proclaiming, from now on, I'm the master here. Wong Simon, beside me, eagerly acknowledges my new status, pleading to be untied, as his whole body is numb. But ominously, I stand up, telling him to hold on for a second. I'll relieve you shortly, I say as I take out a knife from behind me and slash it across Wong Simon's neck in a flash. Blood spurts out, and he looks at me in disbelief. You promised not to kill me. You broke your word, he accuses. I look at him mockingly, saying, relax. You might feel a bit dizzy at first, but the pain will be over soon. Wong Simon falls to the ground, passing away to the afterlife. As I scrub the blood off the floor, I ponder how to handle Su Hao's involvement in Wong Simon's demise. Resolving one issue, I still wrestle with what to do about Su Hao, considering he did aid me in seizing Wong Simon's residence. Suddenly, Su Hao stirs, groggy from his slumber, and notices me cleaning the bloodstains. Excitedly he exclaims, Bro Zhang, we did it, didn't we? He rises and gazes upon Wong Simon's lifeless body on the floor, mocking him with laughter. I never thought this day would come for you, you damn dog. Not killing you myself was too merciful. I gesture towards a backpack on the sofa, informing Su Hao that his reward lies within. Eagerly he opens it to find an assortment of food, his eyes lighting up with delight as he begins to feast. Bro Zhang, you're like a brother to me. I'll follow you wherever you go. Your word is law, he declares. However, I dampen his enthusiasm, explaining that Wang Simon's shelter is nearly depleted of resources and energy. Su Hao becomes anxious, refusing to believe that this is all that remains. Accusing me of monopolizing everything and intending to kick him out, 
he asserts his importance in providing intel on the shelter. I chuckle at his accusations, assuring him that I have no reason to lie. Despite his threats to expose my abilities, I remain unfazed by his attempts to manipulate the situation. I've been too soft on you, he declares, lifting his hand and aiming at Su Hao. I gave you a chance, but you blew it. What good are you to me now? Su Hao collapses to the ground, bewildered by the sudden turn of events. As he takes his last breath, I gaze at him and mutter, be better in your next life. Empty threats won't get you far without power. With a sigh, I grab my backpack. I plan to let you live a little longer, but you've pushed me too far. Sitting in the entertainment area, I let my mind wander. It would be nice to survive here until the apocalypse blows over. It might even be fun if Dr. Ju were here with me. As for uncle, I have different plans in store for him. I pour myself a glass of red wine and turn on the TV, only to be surprised by the sight of a foreign woman on the screen. Switching through various international channels, I wonder how Wong Simon managed to pull this off during the storm. After some pondering, I stumble upon a hidden door connected to a network of cables. Inside, I discover an independent server. My eyes light up with excitement. With this high-end network infrastructure, I can now access accurate information from around the world in no time. Settling in, I begin to browse through the data. In just one month, the world's population has dwindled to a mere quarter of its former size. 8.5 billion people reduced to a fraction. Zhang Yi feels grateful for stocking up on supplies ahead of time. He hopes at least 5% of the population can survive in the future. However, his optimism wavers when he comes across reports of mutated humans. Many countries have reported individuals with both beneficial and harmful mutations. Some can conjure flames or summon bears, while others transform into towering green giants. Yet, only a few possess special abilities. Most are physically deformed by gamma radiation. After digesting this information, Zhang Yi becomes convinced that there are others like him hiding their true strength. This realization deepens his understanding of the dangers lurking outside. Determined to stay in the shelter, he plans to retrieve Dr. Zhou, his loyal companion, from the safe house. As Zhang Yi prepares to depart on his snowmobile, he is interrupted by an enchanting voice. Instantly alert, he aims his gun at the newcomer, only to be surprised by the sight of the renowned actress Yang Mi. She, who has captivated the entertainment world, stands before him, pleading to be taken away from the harsh snowstorm. Observing Yang Mi's soft demeanor, Zhang Yi reflects on the hardships faced by everyone. If you want me to take you, he responds, you need to give me a good reason. In a tender tone, Yang Mi agrees to any condition in exchange for food. Then she seals the deal with a kiss on Zhang Yi's cheek, leaving him blushing and won over by her charm. I pondered the idea of having another woman to share the bed during this chaotic time. It didn't seem like a bad idea in the apocalypse. As I escorted her to my new place, Yang Mi couldn't help but notice my skills as we entered Wang Xing's residence. Putting on a surprised act, she inquired about the connection between me and Wang Xing. I avoided her question, instead cautiously asking if she was acquainted with Wang Simon. If she had any ties with him, I knew I had to act fast to avoid future trouble. Yang Mi changed her tone, claiming she didn't really know Wang Simon well, just the usual nods and greetings at events. Pouring tea, I thought it was a smart move to let her off the hook for now. Handing her the tea, I made it clear that this place was now mine, and she shouldn't ask questions she had no business asking. Yang Mi eagerly gulped down the tea, relishing its warmth, mentioning it was the first cup of hot water she'd had in days. Then she coyly asked if she could use the bathroom for a hot shower. I naturally didn't refuse. As she undressed and left her clothes in the living room, she indulged in the longest hot shower, her body instantly relaxing. Meanwhile, she began to plot how to make me serve under her. With her beauty, she figured it wouldn't be hard to win me over. Compared to the greasy middle-aged men she knew, I was quite the catch in her eyes. She believed her good luck hadn't run out yet, even if she had to be with me for a few months. After her shower, Yang Mi walks out barefoot, determined to do whatever it takes to stay. She's crystal clear about what comes next and mentally gears up, reminding herself it's just a transaction. Once the snowstorm blows over and life goes back to normal, she'll still be a top-tier celebrity, and no one will be any the wiser about this little arrangement. Wrapped in a towel, she saunters over to Jiang Yi, coyly asking if she can crash at his place. She sweetens the deal, promising to serve him well if he agrees. But when Jiang Yi remains unmoved, she grabs his hand and pleads, assuring him she won't be any trouble and will leave quietly once the storm passes. Jiang Yi, however, sees through her facade, realizing she views his place as a mere stepping stone. He takes a sip of red wine and quips sarcastically, questioning whether the world will ever return to its former state, even after the snowstorm. Yang Mi suddenly grows anxious, desperately asserting that things can go back to normal, as if trying to reassure herself. Uninterested in arguing, Zhang Yi lays down the law, declaring that if she's staying in his house, she'll play by his rules. 
Zhang Yi pulls Yang Mi close, whispering that he understands she doesn't have to wait anymore now that she's with him. He sees no reason to refuse her request. Afterward, Zhang Yi takes out clothing from a different dimension and tosses it to Yang Mi, leaving her dumbfounded. She wonders what kind of superpower allows him to summon objects out of thin air. As she's about to turn away, Yang Mi grabs his arm, pleading for him to stay. Zhang Yi, amused, teases her, suggesting she's not satisfied yet. He mentions having other things to attend to but promises to deal with her later that night. Yang Mi blushes and clarifies that she has something important to discuss with him. Feeling a bit hungry, Zhang Yi suggests they talk over dinner. Yang Mi obediently sits at the dining table as Zhang Yi summons food from another dimension. He casually mentions that adding one more woman won't make a difference in his large home, but lays down one requirement. She must obey him. Yang Mi, knowing the game, agrees but also sets some principles she hopes he'll respect. Zhang Yi, amused, agrees to hear her out. Yang Mi states her first condition, whatever happens between them must stay between them during the snowstorm period. She emphasizes the importance of protecting her reputation as a public figure. Zhang Yi, understanding her concerns, readily agrees to keep their affairs private. Summoning her courage, Yang Mi states her second condition, Zhang Yi can't force her into uncomfortable situations or make outrageous demands unless she agrees. Blushing and shifting awkwardly, she explains her boundaries. Zhang Yi, feeling puzzled, questions her sudden change in attitude, reminding her that she was the one who approached him initially. He's not naive either and pulls her close, not buying her innocent act, especially since she's an actress. He brings up the concept of quid pro quo, wondering how she became a top-tier celebrity with such poor acting skills. Yang Mi falls silent, unable to respond to Zhang Yi's rebuke. He then lifts her up and places her on the dining table, whispering in her ear reassuringly, Don't worry, I don't have any weird fetishes, but thanks for the reminder. Yang Mi, having seen far more bizarre behavior in her industry, finds Zhang Yi's behavior quite reasonable. They spend the night discussing a script in great detail. Early the next morning, as Zhang Yi prepares to leave, he suddenly remembers that his friend, Uncle Yu, is still single. He asks Yang Mi if most of the people living here are wealthy women or celebrities, to which she nods in agreement. Zhang Yi smiles and mentions that he has a friend who's a good person, but recently got cheated by a scheming woman. He suggests that his friend could use some female companionship to heal his wounded heart, and asks if Yang Mi could help find someone suitable in her circle. Upon hearing this, Yang Mi looks surprised. What are you taking me for? She thinks quickly, realizing that she's the only younger woman left in the neighborhood. Zhang Yi recalls that Uncle Yu prefers mature women, so Yang Mi eagerly suggests, that makes things simple. She promptly contacts the famous Xu Aim. Zhang Yi brightens up at the mention of her name. Damn Uncle Yu, you owe me big time, he mutters. Xu Aim is a dream woman for many. Yang Mi promises her a feast if she agrees to spend time with Uncle. You considering her hunger, Xu Aim agrees without further ado. Zhang Yi produces food from another dimension, and Shuam starts eating voraciously. Zhang Yi looks at both women. We're all smart people here. From now on, I'll take care of your food. But if anyone leaks information from here, forget about food. You'll owe me your life. With that, he leaves to transfer useful items and people, including Zhou Er and Uncle Yu, to his current location. In another village called Su Family Town, young folks are hard at work drilling through the ice layer underground while sled dogs race ahead. Suddenly, there's a loud noise as they break through and small fish leap out. The workers swiftly gather the fish, showing their skill. One young man asks the elder if he thinks city folks might have frozen to death in this cold. The elder scoffs, saying those city folks don't know the first thing about farming and rely on them for food. He reckons they're probably starving or worse. Thankfully, rural folks like them have some food reserves and resilience to weather the cold. Just then, a rumbling noise in the distance catches their attention, making the elder alert. It's rare to see anyone out in this cold. Could it be the sound of a snowmobile? Suddenly, Zhang Yi zooms by on his snowmobile, surprised to see the villagers fishing by breaking the ice. He also notices their sleds, and is impressed by how quickly they've adapted to the icy conditions. If he hadn't witnessed it himself, he would have thought Eskimos had moved to Sioux Family Town. The villagers spot me on my snowmobile, which they see as the equivalent of a Rolls Royce in the snowy environment. Without a word, they urge their sled dogs to chase, sending them into a frenzy. I panic and quickly throttle up, speeding away. Meanwhile, on the river, eight dogs are chasing me down, tongues out and eyes turning red at the sight of me. If they catch me, I'm definitely in trouble. Suddenly, a fisherman hurls a harpoon towards me. Furious, I think, damn it. If that harpoon hits my arm, it would either injure or kill me. I swerve sharply, and due to the inertia, Kaim is flung off. The fishermen catch up and confront me, demanding that I leave the woman and the snowmobile. Coldly, I look at them and swiftly pull out a handgun, aiming it at them. The fishermen suddenly get nervous. Hey, let's chat. No need for weapons here. Despite the snowmobile's beauty, they're hesitant to let me pass through their family territory without paying a toll. Leave the woman or the vehicle. It's your call, Shinani sneers. What if I don't want either? I retort. The fisherman's demeanor shifts, 
warning me that even a gun won't help against their numbers. Knowing I need to act fast before more villagers arrive, I take a deep breath and mutter, you leave me no choice. Drawing another weapon, I prepare for the confrontation. As the situation escalates, I raise both guns and fire, knocking down several from Sue family town. Uncle Sue is shocked at my seriousness and commands the ferocious dogs to attack, but I'm ready. With a swift motion, I activate another dimension, trapping all eight dogs. Seizing the opportunity, I grab Shame, start the snowmobile, and speed off. Glancing back at the approaching villagers, I know escaping won't be easy with them on my tail. Phew, that was a close call. Almost got bitten by those mad dogs. Good thing I used the other dimension as a weapon. Those dogs will suffocate soon enough in that space. It also gives me a chance to measure the time flow difference between the other dimension and the real world. As the villagers arrive, they're shocked to see the dead bodies on the ground. We've encountered a tough one, they say, but their concern deepens when they realize that our eight snow dogs are missing. It's strange because those dogs were well trained and wouldn't stray without orders. Losing four lives is bad enough, but now eight snow dogs have vanished too. We're in big trouble. The leader speaks up. This person not only had a gun and a snowmobile, but also killed so many people from Sioux family town. He must be extraordinary. Maybe he even has superpowers, like our villager Chumley. Let's not act recklessly. Go back and consult with the village head returning to Sioux family town. The village head gathers a group and goes to Chumley who is found sleeping soundly, clutching a 2D anime doll. The village head becomes red-faced upon seeing a room full of 2D dolls, and scold Chumley. You're a grown man king. Fake dolls, aren't you? Shamed our village girls are far more beautiful than these dolls. Chumley stretches lazily. Grandpa, your way. Off base are the village women, even to be called young ladies. Besides, it's my hobby. Why do you care now? What do you want Sue to high under Jack's this morning? We encountered a young man. While fishing he killed four of us and took our snow dogs. The man was incredibly powerful. He might have superpowers like you. Our village may no longer be safe. Chumley thinks. We've just ended fights with nearby villages. And now this. When will we have some peace? Meanwhile Zhang Yi safely drops Zhou Haim at the base of an apartment complex leading the away Zhang Yai, says the man you will meet is in this building, come upstairs with me, H. Hei agrees although reluctantly in this apocalyptic world, having someone to team up with isn't a bad choice. As Zhang Yi steps into the safe house, Dr. Zhou beams with joy, feeling like a kid on Christmas morning. Congratulations on making it back safely, she exclaims, eager to help him out of his coat. But when she notices the woman behind him, a sense of unease creeps in. Ignoring Dr. Zhou's fussing, Zhang Yi politely asks her to take a seat first. Dr. Zhou, with her intuition on high alert, senses something different about Zhang Yi. I get it now. You prefer mature women, don't you? She ventures, surprised by her own insight. Zhang Yi chuckles softly, confirming her observation. Don't read too much into it. This woman is here to take care of Uncle Yu, he reassures her. But Dr. Zhu remains focused on Uncle Yu's condition, quickly updating Zhang Yi on his recovery progress. Uncle Yu has mostly recovered miraculously, thanks to your instructions, she explains. But his strength seems unaffected by the muscle relaxin I gave him. Zhang Yi nods knowingly, confirming his suspicion of Uncle Yu's mutation. Concerned, he inquires about Uncle Yu's mental state. After a moment of contemplation, Dr. Zhu assures him, he seems fine. No issues with his mental state have been detected. Hearing this, I stroke my chin. I've read online about people experiencing dangerous physical mutations after gaining superpowers. I'm glad Uncle Yu didn't go through that. I then visit Uncle Yu's room and see that he's fine, which eases my concerns. I also tell him about capturing Wang Simon's shelter the day before. Upon hearing this, Uncle Yu remarks, rich people sure know how to have fun. I calmly respond, there are plenty of wealthy people both domestically and internationally, and many of them would have built shelters. In that sense, it's easier for the rich and powerful to survive in this post-apocalyptic world. Uncle Yu lowers his head. Zhang Yi, how can I ever thank you? I wouldn't be alive now if it wasn't for you. My eyes flicker slightly, no need for formalities. By the way Uncle, you, have you noticed any changes in your body these past few days? Uncle Yu lifts a hand. It's strange. With such severe gunshot wounds, it should take months to heal. But I've recovered in just a few days, and my strength has increased tremendously. He lifts a sofa next to him with one hand. I look at Uncle Yu with delighted astonishment. What incredible strength. Uncle Yu looks at himself puzzled, feeling like some kind of monster. I reassure him cheerfully. Don't worry too much. You've just awakened a powerful ability. It's like a tadpole successfully transforming into a frog. Uncle, you stared at me, bewildered. I flashed a smile, telling him not to be surprised. I've awakened some abilities. As I pulled out some food from another dimension, Uncle Yu was completely dumbfounded. It suddenly clicked why I always seem to have endless resources. With a strong push, he overturned the bed and then heavily fell to the ground. I advised him to get used to his new body before making any moves. Seeing him in this condition, I was overjoyed. The stronger Uncle Yu becomes, the safer I'll be.
Meanwhile, Dr. Joe and the superstar Joe Haim were busy in the living room. I got back to the point with Uncle Yu. I've found him a wife. He glanced at Joe Haim in disbelief. This was every man's dream goddess. Joe Haim approached and greeted Uncle Yu with a smile, saying hello. Elated, Uncle Yu nodded furiously. His dream goddess was actually speaking to him. I looked at both of them, and, given the exceptional circumstances, suggested they pair up and live together. I'd leave the house to both of them while Dr. Zhu and I would move out. Uncle, you seem worried, I said to him, noticing his anxious expression. This can't continue. You've already done so much for me, and this house is your sanctuary. I can't just take it from you. But Uncle reassured me, urging me not to be so formal. You found a better place? I asked, surprised. You can bring your wife to visit any time. After settling things with Uncle, we headed downstairs to our new home. Then, as a wedding gift, I presented him with a snowmobile from another space. He was astonished, refusing to accept it, worried about what I'd do without it. But I insisted, saying, don't worry uncle, I'll manage without it. Then, to everyone's surprise, I revealed an off-road snow vehicle from another space. Their speechlessness made me wonder if this was what I meant by managing. Meanwhile, in Sioux family town, there's widespread anxiety as everyone waits for the village's star of hope, Chumley, to make a decision. Chumley believes he's destined for greatness, seeing it as a sign from the heavens to become stronger. The village head expresses concern, acknowledging Chumley's strength and the challenge he poses. Chumley assures them, feeling the weight of their expectations, but confident in his abilities. In another part of town, Zhang Yi and Dr. Zhou are on their way to their new villa in an off-road vehicle. Dr. Zhou, curious about their new home, questions Zhang Yi's decision to leave their secure house. Zhang Yi reassures her, explaining that their new home is much more comfortable and spacious. However, he surprises her with news of another person joining them. Dr. Zhou becomes nervous, fearing it might be another woman, but Zhang Yi assures her it's just someone to help with their responsibilities. Dr. Zhou relaxes, feeling reassured and snuggling closer to Zhang Yi, expressing her love for him. Zhang Yi smiles, accepting the situation, and drives onward through the intensifying snowstorm, determined to face whatever challenges lie ahead. The wind, even fiercer than at the start of the snowstorm, suddenly whirls around, hitting the back of the off-road vehicle. I quickly sense that something's off, this snow is too unnatural. Then, a loud bang as a gust of wind slams into the vehicle, causing it to swerve off track. Gripping the wheel tightly, I step on the gas, urging Dr. Zhu to hold on tight. I extend my left hand, creating a different space with a whoosh, sucking in the attacking snowstorm. Damn, it's a tornado. Heavenly K City hasn't seen one in centuries. This is definitely an attack not a natural disaster. I calm myself, relying on my ultimate defense ability. As long as I don't panic, the opponent won't be able to kill me. I start to think, realizing that the attacker must be nearby. Skillfully, I turn the vehicle around and once again create a different space, sucking in the attacking tornado. Meanwhile, lurking in the shadows, Chumley senses that something's amiss. The tornado had struck the vehicle, but why did it suddenly stop? It drains a lot of his energy, and he's unsure of how strong the other party is. The more he thinks, the more he believes this guy isn't easy to deal with. He might have superpowers too. Worst of all, he's already revealed his trump card but knows nothing about the other person. Two villagers stand by my side, sensing that something's wrong. Chumley, what's up? Why didn't your superpower work this time? I ask. Chumley curses. Damn, we've hit a tough spot. We need to find another plan. Let's retreat for now. Meanwhile, I'm in the vehicle, armed and ready for action. I grab a sniper rifle with a high magnification scope from a different space. You think you can attack me and get away? I challenge. With determination, I lift the rifle and take aim, firing two shots. One of the villagers falls to the ground. Chumley and the other villager are stunned. How could I hit from such a distance? It seems impossible. I raise the rifle again, and Chumley hides behind a snow mountain, terrified. I smirk. Since you're hiding, let me return the favor. With a flick of my left hand, I release the absorbed tornado back out. Chumley watches in shock as a tornado identical to his own superpower forms. He realizes I have the same ability as him. As he's about to be swept up, Chumley gathers his strength and unleashes his power again. The two tornadoes collide and cancel each other out. Seizing the chance, Chumley escapes. I watch them retreat and decide to let them go for now. I can't risk chasing them into the villagers' territory, especially with Dr. Ju in the car. A small mistake could lead to disaster. If they want revenge, they can find me. But next time, it'll be on my turf. I don't waste time dwelling on it. Instead, I keep driving towards Lark Manor. During the journey, I realize I've gained valuable insights from this battle. The future seems destined to be ruled by those with superpowers. Dr. Joe, concerned about potential revenge attacks, asks about our safety. I reassure her, stating that our new refuge is highly secure. Even a superpower like a tornado wouldn't affect us. Elsewhere, Sue, Depan, and the others helped the injured make their way to Sioux Family Town. Since my superpower awakened, I've been the one doing the attacking. It's a first for someone to chase and attack me. It was a close call, and I'm grateful to be alive. 
Yang Mi, clad in alluring lingerie, lounges on the bed, feeling out of place in her new role as a kept woman. As she ponders how to pass the time, the door clicks open, and in walks Zhang Yi, prompting her to sit up. He announces his intention to introduce her to a friend, sparking Yang Mi's concern. Is he planning to pass her off to someone else? Zhang Yi chuckles at her reaction, clarifying that the friend is just someone who came first. Yang Mi, still puzzled, questions if the friend is his girlfriend, to which Zhang Yi cryptically responds, close enough. Feeling a surge of competition, Yang Mi resolves not to be outdone, especially by someone she considers beneath her status. As she applies her makeup with precision, she vows to maintain her poise and not let herself be overshadowed. Meanwhile, Dr. Ju meticulously prepares herself, recognizing the power of a woman's charm in any competition. As both women gear up for the encounter, the tension rises. Finally, after much preparation, Yang Mi enters the living room, only to be met with shock and dismay as she locks eyes with Dr. Zhou. The realization hits them both, they know each other. In the midst of their silent confrontation, Zhang Yi stands clueless in the middle, prompting Dr. Zhu to angrily reveal their familial connection. Sensing the strained atmosphere, Yang Mi pulls Zhang Yi aside and urges him to keep their relationship a secret from Dr. Zhou, revealing the complexities of their entangled situation. Zhang Yi scratches his chin and grins at us. Yang Mi instantly gets mad. The deal between us puts Zhang Yi in an interesting spot. He glances at a furious Dr. Zhou and a wary Mi. Turns out, both the Zhou and Young families are known for their smarts, boasting loads of talented folks. Yang Mi picks showbiz to get famous, aiming to be an actress. Dr. Zhou gives her a disdainful look. If you had real talent, you'd make it on your own. No one in our family would hesitate. Do you know why you're infamous? You're like a public bus everyone knows. It's pretty nauseating to hear. Zhang Yi finds Yi's expression behind him kind of funny and waves it off. I don't care about your old grudges. We're all just neighbors now, facing the same tough times. Reluctantly, the two women shake hands, agreeing to live and let live. Then, Zhang Yi leads them to the underground garden, bursting with veggies and plants. He lays down their daily tasks. Besides chores, they gotta take care of these plants to keep things running smoothly. Neither of them are thrilled, but they're glad to have something to do and avoid fights. After that, Zhang Yi sends Dr. Zhou upstairs to tidy the bedroom, leaving a thankful Yi behind. She whispers her thanks for keeping our secret just now. I already owe my cousin a lot, so if she finds out I'm competing with her for a boyfriend, she'll be heartbroken. Can we keep our relationship a secret from her? With only three people in such a large shelter, staying hidden won't be easy. Zhang Yi quickly agrees to Yami's request, wanting to show her gratitude for keeping our secret. Yami offers to cook for me which surprises me. A big star knows how to cook? Yang Mi heads to the kitchen saying, don't assume all celebrities are useless. Actually, I find cooking relaxing when I'm bored. To her dismay, she finds the kitchen devoid of ingredients. It's the proverbial case of having no rice to cook. Even for a clever woman like Yang Mi, searching fruitlessly yields nothing. Watching her pace back and forth, I can't help but admire her figure. I walk up behind her and exhale lightly. Yang Mi stands up nervously, dodging back and glancing worriedly upstairs, her face turning red as she asks, what are you doing? Didn't we agree not to act like this? What if our relationship gets discovered? I smile, unable to resist her captivating presence. Then, I produce a heap of ingredients from another space and place them on the table. Yang's eyes widen in amazement. Oh my god, how do you have so much stuff? I can't believe my eyes. Food is so abundant even in this apocalyptic winter. It feels a bit too luxurious. I playfully pat Yang's hips. No worries folks, we'll be dining like this from now on. After Yang Mi calls me and Dr. Zhu to eat, I gaze at the spread before me with great satisfaction. Yang Mi and Zhou, however, seem to have different thoughts. Dr. Zhou tastes the bass and immediately wrinkles her nose, muttering about too much salt. Yang Mi eats her rice quietly, head down, feeling somewhat guilty, it's not easy to get the seasoning right under such circumstances. Meanwhile, I watch the scene unfold with an internal smirk. I'm purposely stoking a rivalry between the two women, knowing it'll ultimately benefit me. Without missing a beat, I pick up a dish with my chopsticks and feed it to Zhu, claiming it's less salty. She eats it up, immediately turning lovey-dovey. Food always tastes better when brother Y feeds it to me, she coos. As Yang Mi sits off to the side, I can sense her heavy heart. Later that night, Dr. Zhou nervously asks me, who's better, Yang Mi or me? She must have seen what went down in the kitchen earlier. Using my player-like acting skills, I reassure her, don't think too much baby, you're the one I love the most. Upon hearing this, the innocent Zhao immediately hugs me tightly, exclaiming, I knew it, brother why loves Dr. Zhu the most, but I can't help but think to myself, you really are naive. Despite appearing passionately devoted to Dr. Zhou, I've never truly been in love with her. Being with her simply satisfies my basic needs as a man. Love to me is just a disease that makes people lose their reason. For the past few days, I've been casually practicing shooting at Lark Manor when suddenly my phone rings. As I'm about to answer, I realize it's not a regular call but a dial tone. 
which is strange considering the electricity has been out since the apocalypse, and most of my contacts are gone. Curious about the unknown number, I mutter, even if you're a god, I can't be bothered, and promptly hang up, blocking the number. Oddly enough, within two minutes, the same number calls again. This time, I'm unnerved. What's going on? I blocked this number, I wonder. Thinking, maybe I didn't block it properly, I try again, but the phone rings once more. Now, I'm genuinely panicked. What the hell is happening? Is this some sort of haunting? Just as I'm freaking out, the call answers itself, and the voice on the other end starts questioning me. Despite my internal panic, I try to stay calm. This person on the other end is no ordinary caller compared to the riffraff I usually deal with. Before I can even speak, the voice on the other end starts rattling off detailed info about me, from my birth date to where I live. It's creepy. Who are you and how do you know all this? I demand. The guy, who I call fat bro in my head, just chuckles and tries to blackmail me for supplies. I can't help but laugh. You think you can scare me with that? I challenge him, but then he drops a bomb. He knows about the missing supplies from the South City warehouse. I try to play dumb, but he's not buying it. And when he drops the name Lou Funga, a big shot in the info world, I freeze. This just got serious. Suddenly, a thought struck me. If this guy could hack into my phone so easily, what about the computer systems at home? Could he have hacked into those as well? But then I reassured myself that the probability was low. Like me, Lou Funga was also trapped in Lark Manor, limiting him to basic operations like hacking a phone. If he had compromised the computer systems at home, he wouldn't need to call and threaten me over the phone. Thinking quickly, I decided to play it cool with Lou Funga. Boldly stated, since you can support two women, you should have no problem supporting me as well. As long as you provide me with the supplies I need to live, I'll keep your secret safe. Additionally, I can help you maintain your cybersecurity to protect against other hackers. Smiling, I responded to Mr. Lou. You must be joking. I did work as a warehouse supervisor for a while, but a minor supervisor like me doesn't have much authority. But Lu Funga immediately fired back. Zhang Yi, don't try to outsmart me. I've been around long enough and seen enough to know that you must have those stolen supplies from the warehouse. I can gather a lot of information about you through your phone, leaving me fuming internally. Zhang Yi cursed inwardly at the old man's persistence. He knew he couldn't keep hiding the truth any longer. Admitting to having some supplies, but not many, he explained his limited living space and how he'd already sold off the excess. Lu Funga, however, seemed unconcerned with the quantity, only focused on his own needs. Threatening to expose Zhang Yi's secret and attract unwanted attention from people with special abilities, Lu Funga left Zhang Yi feeling the pressure. Rubbing his forehead, Zhang Yi realized he was facing a formidable opponent. Despite this, he resolved to confront Lu Funga once and for all. Reluctantly agreeing to provide some supplies, Zhang Yi warned Lu Funga to keep the secret safe. Lu Funga assured him that only they needed to know about the arrangement. He listed his requirements, food, liquor, cotton socks, and underwear, and instructed Zhang Yi to send them to Via 302 in Lark Manor. With a final warning against any tricks, Lu Funga hung up, leaving Zhang Yi to ponder his next move. I have a plan forming in my mind. This guy, Lunga, he's gotta go. I stride into the living room where Dr. Ju is lounging on the couch, take a big swig of water, and dive into the conversation. Hey, I've got something to talk to you about, I say, leaning in. I explain to her that our whereabouts have been discovered. I give her a quick rundown of Lunga's antics, how he's trying to blackmail me because he knows I've got a stash of supplies. Dr. Jo listens intently, her brow furrowing in thought. I've dealt with these types before, she says after a moment. They might not be the sharpest tools in the shed, but they're cunning, morally bankrupt too, typical businessmen. I'm feeling a bit lost. I really want to take this guy out, but I'm worried he's got a backup plan. The thought of being constantly blackmailed if I let him live, it's unbearable. If this info gets out, it could be a real threat to you. That's the tricky part. I remember hearing about corrupt officials taking out internet moguls to cover their tracks, only for the evidence to pop up online the next day. Shan's heard similar stories. Desperate folks always have a backup plan. They set up triggers to spill insider info if something goes south. That's why their enemies think twice about making a move. Dr. Joe tries to ease my mind, suggesting we don't dwell on it for now. But I can't shake it off. Until we solve this, I'll be on edge. The longer it drags on, the worse it gets. Then Yang Mi walks in, and I figure it's time to brainstorm a plan. After hearing the whole deal, Yang Mi's not thrilled. She calls it a headache. Creating rumors is easy, but debunking them? That's tough, she says. In the entertainment biz, we can't stand that kind of drama. Suddenly, a light bulb goes off in my head. You mentioned rumors, right? I say, getting excited. Yang Mi looks puzzled, but I've got an idea brewing. Isn't it ironic how spreading information about yourself can be likened to the unethical gossip that circulates about celebrities? Joe Ked seems to think so, suggesting that even if it's just a rumor, people will likely believe it, especially when it comes from Lu Funga. As I ponder this, I realize that while Lu Funga may have some information on me, 
it's not conclusive evidence. However, if this information were to get out, it could spell trouble for me. Since I can't stop him from spreading it, why not muddy the waters a bit? I decide to treat this situation as if it were just another rumor. Dr. Zhou and Yang Mi shoot me curious looks as I begin to formulate a plan. With a mysterious smile, I turn to make preparations. Heading to the control room, I call Lu Funga impatiently, asking if his stuff is ready. He laughs on the other end of the line, taunting me about my lack of supplies and threatening to expose my secret if anything happens to him. But I refuse to back down. Thinking quickly, I agree to his terms and promise to bring the stuff over. After hanging up the phone, a faint smile creeps onto my face. It seems like I've found a way to turn the tables in my favor. I switch on my computer and start posting threads on the remaining forums in Heavenly Sea City. I delve into the mystery of the Walmart warehouse theft, questioning if Walmart stole from itself or if the stock was moved elsewhere. I sprinkle in rumors of armed forces and police involvement, creating a web of sensational news to bury the truth in a sea of lies. Even if Lu Funga speaks the truth, no one will believe him amidst the chaos. Following Funga's instructions, I leave the prepared supplies at Lu Funga's residence. Once done, I discreetly retreat and take cover behind a pine tree, readying my sniper rifle aimed at the backpack left at his front door. When Lu Funga emerges to retrieve it, I'll take the shot, ensuring he meets his demise. With everything set, I send him a text message, the stuff is at your door. Zhang Yi keeps a close eye on the entrance, lurking in the shadows, waiting for Lu Funga to show up. But as time drags on, there's no sign of movement at Lu Feng's door, and Zhang Yi senses something's not right. Did the old man not receive his message? He hesitates to call or text again, worried it might tip Lu Funga off to his presence. Instead, he decides to wait a little longer, confident that the old fox will eventually come out for the supplies he promised. After about 15 minutes, the door to Villa 302 creaks open slowly, revealing a shotgun barrel poking out first, scanning for any threats. Then, cautiously, an elderly man steps out. Lu Funga, thinking he's finally getting his supplies, reaches for the backpack, but before he can grab it, a gunshot rings out. Lu Funga's head is hit, and he collapses to the ground, dead. Seizing the opportunity, Zhang Yi swiftly moves to Villa 302 aiming at Lu Funga's forehead and firing several more shots. You old bastard, he mutters, thinking you could fool me? Looks like you've had enough of this life. As I locate Lu Feng's computer, I see he's about to smash it with his gun. I pause, realizing the old man's computer likely holds valuable information. With a sudden idea, I decide to store the computer in an alternate dimension, preventing any data from being sent out. I sigh deeply, thinking, well, this is the best I can do. The man's dead. The stuff is taken. If he had family, I'd send them to join him in the afterlife. All this nonsense is over with. I'd rather go home and spend time with my two ladies and continue to be an internet troll, creating false narratives online. Even if information leaks out, I'm prepared to brazenly lie and frame others. My goal is to clear my own name by any means necessary. As I stretch and leave the control room, Dr. Ju asks with concern, Zhang, what have you been busy with? I've made you a soup with oxtail and kidney. Come have some. Once seated, both women surround me, offering massages. Feeling truly content with two women at home, I hope this happy life will continue indefinitely. Casually, I ask, did either of you receive any messages on your phones? Dr. Zhou looks puzzled, saying, a bunch of jumbled messages. I don't know what they mean. Yang Mi also finds the messages confusing, perhaps intentionally misleading. Taking a sip of his fish soup, I explain that those messages were meant to throw people off track. I release them as smoke screens to cover up the truth. Now, I plan to flood every forum in Heavenly City with hundreds of similar messages sent to everyone's phones. Since I couldn't stop Lu Funga from sharing the real information, this is my alternative. Dr. Joe looks doubtful, wondering if this will raise more suspicion. Yang Mi agrees, concerned that suddenly bringing up the topic will attract attention. But as I calmly explain while eating a fishball, drawing attention is unavoidable. Whether or not I send these messages, Lu Funga's actions would have drawn attention anyway. By sending out these smoke screens, I can at least confuse things. Most people don't have the time or interest to distinguish truth from fiction. They just want to watch. Yang's eyes light up as she compliments my cleverness, confirming her judgment of me. She admires not just my looks but also my intelligence. However, Yuri raises a valid concern asking about the risk of someone tracking the IP address back to me since the messages were sent from my computer. She's right. Even if I used multiple accounts, my unique IP address could easily lead organizations to me, making me the prime suspect. Sipping my soup calmly, I notice Dr. Joe's reaction to the atmosphere shift and quickly apologize, realizing I might be overly concerned. She acknowledges the effectiveness of my approach, emphasizing that not many in Heavenly Sea City could counter it. Picking up some food with my chopsticks, I cryptically mention that covering my tracks entirely in this snow disaster scenario is nearly impossible. I never expected to fool everyone completely, 
but I aim to prevent most from suspecting me directly. I know encountering organizations with strong cyber capabilities is inevitable, and I've prepared for that. If it weren't for Lund's appearance, this day would have come much later. The shelter cost a whopping billion dollars, and is reputedly nuclear strike resistant. With my endless supply of food, I'd only truly worry if confronted by top-tier armed forces. I smile and glance at Yangmi, reminding her not to be too complacent. Even though I'm confident in the shelter's defenses, I know we won't be idle in the coming days. Yangmi's face turns a shade of red, and her shy eyes suggest she's aware of others present. It wasn't the best idea to discuss this in front of them. I was left speechless, wondering what was going through her mind. But Yangmi seemed innocent enough, even though she hadn't been much help in other areas. I playfully smacked her on the head and said, I'm talking about setting traps. Holding her head with a look of innocence, Yangmi replied, We don't know how to set traps. Standing up, I spread my hands. While this place has top-notch defenses, it lacks countermeasures against human threats. We need defensive weapons inside the shelter. So, I planned to set up a network of traps around the shelter. If anyone dared to target me, they'd find themselves in for a nasty surprise. Both women perked up at the idea. Ever since Yi's arrival, Dr. Ju had become more security conscious. They eagerly nodded, promising to do whatever it takes to keep me safe. Yang Mi chimed in, I might not understand traps, but I'll do my best. Nodding, I stood and retrieved a pile of hardware from another dimension. Most of it was steel nails and animal traps. Picking up a steel nail, I began to instruct them on its usage, reminding them to remember the trap layout. Dr. Zhou and Yang Mi realized the looming danger, and paid close attention during the lessons. Just scattering nails on the snow wouldn't do much to pierce anyone. I showed them my plan, grabbing a wooden board and adding spikes to it. Smooth steel nails wouldn't do the trick, so I brought out screws to make the spikes harder to remove. We needed about a thousand of these traps around the villa to cover all angles. Then, I introduced an animal trap, perfect for this weather. If someone got caught, they'd be finished. I explained how to set up the traps for maximum effectiveness. The women got to work enthusiastically making spike board traps while I surveyed the surroundings from the window. There were two crucial routes to our villa. I remembered the landmines I had stashed away, they could be strategically placed at those access points. These mines could obliterate tanks, so I had to be cautious around them in the future. Alright, so these spike board traps, while effective initially, can be pretty easy for an enemy to figure out. I needed something foolproof to make sure anyone who came near wouldn't leave unscathed. Yang and I got to work, setting up a bunch of spike boards. Her hands were all blistered from the hard work, but she didn't complain one bit. She knew she wasn't as skilled as Dr. Zhu, being a doctor and all, but she was determined to prove herself. I really appreciated her effort. Once we were done with the indoor setup, I took the lead outside. I showed everyone how to set up the traps, stressing the importance of getting the depth just right, especially with the snowfall making things tricky. Then, it was onto the vital pathways. I dug deep pits and carefully hid landmines inside, covering them up with snow. With a bit more snowfall, those traps would be practically invisible. But I wasn't done yet. I had to think about how to counter any sneaky moves from the enemy. That's when inspiration struck. I rigged up hand grenades with steel wires and buried them beneath the snow. If anyone stumbled across them, kaboom, it had set off a chain explosion. That ought to make anyone think twice about messing with us, unless there's some elite military unit. Approaching the shelter was a nerve-wracking task, especially with the exterior traps guarding it. Even if someone managed to bypass those, there was still a formidable defense corridor over 10 meters inside. But I wasn't too worried. I had a secret weapon up my sleeve, my spatial ability. Once back indoors, Yang Mi seemed eager and asked when the enemies would come. I couldn't help but look at her in surprise. You're actually hoping for trouble? I said, shaking my head. I'd prefer if these traps were just for show. But from your excitement, it seems like you're itching for a fight. However, I doubt anyone will attack us anytime soon. It's been ages since the apocalypse began. Surviving in your own turf is already a big win. No one's keen on stirring up trouble unless they absolutely have to. Yang Mi looked conflicted, unsure whether she wanted someone to trigger our traps or if she preferred the safety of our current setup. Lost in thought, she was suddenly snapped out of her reverie by a loud noise. Turning, she saw me using a welder to secure bolts on a door in the corridor. Curious, she approached me. What are you doing? She asked. Aren't these metal doors thick enough? The recent incident with LF had made me more cautious. As I worked, I explained, all the facilities in this villa are computer controlled. If someone hacks our system, they could easily bypass these doors. To ensure complete safety, I'm adding these bolts to finish the job I stated seriously. Even if someone breaches the corridor, they won't get through these doors quickly. It's always better to be safe than sorry. Yang Mi looked at me with admiration, even though she thought my methods were a bit excessive. She believed I would undoubtedly outlive most. Reassured by our fortified setup, I only had one lingering concern, cybersecurity. If only we had a cyber expert with us, we'd be entirely secure, I muttered. Upon hearing this, a sorrowful expression crossed Yi's face. Yang Xin Xin was pretty skilled in that area. It's a shame. 
Before Yang Mi could finish, Dr. Zhu interrupted. You know, is she still alive? Yang Shen Shen had always been frail, her legs paralyzed due to childhood polio. However, her mind was brilliant, especially when it came to computers. By 16, she had swept international computer awards and was considered a top hacker. As I listened to Dr. Zhou's account, I couldn't help but feel wistful. If we could find Yang Shen Shen, everything would fall into place. Yi shook his head. I lost contact with Yang Shen Shen a long time ago, especially after the snow disaster. I fear the worst. Teasingly, I remarked, maybe she just didn't want to deal with you after all. Apart from being pretty, you don't offer much in the eyes of geniuses like her who would seek your help in a crisis. Yang Mi, bewildered, playfully punched me in the chest, exclaiming, you're terrible Zhang Yi, I felt a twinge of regret. If this young Xin Xin were still alive and could join our group, or more precisely, my harem group, it would be an excellent choice. Given the good looks of the two sisters, the younger sibling would likely be just as beautiful. Now all that was left to do was wait. With this, the chapter concludes. Don't miss out on the next installment. Hit that subscribe button.